Chapter 13. Obsessed with Reality A ship owner was about to send to sea an emigrant ship. He knew that she was old and not over well built at the first, that she had seen many seas and climes, and often had needed repairs. Doubts had been suggested to him that possibly she was not seaworthy. These doubts preyed upon his mind and made him unhappy. He thought that perhaps he ought to have her thoroughly overhauled and refitted, even though this should put him to great expense. Before the ship sailed, however, he succeeded in overcoming these melancholy reflections. He said to himself that she had gone safely through so many voyages and weathered so many storms, that it was idle to suppose that she would not come safely home from this trip also. He would put his trust in Providence, which could hardly fail to protect all these unhappy families that were leaving their fatherland to seek for better times elsewhere. He would dismiss from his mind all ungenerous suspicions about the honesty of builders and contractors. In such ways he acquired a sincere and comfortable conviction that his vessel was thoroughly safe and seaworthy. He watched her departure with a light heart and benevolent wishes for the success of the exiles in their strange new home that was to be and he got his insurance money when she went down in mid-ocean and told no tales. What shall we say of him? Surely this, that he was verily guilty of the death of those men. It is admitted that he did sincerely believe in the soundness of his ship, but the sincerity of his conviction can in no wise help him, because he had no right to believe on such evidence as was before him. He had acquired his belief not by honestly earning it in patient investigation, but by stifling his doubts. William K. Clifford, The Ethics of Belief, 1874, at the borders of science, and sometimes as a carryover from prescientific thinking, lurks a range of ideas that are appealing, or at least modestly mind-boggling, but that have not been conscientiously worked over with a baloney detection kit, at least by their advocates. The notions say that the Earth's surface is on the inside, not the outside, of a sphere, or claims that you can levitate yourself by meditating, and that ballet dancers and basketball players routinely get up so high by levitating, or the proposition that I have something called a soul, made not of matter or energy, but of something else for which there is no other evidence, and which after my death might return to animate a cow or a worm. Typical offerings of pseudoscience and superstition, this is merely a representative, not a comprehensive list, are astrology, the Bermuda Triangle, Bigfoot, and the Loch Ness Monster, ghosts, the evil eye, multicolored halo-like auras said to surround the heads of everyone, with color personalized. Extrasensory perception, ESP, such as telepathy, precognition, telekinesis, and remote viewing of distant places. The belief that 13 is an unlucky number, because of which many no-nonsense office buildings and hotels in America pass directly from the 12th to the 14th floors. Why take chances? Bleeding statues the conviction that carrying the severed foot of a rabbit around with you brings good luck, divining rods, dowsing, and water witching, facilitated communication in autism, the belief that razor blades stay sharper when kept inside small cardboard pyramids and other tenets of pyramidology, phone calls, none of them collect, from the dead, the prophecies of Nostradamus, the alleged discovery that untrained flatworms can learn a task by eating the ground-up remains of other, better-educated flatworms, the notion that more crimes are committed when the moon is full, palmistry, numerology, polygraphy, comets, tea leaves, and monstrous births as prodigies of future events, plus the divinations fashionable in earlier epochs, accomplished by viewing entrails, smoke, the shapes of flames, shadows, and excrement, listening to gurgling stomachs, and even for a brief period, examining tables of logarithms, photography of past events, such as the crucifixion of Jesus, a Russian elephant that speaks fluently, sensitives who, when carelessly blindfolded, read books with their fingertips, Edgar Cayce, who predicted that in the 1960s the lost continent of Atlantis would rise, and other prophets, sleeping and awake, diet quackery, out of body, for example, near-death experiences interpreted as real events in the external world, faith healer fraud, Ouija boards, the emotional lives of geraniums uncovered by intrepid use of a lie detector, Water remembering what molecules used to be dissolved in it, telling character from facial features or bumps on the head, the hundredth monkey confusion, and other claims that whatever a small fraction of us wants to be true really is true. Human beings spontaneously bursting into flame and being burned to a crisp. 
Three-cycle biorhythms, perpetual motion machines promising unlimited supplies of energy, but all of which, for one reason or another, are withheld from close examination by skeptics. The systematically inept predictions of Gene Dixon, who predicted a 1953 Soviet invasion of Iran, and in 1965 that the USSR would beat the U.S. to put the first human on the moon asterisk, and other professional psychics. The Jehovah's Witnesses' prediction that the world would end in 1917, and many similar prophecies. Dianetics and Scientology, Carlos Castaneda and Sorcery, claims of finding the remains of Noah's Ark, the Amityville Horror and other hauntings, and accounts of a small brontosaurus crashing through the rainforests of the Congo Republic of our time. An in-depth discussion of many such claims can be found in Encyclopedia of the Paranormal, Gordon Stein, Edrer, Buffalo, Prometheus Books, 1996. Many of these doctrines are rejected out of hand by fundamentalist Christians and Jews because the Bible so enjoins. Deuteronomy 18.10.11 reads, in the King James translation, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Astrology channeling, Ouija boards, predicting the future, and much else is forbidden. The author of Deuteronomy does not argue that such practices fail to deliver what they promise. But they are abominations, perhaps suitable for other nations, but not for the followers of God. And even the Apostle Paul, so credulous on so many matters, counsels us to prove all things. The twelfth-century Jewish philosopher Moses Maimonides goes further than Deuteronomy, in that he makes explicit that these pseudosciences don't work. It is forbidden to engage in astrology, to utilize charms, to whisper incantations. All of these practices are nothing more than lies and deceptions used by ancient pagan peoples to deceive the masses and lead them astray. Wise and intelligent people know better. From the Mishneh Torah, Avodah Zara, Chapter 11. Some claims are hard to test. For example, if an expedition fails to find the ghost or the brontosaurus, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Others are easier. For example, flatworm cannibalistic learning or the announcement that colonies of bacteria subjected to an antibiotic or an agar dish thrive when their prosperity is prayed for compared to control bacteria unredeemed by prayer. A few, for example, perpetual motion machines, can be excluded on grounds of fundamental physics. Except for them, it's not that we know before examining the evidence that the notions are false. Stranger things are routinely incorporated into the corpus of science. The question, as always, is how good is the evidence? The burden of proof surely rests on the shoulders of those who advance such claims. Revealingly, some proponents hold that skepticism is a liability, that true science is inquiry without skepticism. They are perhaps halfway there. But halfway doesn't do it. Parapsychologist Susan Blackmore describes one of the steps in her transformation to a more skeptical attitude on psychic phenomena. A mother and daughter from Scotland asserted they could pick up images from each other's minds. They chose to use playing cards for the tests, because that is what they used at home. I let them choose the room in which they would be tested and ensured that there was no normal way for the receiver to see the cards. They failed. They could not get more right than chance predicted, and they were terribly disappointed. They had honestly believed they could do it and I began to see how easy it was to be fooled by your own desire to believe. I had similar experiences with several dowsers, children who claimed they could move objects psychokinetically, and several who said they had telepathic powers. They all failed. Even now I have a five-digit number, a word, and a small object in my kitchen at home. The place and items were chosen by a young man who intends to see them while traveling out of his body. They have been there, though regularly changed, for three years. So far, though, he has had no success. Telepathy literally means to feel at a distance, just as telephone is to hear at a distance, and television is to see at a distance. The word suggests the communication not of thoughts, but of feelings, emotions. Around a quarter of all Americans believe they've experienced something like telepathy. People who know each other very well, who live together, who are practiced in one another's feeling tones, associations and thinking styles can often anticipate what the partner will say. 
This is merely the usual five senses plus human empathy, sensitivity, and intelligence in operation. It may feel extrasensory, but it's not at all what's intended by the word telepathy. If something like this were ever conclusively demonstrated, it would, I think, have discernible physical causes, perhaps electrical currents in the brain. Pseudoscience, rightly or wrongly labeled, is by no means the same thing as the supernatural, which is by definition something somehow outside of nature. It is barely possible that a few of these paranormal claims might one day be verified by solid scientific data. But it would be foolish to accept any of them without adequate evidence. In the spirit of garage dragons, it is much better for those claims not already disproved or adequately explained to contain our impatience, to nurture a tolerance for ambiguity, and to await, or much better to seek, supporting or disconfirming evidence. In a far-off land in the South Seas, the word went out about a wise man, a healer, an embodied spirit. He could speak across time. He was an ascended master. He was coming, they said. He was coming. In 1988, Australian newspapers, magazines, and television stations began to receive the good news via press kits and videotape. One broadside read, Carlos to appear in Australia. Those who have seen it will never forget. The brilliant young artist who has been talking to them suddenly seems to falter. His pulse slows dangerously and virtually stops at the point of death. The qualified medical attendant who has been assigned to keep constant watch is about to sound the alarm. But then, with a heart-stirring burst, the pulse is felt again, faster and stronger than ever before. The life force clearly has returned to the body, but the entity inside that body is no longer José Luis Álvarez, the 19-year-old whose unique painted ceramics are featured in some of the wealthiest homes in America. Instead, the body has been taken over by Carlos, an ancient soul, whose teachings will come as both a shock and an inspiration one being going through a form of death to make way for another. That is the phenomenon that has made Carlos, as channeled through José Luis Álvarez, the dominant new figure in New Age consciousness. As even one skeptical New York critic puts it, the first and only case of a channeler offering tangible, physical proof of some mysterious change within his human physiology. Now Jose, who has gone through more than 170 of these little deaths and transformations, has been told by Carlos to visit Australia, in the words of the Master, the old new land, which is to be the source of a special revelation. Carlos already has foretold that in 1988 catastrophes will sweep the earth, two major world leaders will die, and later in the year, Australians will be among the first to see the rising of a great star, which will deeply influence future life on earth. Sunday, 21st, 3 p.m., Opera House Drama Theater. Following a 1986 motorcycle accident, the press kit explained, Jose Alvarez, then 17 years old, suffered a mild concussion. After he recovered, those who knew him could tell that he had changed. A very different voice sometimes emanated from him. Bewildered, Alvarez sought help from a psychotherapist, a specialist in multiple personality disorders. The psychiatrist discovered that Jose was channeling a distinct entity who was known as Carlos. This entity takes over the body of Alvarez when the body's life force is relaxed to the right degree. Carlos, it turns out, is a 2,000-year-old spirit disincarnate, a ghost without bodily form, who last invaded a human body in Caracas, Venezuela, in 1900. Unfortunately, that body died at age 12 in a fall from a horse. This may be why, the therapist explained, Carlos could enter Alvarez's body following the motorcycle accident. When Alvarez goes into his trance, the spirit of Carlos, focused by a large and rare crystal, enters him and utters the wisdom of the ages. Included in the press kit was a list of major appearances in American cities, a videotape of the tumultuous reception that Alvarez Carlos received at a Broadway theater, his interview on New York radio station Whoop, and other indications that here was a formidable American New Age phenomenon. Two small substantiating details. An article from a South Florida newspaper read, Theater note, the three-day stay of Channeler Carlos has been extended at the War Memorial Auditorium. In response to the requests for further appearances, and an excerpt from a television program guide listed a special on The Entity Carlos. This in-depth study reveals the facts behind one of today's most popular and controversial personalities. Alvarez and his manager arrived in Sydney first class on Qantas. 
They traveled everywhere in an enormous white stretch limousine. They occupied the presidential suite of one of the city's most prestigious hotels. Alvarez was attired in an elegant white gown with a golden medallion. In his first press conference, Carlos quickly emerged. The entity was forceful, literate, commanding. Australian television programs quickly lined up for appearances by Alvarez, his manager, and his nurse to check his pulse and announce the presence of Carlos. On Australia's Today Show, they were interviewed by the host, George Negus. When Negus posed a few reasonable and skeptical questions, the New Agers exhibited very thin skins. Carlos laid a curse on the anchorman. His manager doused Negus with a glass of water. Both stalked off the set. It was a sensation in the tabloid press, its significance rehashed on Australian television. TV outburst, water thrown at Negus, was the front page headline in the 16th of February, 1988 Daily Mirror. Television stations were flooded with calls. One Sydney citizen advised taking the curse on Negus very seriously. The army of Satan had already assumed control of the United Nations, he said, and Australia might be next. Carlos's next appearance was on the Australian version of A Current Affair. A skeptic was brought in who described a magician's trick by which the pulse in one hand is made briefly to stop. You put a rubber ball in your armpit and squeeze. When Carlos's authenticity was questioned, he was outraged. This interview is terminated, he thundered. On the appointed day, the drama theatre of the Sydney Opera House was nearly filled. An excited crowd, young and old, milled about expectantly. Entrance was free, which reassured those who vaguely wondered if it might be some sort of scam. Alvarez seated himself on a low couch. His pulse was monitored. Suddenly it stopped. Seemingly he was near death. Low, guttural noises emanated from deep within him. The audience gasped in wonder and awe. Suddenly Alvarez's body took on power. His posture radiated confidence. A broad, humane, spiritual perspective flowed out of Alvarez's mouth. Carlos was here. Interviewed afterwards, many members of the audience described how they had been moved and delighted. The following Sunday, Australia's most popular TV program, named 60 Minutes after its American counterpart, revealed that the Carlos affair was a hoax, front to back. The producers thought it would be instructive to explore how easily a faith healer or guru could be created to bamboozle the public and the media. So naturally, they contacted one of the world's leading experts on deceiving the public at least among those not holding or advising political office, the magician James Randi. There being so many disorders which cure themselves and such a disposition in mankind to deceive themselves and one another, wrote Benjamin Franklin in 1784, and living long having given me frequent opportunities of seeing certain remedies cried up as curing everything, and yet soon after totally laid aside as useless, I cannot but fear that the expectation of great advantage from the new method of treating diseases will prove a delusion. That delusion may, however, in some cases be of use while it lasts. He was referring to mesmerism, but every age has its peculiar folly. Unlike Franklin, most scientists feel it's not their job to expose pseudoscientific bamboozles, much less passionately held self-deceptions. They tend not to be very good at it either. Scientists are used to struggling with nature, who may surrender her secrets reluctantly, but who fights fair. Often they are unprepared for those unscrupulous practitioners of the paranormal who play by different rules. Magicians, on the other hand, are in the deception business. They practice one of the many occupations, such as acting, advertising, bureaucratic religion and politics, where what a naive observer might misunderstand as lying is socially condoned as in the service of a higher good. Many magicians pretend they don't cheat, and hint at powers conferred by mystic sources or lately by alien largesse. Some use their knowledge to expose charlatans in and out of their ranks. A thief is set to catch a thief. Few rise to this challenge as energetically as James the Amazing Randy, accurately self-described as an angry man. He is angry not so much about the survival into our day of antediluvian mysticism and superstition, but about how uncritical acceptance of mysticism and superstition works to defraud, to humiliate, and sometimes even to kill. Like all of us, he is imperfect. Sometimes Randy is intolerant and condescending, lacking in empathy for the human frailties that underlie credulity. He is routinely paid for his speeches and performances, 
but nothing compared to what he could receive if he declared that his tricks derived from psychic powers or divine or extraterrestrial influences. Most professional conjurers worldwide seem to believe in the reality of psychic phenomena, according to polls of their views. As a conjurer, he has done much to expose remote viewers, telepaths, and faith healers who have built the public. He demonstrated the simple deceptions and misdirections by which some psychic spoonbenders had conned prominent theoretical physicists into deducing new physical phenomena. He has received wide recognition among scientists and is a recipient of the MacArthur Foundation, so-called Genius Prize Fellowship. One critic castigated him for being obsessed with reality. I wish the same could be said of our nation and our species. Randy has done more than anyone else in recent times to expose pretension and fraud in the lucrative business of faith healing. He sifts refuse. He reports gossip. He listens in on the stream of miraculous information coming to the itinerant healer, not by spiritual inspiration from God, but at the radio frequency of 39.17 megahertz, transmitted by his wife backstage. He discovers that those who rise from their wheelchairs and are declared healed had never before been confined to wheelchairs. They were invited by an usher to sit in them. He challenges the faith healers to provide serious medical evidence for the validity of their claims. He invites local and federal government agencies to enforce the laws against fraud and medical malpractice. He chastises the news media for their studied avoidance of the issue. He exposes the profound contempt of these faith healers for their patients and parishioners. Many are conscious charlatans, using Christian evangelical or New Age language and symbols to prey on human frailty. Perhaps there are some with motives that are not venal. Or am I being too harsh? How is the occasional charlatan in faith healing different from the occasional fraud in science? Is it fair to be suspicious of an entire profession because of a few bad apples? There are at least two important differences, it seems to me. First, no one doubts that science actually works, whatever mistaken and fraudulent claim may from time to time be offered. But whether there are any miraculous cures from faith healing beyond the body's own ability to cure itself is very much at issue. Secondly, the expose of fraud and error in science is made almost exclusively by science. The discipline polices itself, meaning that scientists are aware of the potential for charlatanry and mistakes. But the exposure of fraud and error in faith healing is almost never done by other faith healers. Indeed, it is striking how reluctant the churches and synagogues are in condemning demonstrable deception in their midst. When conventional medicine fails, when we must confront pain and death, of course we are open to other prospects for hope. And after all, some illnesses are psychogenic. Many can be at least ameliorated by a positive cast of mind. Placebos are dummy drugs, often sugar pills. Drug companies routinely compare the effectiveness of their drugs against placebos given to patients with the same disease who had no way to tell the difference between the drug and the placebo. Placebos can be astonishingly effective, especially for colds, anxiety, depression, pain, and symptoms that are plausibly generated by the mind. Conceivably, endorphins, the small brain proteins with morphine-like effects, can be elicited by belief. A placebo works only if the patient believes it's an effective medicine. Within strict limits, hope, it seems, can be transformed into biochemistry. As a typical example, consider the nausea and vomiting that frequently accompany the chemotherapy given to cancer and AIDS patients. Nausea and vomiting can also be caused psychogenically, for instance by fear. The drug on dancitron hydrochloride greatly reduces the incidence of these symptoms. But is it actually the drug or the expectation of relief? In a double-blind study, 96% of patients rated the drug effective. So did 10% of the patients taking an identical-looking placebo. In an application of the fallacy of observational selection, unanswered prayers may be forgotten or dismissed. There is a real toll, though. Some patients who are not cured by faith reproach themselves. Perhaps it's their own fault. Perhaps they didn't believe hard enough. Skepticism, they are rightly told, is an impediment both to faith and to placebo healing. Nearly half of all Americans believe there is such a thing as psychic or spiritual healing. Miraculous cures have been associated with a wide variety of healers, real and imagined, throughout human history. Scrofula, a kind of tuberculosis, was in England called the King's Evil, 
and was supposedly curable only by the king's touch. Victims patiently lined up to be touched. The monarch briefly submitted to another burdensome obligation of high office. And despite no one, it seems, actually being cured, the practice continued for centuries. A famous Irish faith healer of the 17th century was Valentine Greatrax. He found somewhat to his surprise that he had the power to cure disease, including colds, ulcers, soreness, and epilepsy. The demand for his services became so great that he had no time for anything else. He was forced to become a healer, he complained. His method was to cast out the demons responsible for disease. All diseases, he asserted, were caused by evil spirits, many of whom he recognized and called by name. A contemporary chronicler, cited by Mackay, noted that he boasted of being much better acquainted with the intrigues of demons than he was with the affairs of men. So great was the confidence in him that the blind fancied they saw the light which they did not see. The deaf imagined that they heard, the lame that they walked straight, and the paralytic that they had recovered the use of their limbs. An idea of health made the sick forget for a while their maladies and imagination, which was not less active in those merely drawn by curiosity than in the sick, gave a false view to the one class. From the desire of seeing, as it operated a false cure on the other from the strong desire of being healed. There are countless reports in the world literature of exploration and anthropology, not only of sicknesses being cured by faith in the healer, but also of people wasting away and dying when cursed by a sorcerer. A more or less typical example is told by Alvar Núñez Cabeza de Vaca, who with a few companions and under conditions of terrible privation, wandered on land and sea, from Florida to Texas to Mexico in 1528 to 36. The many different communities of Native Americans he met longed to believe in the supernatural healing powers of the strange, light-skinned, black-bearded foreigners and their black-skinned companion from Morocco, Estebanico. Eventually, whole villages came out to meet them, depositing all their wealth at the feet of the Spaniards and humbly imploring cures. It began modestly enough. They tried to make us into medicine men, without examining us or asking for credentials, for they cure illnesses by blowing on the sick person, and they ordered us to do the same and be of some use. The way in which we cured was by making the sign of the cross over them and blowing on them and reciting a Pater Noster and an Ave Maria. As soon as we made the sign of the cross over them, all those for whom we prayed told the others that they were well and healthy. Soon they were curing cripples. Cabeza de Vaca reports he raised a man from the dead. After that, we were very much hampered by the large number of people who were following us. Their eagerness to come and touch us was very great, and their importunity so extreme that three hours would pass without our being able to persuade them to leave us alone. When a tribe begged the Spaniards not to leave them, Cabeza de Vaca and his companions became angry. Then, a strange thing happened. Many of them fell ill, and eight men died the next day, all over the land. In the places where this became known, they were so afraid of us that it seemed that the very sight of us made them almost die of fear. They implored us not to be angry, nor to wish for any more of them to die, and they were altogether convinced that we killed them simply by wishing to. In 1858, an apparition of the Virgin Mary was reported in Lourdes, France. The Mother of God confirmed the dogma of her Immaculate Conception, which had been proclaimed by Pope Pius IX just four years earlier. Something like a hundred million people have come to Lourdes since then in the hope of being cured, many with illnesses that the medicine of the time was helpless to defeat. The Roman Catholic Church rejected the authenticity of large numbers of claimed miraculous cures, accepting only 65 in nearly a century and a half of tumors, tuberculosis, ophthalmitis, impetigo, bronchitis, paralysis, and other diseases, but not, say, the regeneration of a limb or a severed spinal cord. Of the 65, women outnumber men ten to one. The odds of a miraculous cure at Lourdes, then, are about one in a million. You are roughly as likely to recover after visiting Lourdes as you are to win the lottery or to die in the crash of a randomly selected, regularly scheduled airplane flight, including the one taking you to Lourdes. A famous Irish faith healer of the 17th century was Valentine Greatrax. He found, somewhat to his surprise, that he had the power to cure disease, including colds, ulcers, soreness, and epilepsy. 
The demand for his services became so great that he had no time for anything else. He was forced to become a healer, he complained. His method was to cast out the demons responsible for disease. All diseases, he asserted, were caused by evil spirits, many of whom he recognized and called by name. A contemporary chronicler, cited by McKay, noted that he boasted of being much better acquainted with the intrigues of demons than he was with the affairs of men. So great was the confidence in him that the blind fancied they saw the light which they did not see, the deaf imagined that they heard, the lame that they walked straight, and the paralytic that they had recovered the use of their limbs. An idea of health made the sick forget for a while their maladies, and imagination, which was not less active in those merely drawn by curiosity than in the sick, gave a false view to the one class, from the desire of seeing, as it operated a false cure on the other from the strong desire of being healed. There are countless reports in the world literature of exploration and anthropology, not only of sicknesses being cured by faith in the healer, but also of people wasting away and dying when cursed by a sorcerer. A more or less typical example is told by Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, who with a few companions and under conditions of terrible privation wandered on land and sea, from Florida to Texas to Mexico in 1528 to 36. The many different communities of Native Americans he met longed to believe in the supernatural healing powers of the strange, light-skinned, black-bearded foreigners and their black-skinned companion from Morocco, Estebanico. Eventually, whole villages came out to meet them, depositing all their wealth at the feet of the Spaniards and humbly imploring cures. It began modestly enough. They tried to make us into medicine men without examining us or asking for credentials, for they cure illnesses by blowing on the sick person, and they ordered us to do the same and be of some use. The way in which we cured was by making the sign of the cross over them and blowing on them and reciting a Pater Noster and an Ave Maria. As soon as we made the sign of the cross over them, all those for whom we prayed told the others that they were well and healthy. Soon they were curing cripples. Cabeza de Vaca reports he raised a man from the dead. After that we were very much hampered by the large number of people who were following us. Their eagerness to come and touch us was very great, and their importunity so extreme that three hours would pass without our being able to persuade them to leave us alone. When a tribe begged the Spaniards not to leave them, Cabeza de Vaca and his companions became angry. Then a strange thing happened. Many of them fell ill, and eight men died the next day. All over the land, in the places where this became known, they were so afraid of us that it seemed that the very sight of us made them almost die of fear. They implored us not to be angry, nor to wish for any more of them to die, and they were altogether convinced that we killed them simply by wishing to. In 1858, an apparition of the Virgin Mary was reported in Lourdes, France. The Mother of God confirmed the dogma of her immaculate conception which had been proclaimed by Pope Pius IX just four years earlier. Something like a hundred million people have come to Lourdes since then in the hope of being cured, many with illnesses that the medicine of the time was helpless to defeat. The Roman Catholic Church rejected the authenticity of large numbers of claimed miraculous cures, accepting only sixty-five in nearly a century and a half of tumors, tuberculosis, ophthalmitis, impetigo, bronchitis, paralysis, and other diseases, but not, say, the regeneration of a limb or a severed spinal cord. Of the sixty-five, women outnumber men ten to one. The odds of a miraculous cure at Lourdes, then, are about one in a million. You are roughly as likely to recover after visiting Lourdes as you are to win the lottery, or to die in the crash of a randomly selected, regularly scheduled airplane flight including the one taking you to Lourdes. The spontaneous remission rate of all cancers, lumped together, is estimated to be something between 1 in 10,000 and 1 in 100,000. If no more than 5% of those who come to Lourdes were there to treat their cancers, there should have been something between 50 and 500 miraculous cures of cancer alone. Since only three of the attested 65 cures are of cancer, the rate of spontaneous remission at Lourdes seems to be lower than if the victims had just stayed at home. Of course, if you're one of the 65, it's going to be very hard to convince you that your trip to Lourdes wasn't the cause of the remission of your disease. Post hoc. Ergo propter hoc. Something similar seems true of individual faith healers. After hearing much from his patients about alleged faith healing, 
A Minnesota physician named William Nolan spent a year and a half trying to track down the most striking cases. Was there clear medical evidence that the disease was really present before the cure? If so, had the disease actually disappeared after the cure, or did we just have the healers or the patients say so? He uncovered many cases of fraud, including the first exposure in America of psychic surgery, but he found not one instance of cure of any serious organic, non-psychogenic disease. There were no cases where gallstones or rheumatoid arthritis, say, were cured, much less cancer or cardiovascular disease. When a child's spleen is ruptured, Nolan noted, perform a simple surgical operation and the child is completely better. But take that child to a faith healer, and she's dead in a day. Dr. Nolan's conclusion, when faith healers treat serious organic disease, they are responsible for untold anguish and unhappiness. The healers become killers. Even a recent book advocating the efficacy of prayer in treating disease, Larry Dossey, Healing Words, is troubled by the fact that some diseases are more easily cured or mitigated than others. If prayer works, why can't God cure cancer or grow back a severed limb? Why so much avoidable suffering that God could so readily prevent? Why does God have to be prayed to at all? Doesn't he already know what cures need to be performed? Dossey also begins with a quote from Stanley Krippner. Maryland, described as one of the most authoritative investigators of the variety of unorthodox healing methods used around the world. The research data on distant prayer-based healing are promising, but too sparse to allow any firm conclusion to be drawn. This after many trillions of prayers over the millennia. As Cabeza de Vaca's experience suggests, the mind can cause certain diseases, even fatal diseases. When blindfolded patients are deceived into believing they're being touched by a leaf such as poison ivy or poison oak, they produce an ugly red contact dermatitis. What faith healing characteristically may help are mind-mediated or placebo diseases. Some back and knee pains, headaches, stuttering, ulcers, stress, hay fever, asthma, hysterical paralysis and blindness, and false pregnancy, with cessation of menstrual periods and abdominal swelling. These are all diseases in which the state of mind may play a key role. In the late medieval cures associated with apparitions of the Virgin Mary, most were of sudden short-lived whole-body or partial paralyses that are plausibly psychogenic. It was widely held, moreover, that only devout believers could be so cured. It's no surprise that appeals to a state of mind called faith can relieve symptoms caused, at least in part, by another, perhaps not very different state of mind. But there's something more. The Harvest Moon Festival is an important holiday in traditional Chinese communities in America. In the week preceding the festival, the death rate in the community is found to fall by 35%. In the following week, the death rate jumps by 35%. Control groups of non-Chinese show no such effect. You might think that suicides are responsible, but only deaths from natural causes are counted. You might think that stress or overeating might account for it, but this could hardly explain the fall in death rate before the harvest moon. The largest effect is for people with cardiovascular disease, which is known to be influenced by stress. Cancer showed a smaller effect. On more detailed study, it turned out that the fluctuations in death rate occurred exclusively among women 75 years old or older. The harvest moon festival is presided over by the oldest women in the households. They were able to stave off death for a week or two to perform their ceremonial responsibilities. A similar effect is found among Jewish men in the weeks centered on Passover, a ceremony in which older men play a leading role, and likewise worldwide for birthdays, graduation ceremonies, and the like. In a more controversial study, Stanford University psychiatrists divided 86 women with metastatic breast cancer into two groups, one in which they were encouraged to examine their fears of dying and to take charge of their lives, and the other given no special psychiatric support. To the surprise of the researchers, not only did the support group experience less pain, but they also lived, on average, 18 months longer. The leader of the Stanford study, David Spiegel, speculates that the cause may be cortisol and other stress hormones, which impair the body's protective immune system. Severely depressed people, students during exam periods, and the bereaved all have reduced white blood cell counts. Good emotional support may not have much effect on advanced forms of cancer, but it may work to reduce the chances of secondary infections in a person already much weakened by the disease or its treatment. 
In his nearly forgotten 1903 book, Christian Science, Mark Twain wrote, The power which a man's imagination has over his body to heal it or make it sick is a force which none of us is born without. The first man had it, the last one will possess it. Occasionally some of the pain and anxiety or other symptoms of more serious diseases can be relieved by faith healers, however without arresting the progress of the disease. But this is no small benefit. Faith and prayer may be able to relieve some symptoms of disease and their treatment, ease the suffering of the afflicted, and even prolong lives a little. In assessing the religion called Christian science, Mark Twain, its severest critic of the time, nevertheless allowed that the bodies and lives it had made whole by the power of suggestion more than compensated for those it had killed by withholding medical treatment in favor of prayer. After his death, assorted Americans reported contact with the ghost of President John F. Kennedy. Before home shrines bearing his picture, miraculous cures began to be reported. He gave his life for his people, one adherent of this stillborn religion explained. According to the Encyclopedia of American Religions, to believers Kennedy is thought of as a god. Something similar can be seen in the Elvis Presley phenomenon and the heartfelt cry, The King Lives. If such belief systems could arise spontaneously, think how much more could be done by a well-organized and especially an unscrupulous campaign. In response to their inquiry, Randy suggested to Australia's 60 Minutes that they generate a hoax from scratch, using someone with no training in magic or public speaking and no experience in the pulpit. As he was thinking the scam through, his eye fell upon José Luis Alvarez a young performance sculptor who was Randy's tenant. Why not? answered Alvarez, who when I met him seemed bright, good-humored, and thoughtful. He went through intensive training, including mock TV appearances and press conferences. He didn't have to think up the answers, though, because he had a nearly invisible radio receiver in his ear, through which Randy prompted. Emissaries from 60 Minutes checked Alvarez's performance. The Carlos personality was Alvarez's invention. When Alvarez and his manager likewise recruited for the job with no previous experience, arrived in Sydney. There was James Randy, slouching and inconspicuous, whispering into his transmitter at the periphery of the action. The substantiating documentation had all been faked. The curse, the water-throwing, and all the rest were rehearsed to attract media attention. They did. Many of the people who showed up at the Opera House had done so because of the television and press attention. One Australian newspaper chain even printed verbatim handouts from the Carlos Foundation. After 60 Minutes aired, the rest of the Australian media was furious. They had been used, they complained, lied to. Just as there are legal guidelines concerning the police use of provocateurs, thundered Peter Robinson in the Australian Financial Review, there must be limits to how far the media can go in setting up a misleading situation. I, for one, can simply not accept that telling a lie is an acceptable way of reporting the truth. Every poll of public opinion shows that there is a suspicion among the general public that the media do not tell the whole truth, or that they distort things, or that they exaggerate, or that they are biased. Mr. Robinson feared that Carlos might have lent credence to this widespread misperception. Headlines ranged from How Carlos Made Fools of Them A.H., to hoax was just dumb. Newspapers that had not trumpeted Carlos patted themselves on the back for their restraint. Negus said of 60 Minutes, even people of integrity can make mistakes, and denied being duped. Anyone calling himself a channeler, he said, is a fraud by definition. 60 Minutes and Randy stressed that the Australian media had made no serious effort to check any of Carlos's bona fides. He had never appeared in any of the cities listed. The videotape of Carlos on the stage of a New York theater had been a favor granted by the magician's pen and teller, who were appearing there. They asked the audience just to give a big hand of applause. Alvarez, in smock and medallion, walked on. The audience dutifully applauded. Randy got his videotape. Alvarez waved goodbye. The show went on. And there is no New York City radio station with call letters, whoop. Other reasons for suspicion could readily be mined in Carlos's writings. But because the intellectual currency has been so debased, because credulity, new age and old, is so rampant, because skeptical thinking is so rarely practiced, no parody is too implausible. The Carlos Foundation offered for sale, they were scrupulously careful not actually to sell anything, an Atlantis crystal. 
Five of these unique crystals have so far been found by the Ascended Master during his travels. Unexplained by science, each crystal harnesses almost pure energy and has enormous healing powers. The forms are actually fossilized spiritual energy and are a great boon to the preparation of the Earth for the New Age. Of the five, the Ascended Master wears one Atlantic crystal at all times, close to his body for protection and to enhance all spiritual activities. Two have been acquired by kindly supplicants in the United States of America in exchange for the substantial contribution the Ascended Master requests, or, under the heading, The Waters of Carlos. The Ascended Master finds occasionally water of such purity that he undertakes to energize a quantity of it for others to benefit, an intensive process. To produce what is always too little, the Ascended Master purifies himself and a quantity of pure quartz crystal fashioned into flasks. He then places himself and the crystals into a large copper bowl, polished and kept warm. For a twenty-four-hour period, the Ascended Master pours energy into the spiritual repository of the water. The water need not be removed from the flask to be utilized spiritually. Simply holding the flask and concentrating on healing a wound or illness will produce astounding results. However, if serious mischance befalls you or a close one, a tiny dab of the energized water will immediately assist recovery. Or, Tears of Carlos's. The red color imparted to the holding flasks that the Ascended Master has fashioned for the tears is proof enough of their power, but their affect sick during meditation has been described by those who have experienced it as a glorious oneness. Then there is a little book, The Teachings of Carlos, which begins, I am Carlos. I have come to you from many past incarnations. I have a great lesson to teach you. Listen carefully. Read carefully. Think carefully. The truth is here. The first teaching asks, Why are we here? The answer, Who can say what is the one answer? There are many answers to any question, and all the answers are right answers. It is so. Do you see? The book enjoins us not to turn to the next page until we have understood the page we are on. This is one of several factors that makes finishing it difficult. Of doubters, it reveals later, I can say only this. Let them take from the matter just what they wish. They end up with nothing, a handful of space, perhaps. And what does the believer have? Everything. All questions are answered, since all and any answers are correct answers. And the answers are right. Argue that, doubter. Or, don't ask for explanations of everything. Westerners, in particular, are always demanding long-winded descriptions of why this and why that. Most of what is asked is obvious. Why bother with probing into these matters? By belief, all things become true. The last page of the book displays a single word in large letters. We are exhorted to think. The full text of the teachings of Carlos was, of course, written by Randy. He dashed it off on his laptop computer in a few hours. The Australian media felt betrayed by one of their own. The leading television program in the country had gone out of its way to expose shoddy standards of fact-checking and widespread gullibility in institutions devoted to news and public affairs. Some media analysts excused it on the grounds that it obviously wasn't important. If it had been important, they would have checked it out. There were few mea culpas. None who had been taken in were willing to appear on a retrospective of the Carlos affair scheduled for the following Sunday on 60 Minutes. Of course, there's nothing special about Australia in all of this. Alvarez, Randy, and their co-conspirators could have chosen any nation on Earth, and it would have worked. Even those who gave Carlos a national television audience knew enough to ask some skeptical questions, but they couldn't resist inviting him to appear in the first place. The internecine struggle within the media dominated the headlines after Carlos's departure. Puzzled commentaries were written about the expose. What was the point? What was proved? Alvarez and Randy proved how little it takes to tamper with our beliefs, how readily we are led, how easy it is to fool the public when people are lonely and starve for something to believe in. If Carlos had stayed longer in Australia and concentrated more on healing, by prayer, by believing in him, by wishing on his bottled tears, by stroking his crystals, there's no doubt that people would have reported being cured of many illnesses, especially psychogenic ones. Even with nothing more fraudulent than his appearance, sayings, and ancillary products. Some people would have gotten better because of Carlos. This, again, is the placebo effect found with almost every faith healer. We believe we're taking a potent medicine and the pain goes away. 
for a time at least. And when we believe we've received a potent spiritual cure, the disease sometimes also goes away, for a time at least. Some people spontaneously announce that they've been cured even when they haven't. Detailed follow-ups by Nolan, Randy, and many others of those who have been told they were cured and agreed that they were, in, say, televised services by American faith healers, were unable to find even one person with serious organic disease who was in fact cured. Even significant improvement in their condition is dubious. As the Lord's experience suggests, you may have to go through 10,000 to a million cases before you find one truly startling recovery. A faith healer may or may not start out with fraud in mind, but to his amazement, his patients actually seem to be improving. Their emotions are genuine, their gratitude heartfelt. When the healer is criticized, such people rush to his defense. Several elderly attendees of the channeling at the Sydney Opera House were incensed after the 60 Minutes expose. Never mind what they say, they told Alvarez. We believe in you. These successes may be enough to convince many charlatans, no matter how cynical they were at the beginning, that they actually have mystical powers. Maybe they're not successful every time. The powers come and go, they tell themselves. They have to cover the downtime. If they must cheat a little now and then, it serves a higher purpose, they tell themselves. Their spiel is consumer-tested. It works. Most of these figures are only after your money. That's the good news. But what worries me is that a Carlos will come along with bigger fish to fry. Attractive, commanding, patriotic, exuding leadership. All of us long for a competent, uncorrupt, charismatic leader. We will leap at the opportunity to support, to believe, to feel good. Most reporters, editors, and producers, swept up with the rest of us, will shy away from real skeptical scrutiny. He won't be selling you prayers or crystals or tears. Perhaps he'll be selling you a war or a scapegoat or a much more all-encompassing bundle of beliefs than Carlos's. Whatever it is, it will be accompanied by warnings about the dangers of skepticism. In the celebrated film The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy the Scarecrow, the Tin Woodsman, and the Cowardly Lion are intimidated, indeed awed, by the outsized oracular figure called the Great Oz. But Dorothy's little dog Toto snaps at a concealing curtain and reveals that the Great Oz is in fact a machine run by a small, tubby, frightened man, as much an exile in this strange land as they. I think we're lucky that James Randi is tugging at the curtain, but it would be as dangerous to rely on him to expose all the quacks, humbugs, and bunkum in the world as it would be to believe those same charlatans. If we don't want to get taken, we need to do this job for ourselves. One of the saddest lessons of history is this. If we've been bamboozled long enough, we tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle. We're no longer interested in finding out the truth. The bamboozle has captured us. It's simply too painful to acknowledge, even to ourselves, that we've been taken. Once you give a charlatan power over you, you almost never get it back. So the old bamboozles tend to persist as the new ones rise. Seances occur only in darkened rooms, where the ghostly visitors can be seen dimly at best. If we turn up the lights a little so we have a chance to see what's going on, the spirits vanish. They're shy, we're told, and some of us believe it. In 20th century parapsychology laboratories, there is the observer effect. Those described as gifted psychics find that their powers diminish markedly whenever skeptics arrive and disappear altogether in the presence of a conjurer as skilled as James Randi. What they need is darkness and gullibility. A little girl who had been a co-conspirator in a famous 19th century flim-flam, spirit wrapping in which ghosts answer questions by loud thumping, grew up and confessed it was an imposture. She was cracking the joint in her big toe. She demonstrated how it was done. But the public apology was largely ignored and, when acknowledged, denounced. Spirit rapping was too reassuring to be abandoned merely on the say-so of a self-confessed rapper, even if she started the whole business in the first place. The story began to circulate that the confession was coerced out of her by fanatical rationalists. As I described earlier, British hoaxers confessed to having made crop circles, geometrical figures generated in grain fields. It wasn't alien artists working in wheat as their medium, but two blokes with a board, a rope, and a taste for whimsy. Even when they demonstrated how they did it, though, believers were unimpressed. Maybe some of the crop circles are hoaxes, they argued, but there are too many of them, and some of the pictograms are too complex. 
Only extraterrestrials could do it. Then others in Britain confessed. But crop circles abroad, it was objected. In Hungary, for example, how can you explain that? Then copycat Hungarian teenagers confessed. But what about... To test the credulity of an alien abduction psychiatrist, a woman poses as an abductee. The therapist is enthusiastic about the fantasies she spins. But when she announces it was all a fake, what is his response? To re-examine his protocols or his understanding of what these cases mean? No. On various days he suggests, one, even if she isn't herself aware of it, she was in fact abducted. Or two, she's crazy. After all, she went to a psychiatrist, didn't she? Or three, he was on top of the hoax from the beginning and just gave her enough rope to hang herself. If it's sometimes easier to reject strong evidence than to admit that we've been wrong, this is also information about ourselves worth having. A scientist places an ad in a Paris newspaper offering a free horoscope. He receives about 150 replies, each as requested, detailing a place and time of birth. Every respondent is then sent the identical horoscope, along with a questionnaire asking how accurate the horoscope had been. 94% of the respondents, and 90% of their families and friends, reply that they were at least recognizable in the horoscope. However, the horoscope was drawn up for a French serial killer. If an astrologer can get this far without even meeting his subjects, think how well someone sensitive to human nuances and not overly scrupulous might do. Why are we so easily taken in by fortune tellers, psychic seers, palmists, tea leaf, tarot, and yarrow readers and their ilk? Of course, they note our posture, facial expressions, clothing, and answers to seemingly innocuous questions. Some of them are brilliant at it, and these are areas about which many scientists seem almost unconscious. There is also a computer network to which professional psychics subscribe, the details of their customers' lives available to their colleagues in an instant. A key tool is the so-called cold read, a statement of opposing predispositions so tenuously balanced that anyone will recognize a grain of truth. Here's an example. At times you are extroverted, affable, sociable, while at other times you are introverted, wary and reserved. You have found it unwise to be too frank in revealing yourself to others. You prefer a certain amount of change and variety and become dissatisfied when hemmed in by restrictions and limitations. Disciplined and controlled on the outside, you tend to be worrisome and insecure on the inside. While you have some personality weaknesses, you are generally able to compensate for them. You have a great deal of unused capacity, which you have not turned to your advantage. You have a tendency to be critical of yourself. You have a strong need for other people to like you and for them to admire you. Almost everyone finds this characterization recognizable, and many feel that it describes them perfectly. Small wonder, we are all human. The list of evidence that some therapists think demonstrates repressed childhood sexual abuse, for example, in The Courage to Heal by Ellen Bass and Laura Davis, is very long and prosaic. It includes sleep disorders, overeating, anorexia and bulimia, sexual dysfunction, vague anxieties, and even an inability to remember childhood sexual abuse. Another book by the social worker E. Sue Bloom lists among other telltale signs of forgotten incest. Headaches, suspicion or its absence, excessive sexual passion or its absence, and adoring one's parents. Among diagnostic items for detecting dysfunctional families listed by Charles Whitfield, Maryland, are aches and pains, feeling more alive in a crisis, being anxious about authority figures, and having tried counseling or psychotherapy, yet feeling that something is wrong or missing. Like the cold read, if the list is long and broad enough, everyone will have symptoms. Skeptical scrutiny is not only the toolkit for rooting out bunkum and cruelty that prey on those least able to protect themselves and most in need of our compassion, people offered little other hope. It is also a timely reminder that mass rallies, radio and television, the print media, electronic marketing and mail-order technology permit other kinds of lies to be injected into the body politic, to take advantage of the frustrated, the unwary and the defenseless in a society riddled with political ills that are being treated ineffectively, if at all. Baloney, bamboozles, careless thinking, flim-flam and wishes disguised as facts are not restricted to parlor magic and ambiguous advice on matters of the heart. Unfortunately, they ripple through mainstream political, social, religious and economic issues in every nation. Chapter 14. Anti-Science There's no such thing as objective truth. 
We make our own truth. There's no such things as objective reality. We make our own reality. There are spiritual, mystical, or inner ways of knowing that are superior to our ordinary ways of knowing. If an experience seems real, it is real. If an idea feels right to you, it is right. We are incapable of acquiring knowledge of the true nature of reality. Science itself is irrational or mystical. It's just another faith or belief system or myth, with no more justification than any other. It doesn't matter whether beliefs are true or not, as long as they're meaningful to you. A summary of New Age beliefs from Theodore Schick Jr. and Louis Vaughn, How to Think About Weird Things, Critical Thinking for a New Age, Mountain View, California, Mayfield Publishing Company, 1995. Of the established framework of science is plausibly in error, or arbitrary, or irrelevant, or unpatriotic, or impious, or mainly serving the interests of the powerful, then perhaps we can save ourselves the trouble of understanding what so many people think of as a complex, difficult, highly mathematical, and counterintuitive body of knowledge. Then all the scientists would have their comeuppance. Science envy could be transcended. Those who have pursued other paths to knowledge, those who have secretly harbored beliefs that science has scorned, could now have their place in the sun. The rate of change in science is responsible for some of the fire it draws. Just when we finally understood something the scientists are talking about, they tell us it isn't any longer true. And even if it is, there's a slew of new things, things we never heard of, things difficult to believe, things with disquieting implications, that they claim to have discovered recently. Scientists can be perceived as toying with us, as wanting to overturn everything, as socially dangerous. Edward U. Condon was a distinguished American physicist, a pioneer in quantum mechanics, a participant in the development of radar and nuclear weapons in World War II, research director of Corning Glass, director of the National Bureau of Standards, and president of the American Physical Society, as well as, late in his life, professor of physics at the University of Colorado, where he directed a controversial Air Force-funded scientific study of UFOs. He was one of the physicists whose loyalty to the United States was challenged by members of Congress, including Congressman Richard M. Nixon, who called for the revocation of his security clearance in the late 1940s and early 1950s. The super-patriotic chairman of the House Committee on Un-American Activities, HCUA, Reverend J. Parnell Thomas, would call the physicist Dr. Condom, the weakest link in American security, and, at one point, the missing link. His view on constitutional guarantees can be gleaned from the following response to a witness's lawyer. The rights you have are the rights given you by this committee. We will determine what rights you have and what rights you have not got before the committee. Albert Einstein publicly called on all those summoned before HCUA to refuse to cooperate. In 1948, President Harry Truman, at the annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and with Condon sitting beside him, denounced Rep. Thomas and HCUA on the grounds that vital scientific research may be made impossible by the creation of an atmosphere in which no man feels safe against the public airing of unfounded rumors, gossip, and vilification. He called HCUA's activities the most un-American thing we have to contend with today. It is the climate of a totalitarian country. The playwright Arthur Miller wrote The Crucible about the Salem witch trials in this period. When the drama opened in Europe, Miller was denied a passport by the State Department on the grounds that it was not in the best interests of the United States for him to travel abroad. On opening night in Brussels, the play was greeted with tumultuous applause, whereupon the U.S. ambassador stood up and took a bow. Brought before HCUA, Miller was chastised for the suggestion that congressional investigations might have something in common with witch trials. He replied, The comparison is inevitable, sir. Thomas was shortly afterwards thrown in jail for fraud. One summer in graduate school, I was a student of Condon's. I remember vividly his account of being brought up before some loyalty review board. Dr. Condon, it says here that you have been at the forefront of a revolutionary movement in physics called and here the Inquisitor read the words slowly and carefully. Quantum mechanics. It strikes this hearing that if you could be at the forefront of one revolutionary movement, you could be at the forefront of another. Condon, quick on his feet, replied that the accusation was untrue. He was not a revolutionary in physics. 
he raised his right hand. I believe in Archimedes' principle, formulated in the 3rd century BC. I believe in Kepler's laws of planetary motion, discovered in the 17th century. I believe in Newton's laws. And on he went, invoking the illustrious names of Bernoulli, Fourier, Ampere, Boltzmann, and Maxwell. This physicist's catechism did not gain him much. Asterisk. But Truman's responsibility for the witch-hunt atmosphere of the late 1940s and early 1950s is considerable. His 1947 Executive Order 9835 authorized inquiries into the opinions and associates of all federal employees without the right to confront the accuser, or even in most cases to know what the accusation was. Those found wanting were fired. His Attorney General, Tom Clark, established a list of subversive organizations so wide that at one time it included Consumers Union. He Tribunal did not appreciate humor in so serious a matter, but the most they were able to pin on Condon, as I recall, was that in high school he had a job delivering a socialist newspaper door-to-door -door on his bicycle. Imagine you seriously want to understand what quantum mechanics is about. There is a mathematical underpinning that you must first acquire, mastery of each mathematical subdiscipline leading you to the threshold of the next. In turn, you must learn arithmetic, Euclidean geometry, high school algebra, differential and integral calculus, ordinary and partial differential equations, vector calculus, certain special functions of mathematical physics, matrix algebra, and group theory. For most physics students, this might occupy them from, say, third grade to early graduate school, roughly 15 years. Such a course of study does not actually involve learning any quantum mechanics, but merely establishing the mathematical framework required to approach it deeply. The job of the popularizer of science, trying to get across some idea of quantum mechanics to a general audience that has not gone through these initiation rites, is daunting. Indeed, there are no successful popularizations of quantum mechanics, in my opinion, partly for this reason. These mathematical complexities are compounded by the fact that quantum theory is so resolutely counterintuitive. Common sense is almost useless in approaching it. It's no good, Richard Feynman once said, asking why it is that way. No one knows why it is that way. That's just the way it is. Now suppose we were to approach some obscure religion or New Age doctrine or shamanistic belief system skeptically. We have an open mind. We understand there's something interesting here. We introduce ourselves to the practitioner and ask for an intelligible summary. Instead, we are told that it's intrinsically too difficult to be explained simply, that it's replete with mysteries. But if we're willing to become acolytes for 15 years, at the end of that time we might begin to be prepared to consider the subject seriously. Most of us, I think, would say that we simply don't have the time. And many would suspect that the business about 15 years just to get to the threshold of understanding is evidence that the whole subject is a bamboozle. If it's too hard for us to understand, doesn't it follow that it's too hard for us to criticize knowledgeably? Then the bamboozle has free reign. So how is shamanistic or theological or New Age doctrine different from quantum mechanics? The answer is that even if we cannot understand it, we can verify that quantum mechanics works. We can compare the quantitative predictions of quantum theory with the measured wavelengths of spectral lines of the chemical elements the behavior of semiconductors and liquid helium, microprocessors, which kinds of molecules form from their constituent atoms, the existence and properties of white dwarf stars, what happens in masers and lasers, and which materials are susceptible to which kinds of magnetism. We don't have to understand the theory to see what it predicts. We don't have to be accomplished physicists to read what the experiments reveal. In every one of these instances, as in many others, the predictions of quantum mechanics are strikingly, and to high accuracy, confirmed. But the shaman tells us that his doctrine is true because it too works, not on arcane matters of mathematical physics, but on what really counts. He can cure people. Very well then, let's accumulate the statistics on shamanistic cures and see if they work better than placebos. If they do, let's willingly grant that there's something here even if it's only that some illnesses are psychogenic and can be cured or mitigated by the right attitudes and mental states. We can also compare the efficacy of alternative shamanistic systems. Whether the shaman grasps why his cures work is another story. In quantum mechanics, we have a purported understanding of nature on the basis of which, step by step and quantitatively, we make predictions about what will happen if a certain experiment, 
never before attempted, is carried out. If the experiment bears out the prediction, especially if it does so numerically and precisely, we have confidence that we knew what we were doing. There are at best few examples with this character among shamans, priests, and New Age gurus. Another important distinction was suggested in Reason and Nature, the 1931 book by Morris Cohen, a celebrated philosopher of science. To be sure, the vast majority of people who are untrained can accept the results of science only on authority. But there is obviously an important difference between an establishment that is open and invites everyone to come, study its methods, and suggest improvement, and one that regards the questioning of its credentials as due to wickedness of heart, such as Cardinal Newman attributed to those who questioned the infallibility of the Bible. Rational science treats its credit notes as always redeemable on demand, while non-rational authoritarianism regards the demand for the redemption of its paper as a disloyal lack of faith. The myths and folklore of many pre-modern cultures have explanatory or at least mnemonic value. In stories that everyone can appreciate and even witness, they encode the environment. Which constellations are rising or the orientation of the Milky Way on a given day of the year can be remembered by a story about lovers reunited or a canoe negotiating the sacred river. Since recognizing the sky is essential for planting and reaping and following the game, such stories have important practical value. They can also be helpful as psychological projective tests or as reassurances of humanity's place in the universe. But that doesn't mean that the Milky Way really is a river, or that a canoe really is traversing it before our eyes. Quinine comes from an infusion of the bark of a particular tree from the Amazon rainforest. How did pre-modern people ever discover that a tea made from this tree, of all the plants in the forest, would relieve the symptoms of malaria? They must have tried every tree and every plant, roots, stems, bark, leaves, tried chewing on them, mashing them up, making an infusion. This constitutes a massive set of scientific experiments continuing over generations, experiments that moreover could not be duplicated today for reasons of medical ethics. Think of how many bark infusions from other trees must have been useless, or made the patient wretch or even die. In such a case, the healer chalks these potential medicines off the list and moves on to the next. The data of ethnopharmacology may not be systematically or even consciously acquired. By trial and error, though, and carefully remembering what worked, eventually they get there, using the rich molecular riches in the plant kingdom to accumulate a pharmacopoeia that works. Absolutely essential, life-saving information can be acquired from folk medicine and in no other way. We should be doing much more than we are to mine the treasures in such folk knowledge worldwide. Likewise, for, say, predicting the weather in a valley near the Orinoco, it is perfectly possible that pre-industrial peoples have noted over the millennia regularities, premonitory indications, cause and effect relationships at a particular geographic locale, of which professors of meteorology and climatology in some distant university are wholly ignorant. But it does not follow that the shamans of such cultures are able to predict the weather in Paris or Tokyo, much less the global climate. Certain kinds of folk knowledge are valid and priceless. Others are at best metaphors and codifiers. Ethnomedicine, yes. Astrophysics, no. It is certainly true that all beliefs and all myths are worthy of a respectful hearing. It is not true that all folk beliefs are equally valid if we're talking not about an internal mindset, but about understanding the external reality. For centuries, science has been under a line of attack that, rather than pseudoscience, can be called anti-science. Science and academic scholarship in general the contention these days goes, is too subjective. Some even allege it's entirely subjective, as is, they say, history. History generally is written by the victors to justify their actions, to arouse patriotic fervor, and to suppress the legitimate claims of the vanquished. When no overwhelming victory takes place, each side writes self-promotional accounts of what really happened. English histories castigated the French and vice versa, U.S. histories until very recently ignored the de facto policies of Lebensraum and genocide toward Native Americans. Japanese histories of the events leading to World War II minimize Japanese atrocities and suggest that their chief purpose was altruistically to free East Asia from European and American colonialism. Poland was invaded in 1939, 
Nazi historians asserted because Poland, ruthless and unprovoked, attacked Germany. Soviet historians pretended that the Soviet troops that put down the Hungarian, 1956, and Czech, 1968 revolutions, were invited in by general acclamation in the invaded nations, rather than by Russian stooges. Belgian histories tend to gloss over the atrocities committed when the Congo was a private fiefdom of the King of Belgium. Chinese historians are strangely oblivious of the tens of millions of deaths caused by Mao Zedong's great leap forward. That God condones and even advocates slavery was repeatedly argued from the pulpit and in the schools in Christian slaveholding societies, but Christian polities that have freed their slaves are mostly silent on the matter. As brilliant, widely read and sober a historian as Edward Gibbon would not meet with Benjamin Franklin when they found themselves at the same English country inn, because of the late unpleasantness of the American Revolution. Franklin then volunteered source material to Gibbon when he turned, as Franklin was sure he soon would, from the decline and fall of the Roman Empire to the decline and fall of the British Empire. Franklin was right about the British Empire, but his timetable was about two centuries early. These histories have traditionally been written by admired academic historians, often pillars of the establishment. Local dissent is given short shrift. Objectivity is sacrificed in the service of higher goals. From this doleful fact, some have gone so far as to conclude that there is no such thing as history, no possibility of reconstructing the actual events, that all we have are biased self-justifications, and that this conclusion stretches from history to all of knowledge, science included. And yet, who would deny that there were actual sequences of historical events, with real causal threads, even if our ability to reconstruct them in their full weave is limited? even if the signal is awash in an ocean of self-congratulatory noise. The danger of subjectivity and prejudice has been apparent from the beginning of history. Thucydides warned against it. Cicero wrote, The first law is that the historian shall never dare to set down what is false. The second, that he shall never dare to conceal the truth. The third, that there shall be no suspicion in his work of either favoritism or prejudice. Lucian of Samosata in How History Should Be Written, published in the year 170, urged the historian should be fearless and incorruptible, a man of independence, loving frankness and truth. It is the responsibility of those historians with integrity to try to reconstruct that actual sequence of events, however disappointing or alarming it may be. Historians learn to suppress their natural indignation about affronts to their nations and acknowledge, where appropriate, that their national leaders may have committed atrocious crimes. They may have to dodge outraged patriots as an occupational hazard. They recognize that accounts of events have passed through biased human filters and that historians themselves have biases. Those who want to know what actually happened will become fully conversant with the views of historians in other, once adversary, nations. All that can be hoped for is a set of successive approximations. By slow steps, and through improving self-knowledge, our understanding of historical events improves. Something similar is true in science. We have biases. We breathe in the prevailing prejudices from our surroundings like everyone else. Scientists have on occasion given aid and comfort to a variety of noxious doctrines, including the supposed superiority of one ethnic group or gender over another from measurements of brain size or skull bumps or IQ tests. Scientists are often reluctant to offend the rich and powerful. Occasionally a few of them cheat and steal. Some worked, many without a trace of moral regret for the Nazis. Scientists also exhibit biases connected with human chauvinisms and with our intellectual limitations. As I've discussed earlier, scientists are also responsible for deadly technologies, sometimes inventing them on purpose, sometimes being insufficiently cautious about unintended side effects. But it is also scientists who, in most such cases, have blown the whistle alerting us to the danger. Scientists make mistakes. Accordingly, it is the job of the scientist to recognize our weakness, to examine the widest range of opinions, to be ruthlessly self-critical. Science is a collective enterprise with the error correction machinery often running smoothly. It has an overwhelming advantage over history, because in science we can do experiments. If you are unsure of the negotiations leading to the Treaty of Paris in 1814-15, 
Replaying the events is an unavailable option. You can only dig into old records. You cannot even ask questions of the participants. Every one of them is dead. But for many questions in science, you can rerun the event as many times as you like, examine it in new ways, test a wide range of alternative hypotheses. When new tools are devised, you can perform the experiment again and see what emerges from your improved sensitivity. In those historical sciences where you cannot arrange a rerun, you can examine related cases and begin to recognize their common components. We can't make stars explode at our convenience, nor can we repeatedly evolve through many trials a mammal from its ancestors. But we can simulate some of the physics of supernova explosions in the laboratory, and we can compare in staggering detail the genetic instructions of mammals and reptiles. The claim is also sometimes made that science is as arbitrary or irrational as all other claims to knowledge, or that reason itself is an illusion. The American revolutionary Ethan Allen, leader of the Green Mountain Boys in their capture of Fort Ticonderoga, had some words on this subject. Those who invalidate reason ought seriously to consider whether they argue against reason with or without reason. If with reason, then they establish the principle that they are laboring to dethrone. But if they argue without reason, which in order to be consistent with themselves they must do, they are out of reach of rational conviction, nor do they deserve a rational argument. The reader can judge the depth of this argument. Anyone who witnesses the advance of science firsthand sees an intensely personal undertaking. There are always a few, driven by simple wonder and great integrity, or by frustration with the inadequacies of existing knowledge, or simply upset with themselves for their imagined inability to understand what everyone else can, who proceed to ask the devastating key questions. A few saintly personalities stand out amidst a roiling sea of jealousies, ambition, backbiting, suppression of dissent, and absurd conceits. In some fields, highly productive fields, such behavior is almost the norm. I think all that social turmoil and human weakness aids the enterprise of science. There is an established framework in which any scientist can prove another wrong and make sure everyone else knows about it. Even when our motives are base, we keep stumbling on something new. The American chemistry Nobel laureate Harold C. Urey once confided to me that as he got older, he was then in his 70s, he experienced increasingly concerted efforts to prove him wrong. He described it as the fastest gun in the West syndrome. The young man who could outdraw the celebrated old gunslinger would inherit his reputation and the respect paid to him. It was annoying, he grumbled, but it did help direct the young whippersnappers into important areas of research that they would never have entered on their own. Being human, scientists also sometimes engage in observational selection. They like to remember those cases when they've been right and forget when they've been wrong. But in many instances, what is wrong is partly right or stimulates others to find out what's right. One of the most productive astrophysicists of our time has been Fred Hoyle, responsible for monumental contributions to our understanding of the evolution of stars, the synthesis of the chemical elements, cosmology, and much else. Sometimes he succeeded by being right before anyone else even understood that there was something that needed explaining. Sometimes he succeeded by being wrong, by being so provocative, by suggesting such outrageous alternatives that the observers and experimentalists feel obliged to check it out. The impassioned and concerted effort to prove Fred wrong has sometimes failed and sometimes succeeded. In almost every case, it has pushed forward the frontiers of knowledge. Even Hoyle at his most outrageous. For example, proposing that the influenza and HIV viruses are dropped down on Earth from comets and that interstellar dust grains are bacteria has led to significant advances in knowledge, although turning up nothing to support those particular notions. It might be useful for scientists now and again to list some of their mistakes. It might play an instructive role in illuminating and demythologizing the process of science and in enlightening younger scientists. Even Johannes Kepler, Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, Gregor Mendel, and Albert Einstein made serious mistakes. But the scientific enterprise arranges things so that teamwork prevails. What one of us, even the most brilliant among us, misses, another of us, even someone much less celebrated and capable, may detect and rectify. For myself, I've tended in past books to recount some of the occasions when I've been right. Let me here mention a few of the cases where I've been wrong. 
at a time when no spacecraft had been to Venus, I thought at first that the atmospheric pressure was several times that on Earth, rather than many tens of times. I thought the clouds of Venus were made mainly of water, when they turn out to be only 25% water. I thought there might be plate tectonics on Mars, when close-up spacecraft observations now show hardly a hint of plate tectonics. I thought the highish infrared temperatures of Titan might be due to a sizable greenhouse effect there. Instead, it turns out, it is caused by a stratospheric temperature inversion. Just before Iraq torched the Kuwaiti oil wells in January 1991, I warned that so much smoke might get so high as to disrupt agriculture in much of South Asia. As events transpired, it was pitch black at noon, and the temperatures dropped 4-6 degrees C over the Persian Gulf, but not much smoke reached stratospheric altitudes, and Asia was spared. I did not sufficiently stress the uncertainty of the calculations. Different scientists have different speculative styles, some being much more cautious than others. As long as new ideas are testable and scientists are not overly dogmatic, no harm is done. Indeed, considerable progress can be made. In the first four instances I've just mentioned where I was wrong, I was trying to understand a distant world from a few clues in the absence of thorough spacecraft investigations. In the natural course of planetary exploration, more data come in, and we find an army of old ideas plowed down by an armamentarium of new facts. Postmodernists have criticized Kepler's astronomy because it emerged out of his medieval monotheistic religious views. Darwin's evolutionary biology for being motivated by a wish to perpetuate the privileged social class from which he came, or to justify his supposed prior atheism, and so on. Some of these claims are just, some are not. But why does it matter what biases and emotional predispositions scientists bring to their studies? so long as they are scrupulously honest and other people with different proclivities check their results. Presumably, no one would argue that the conservative view on the sum of 14 and 27 differs from the liberal view, or that the mathematical function that is its own derivative is the exponential in the northern hemisphere, but some other function in the southern. Any regular periodic function can be represented to arbitrary accuracy by a Fourier series in Muslim as well as in Hindu mathematics. Non-commutative algebras, where a times b does not equal b times a, are as self-consistent and meaningful for speakers of Indo-European languages as for speakers of Finno-Ugric. Mathematics might be prized or ignored, but it is equally true everywhere, independent of ethnicity, culture, language, religion, ideology. Towards the opposite extreme, there are questions such as whether abstract expressionism can be great art or rap great music whether it's more important to curb inflation or unemployment, whether French culture is superior to German culture, or whether prohibitions against murder should apply to the nation-state. Here the questions are over-simple, or the dichotomies false, or the answers dependent on unspoken assumptions. Here local biases might very well determine the answers. Where in this subjective continuum, from almost fully independent of cultural norms to almost wholly dependent on them, does science lie? Although issues of bias and cultural chauvinism certainly arise, and although its content is continually being refined, science is clearly much closer to mathematics than it is to fashion. The claim that its findings are in general arbitrary and biased is not merely tendentious, but specious. The historians Joyce Appleby, Lynn Hunt, and Margaret Jacob, in Telling the Truth About History, 1994, criticize Isaac Newton. He is said to have rejected the philosophical position of Descartes because it might challenge conventional religion and lead to social chaos and atheism. Such criticisms amount only to the charge that scientists are human. How Newton was buffeted by the intellectual currents of his time is of course of interest to the historian of ideas, but it has little bearing on the truth of his propositions. For them to be generally accepted, they must convince atheists and theists alike. This is just what happened. Appleby and her colleagues claim that when Darwin formulated his theory of evolution, he was an atheist and a materialist, and suggest that evolution was a product of a purported atheist agenda. They have hopelessly confused cause and effect. Darwin was about to become a minister of the Church of England when the opportunity to sail on HMS Beagle presented itself. His religious ideas, as he himself described them, were at the time highly conventional. He found every one of the Anglican articles of faith entirely believable. 
Through his interrogation of nature, through science, it slowly dawned on him that at least some of his religion was false. That's why he changed his religious views. Appleby and her colleagues are appalled at Darwin's description of the low morality of savages, their insufficient powers of reasoning, their weak power of self-command, and state that now many people are shocked by his racism. But there was no racism at all, as far as I can tell, in Darwin's comment. He was alluding to the inhabitants of Tierra del Fuego, suffering from grinding scarcity in the most barren and Antarctic province of Argentina. When he described a South American woman of African origin who threw herself to her death rather than submit to slavery, he noted that it was only prejudice that kept us from seeing her defiance in the same heroic light as we would a similar act by the proud matron of a noble Roman family. He was himself almost thrown off the beagle by Captain Fitzroy for his militant opposition to the captain's racism. Darwin was head and shoulders above most of his contemporaries in this regard. But again, even if he was not, how does it affect the truth or falsity of natural selection? Thomas Jefferson and George Washington owned slaves. Albert Einstein and Mohandas Gandhi were imperfect husbands and fathers. The list goes on indefinitely. We are all flawed and creatures of our times. Is it fair to judge us by the unknown standards of the future? Some of the habits of our age will doubtless be considered barbaric by later generations perhaps for insisting that small children and even infants sleep alone instead of with their parents, or exciting nationalist passions as a means of gaining popular approval and achieving high political office, or allowing bribery and corruption as a way of life, or keeping pets, or eating animals and jailing chimpanzees, or criminalizing the use of euphorians by adults, or allowing our children to grow up ignorant. Occasionally, in retrospect, someone stands out. In my book, the English-born American revolutionary Thomas Paine is one such. He was far ahead of his time. He courageously opposed monarchy, aristocracy, racism, slavery, superstition, and sexism, when all of these constituted the conventional wisdom. He was unswerving in his criticism of conventional religion. He wrote in The Age of Reason, Whenever we read the obscene stories, the voluptuous debaucheries, the cruel and torturous executions, the unrelenting vindictiveness with which more than half the Bible is filled, it would be more consistent that we called it the word of a demon than the word of God. It has served to corrupt and brutalize mankind. At the same time, the book exhibited the deepest reverence for a creator of the universe whose existence Paine argued was apparent at a glance at the natural world. But condemning much of the Bible while embracing God seemed an impossible position to most of his contemporaries. Christian theologians concluded he was drunk, mad, or corrupt. The Jewish scholar David Levy forbade his co-religionists from even touching, much less reading, the book. Paine was made to suffer so much for his views, including being thrown into prison after the French Revolution for being too consistent in his opposition to tyranny, that he became an embittered old man. Paine was the author of the revolutionary pamphlet Common Sense. Published on the 10th of January, 1776, it sold over half a million copies in the next few months and stirred many Americans to the cause of independence. He was the author of the three best-selling books of the 18th century. Later generations reviled him for his social and religious views. Theodore Roosevelt called him a filthy little atheist, despite his profound belief in God. He is probably the most illustrious American revolutionary uncommemorated by a monument in Washington, D.C. Yes, the Darwinian insight can be turned upside down and grotesquely misused. Voracious robber barons may explain their cutthroat practices by an appeal to social Darwinism. Nazis and other racists may call on survival of the fittest to justify genocide. But Darwin did not make John D. Rockefeller or Adolf Hitler. Greed the Industrial Revolution, the free enterprise system, and corruption of government by the moneyed are adequate to explain 19th century capitalism. Ethnocentrism, xenophobia, social hierarchies, the long history of anti-Semitism in Germany, the Versailles Treaty, German child-rearing practices, inflation, and the Depression seem adequate to explain Hitler's rise to power. Very like these or similar events would have transpired with or without Darwin. And modern Darwinism makes it abundantly clear that many less ruthless traits, some not always admired by robber barons and Führers, 
altruism, general intelligence, compassion, may be the key to survival. If we could censor Darwin, what other kinds of knowledge could also be censored? Who would do the censoring? Who among us is wise enough to know which information and insights we can safely dispense with, and which will be necessary ten or a hundred or a thousand years into the future? Surely we can exert some discretion on which kinds of machines and products it is safe to develop. We must in any case make such decisions, because we do not have the resources to pursue all possible technologies. But censoring knowledge, telling people what they must think, is the aperture to thought police, authoritarian government, foolish and incompetent decision-making, and long-term decline. Fervid ideologues and authoritarian regimes find it easy and natural to impose their views and suppress the alternatives. Nazi scientists, such as the Nobel laureate physicist Johannes Stark, distinguished fanciful imaginary Jewish science, including relativity and quantum mechanics, from realistic practical Aryan science. Another example. A new era of the magical explanation of the world is rising, said Adolf Hitler, an explanation based on will rather than knowledge. There is no truth in either the moral or the scientific sense. As he described it to me three decades later, in 1922, the American geneticist Hermann J. Müller flew from Berlin to Moscow in a light plane to witness the new Soviet society firsthand. He must have liked what he saw, because after his discovery that radiation makes mutations, a discovery that would later win him a Nobel Prize, he moved to Moscow to help establish modern genetics in the Soviet Union. But by the middle 1930s, a charlatan named Trofim Lysenko had caught the notice and then the enthusiastic support of Stalin. Lysenko argued that genetics, which he called Mendelism, Weissmanism, Morganism, after are some of the founders of the field, had an unacceptable philosophical base, and that philosophically correct genetics, genetics that paid proper obeisance to communist dialectical materialism, would yield very different results. In particular, Lysenko's genetics would permit an additional crop of winter wheat. Welcome news to a Soviet economy reeling from Stalin's forced collectivization of agriculture. Lysenko's purported evidence was suspect. There were no experimental controls, and his broad conclusions flew in the face of an immense body of contradictory data. As Lysenko's power grew, Muller passionately argued that classical Mendelian genetics was in full harmony with dialectical materialism, while Lysenko, who believed in the inheritance of acquired characteristics and denied a material basis of heredity, was an idealist, or worse. Muller was strongly supported by N.I. Vavilov, erstwhile president of the Ale Union Academy of Agricultural Sciences. In a 1936 address to the Academy of Agricultural Sciences, now presided over by Lysenko, Muller gave a stirring address that included these words. If the outstanding practitioners are going to support theories and opinions that are obviously absurd to everyone who knows even a little about genetics, such views as those recently put forward by President Lysenko, and those who think as he does, then the choice before us will resemble the choice between witchcraft and medicine, between astrology and astronomy, between alchemy and chemistry. In a country of arbitrary arrests and police terror, this speech displayed exemplary, many thought foolhardy, integrity and courage. In the Vavilov Affair, 1984, the Soviet émigré historian Mark Popovsky describes these words as being accompanied by thunderous applause from the whole hall and remembered by everyone still living who took part in the session. Three months later, Muller was visited in Moscow by a Western geneticist who expressed astonishment at a widely circulated letter signed by Muller that condemned the prevalence of Mendelism, Weissmanism, Morganism in the West, and that urged a boycott of the forthcoming International Congress of Genetics. Having never seen, much less signed, such a letter, an outraged Muller concluded that it was a forgery perpetrated by Lysenko. Muller promptly wrote an angry denunciation of Lysenko to Pravda and mailed a copy to Stalin. The next day, Vavilov came to Muller in a state of some agitation, informing him that he, Muller, had just volunteered to serve in the Spanish Civil War. The letter to Pravda had put Muller's life in danger. He left Moscow the next day, just evading, so he was later told, the NKVD, the secret police. Vavilov was not so lucky, and perished in 1943 in Siberia. With the continuing support of Stalin and later of Khrushchev, 
Lysenko ruthlessly suppressed classical genetics. Soviet school biology texts in the early 1960s had as little about chromosomes and classical genetics as many American school biology texts have about evolution today. But no new crop of winter wheat grew. Incantations of the phrase dialectical materialism went unheard by the DNA of domesticated plants. Soviet agriculture remained in the doldrums. And today, partly for this reason, Russia, world-class in many other sciences, is still almost hopelessly backward in molecular biology and genetic engineering. Two generations of modern biologists have been lost. Lysenkoism was not overthrown until 1964 in a series of debates and votes at the Soviet Academy of Sciences, one of the few institutions to maintain a degree of independence from the leaders of party and state, in which the nuclear physicist Andrei Sakharov played an outstanding role. Americans tend to shake their heads in astonishment at the Soviet experience. The idea that some state-endorsed ideology or popular prejudice would hogtie scientific progress seems unthinkable. For 200 years, Americans have prided themselves on being a practical, pragmatic, non-ideological people. And yet anthropological and psychological pseudoscience has flourished in the United States. On race, for example. Under the guise of creationism, a serious effort continues to be made to prevent evolutionary theory. The most powerful integrating idea in all of biology, and essential for other sciences ranging from astronomy to anthropology, from being taught in the schools. Science is different from many another human enterprise, not, of course, in its practitioners being influenced by the culture they grew up in, nor in sometimes being right and sometimes wrong, which are common to every human activity, but in its passion for framing testable hypotheses, in its search for definitive experiments that confirm or deny ideas, in the vigor of its substantive debate, and in its willingness to abandon ideas that have been found wanting. If we were not aware of our own limitations, though, if we were not seeking further data, if we were unwilling to perform controlled experiments, if we did not respect the evidence, we would have very little leverage in our quest for the truth. Through opportunism and timidity, we might then be buffeted by every ideological breeze, with nothing of lasting value to hang on to. Chapter 15. Newton's Sleep May God Keep Us from Single Vision and Newton's Sleep William Blake, from a poem included in a letter to Thomas Butts, 1802. Ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. It is those who know little and not those who know much, who so positively assert that this or that problem will never be solved by science. Charles Darwin. Introduction. The Descent of Man, 1871. By Newton's sleep, the poet, painter, and revolutionary William Blake seems to have meant a tunnel vision in the perspective of Newton's physics as well as Newton's own incomplete disengagement from mysticism. Blake thought the idea of atoms and particles of light amusing, and Newton's influence on our species, satanic. A common critique of science is that it is too narrow. Because of our well-demonstrated fallibilities, it rules out of court, beyond serious discourse, a wide range of uplifting images, playful notions, earnest mysticism, and stupefying wonders. Without physical evidence, Science does not admit spirits, souls, angels, devils, or dharma bodies of the Buddha, or alien visitors. The American psychologist Charles Tart, who believes the evidence for extrasensory perception is convincing, writes, An important factor in the current popularity of New Age ideas is a reaction against the dehumanizing, despiritualizing effects of scientism, the philosophical belief masquerading as objective science and held with the emotional tenacity of born-again fundamentalism, that we are nothing but material beings. To unthinkingly embrace anything and everything labeled spiritual or psychic or new age is, of course, foolish, for many of these ideas are factually wrong, however noble or inspiring they are. On the other hand, this new age interest is a legitimate recognition of some of the realities of human nature. People have always had and continue to have experiences that seem to be psychic or spiritual. But why should psychic experiences challenge the idea that we are made of matter and nothing but? There is very little doubt that in the everyday world, matter and energy exist. The evidence is all around us. In contrast, as I've mentioned earlier, the evidence for something non-material called spirit or soul is very much in doubt. Of course, each of us has a rich internal life. Considering the stupendous complexity of matter, though, 
How could we possibly prove that our internal life is not wholly due to matter? Granted, there is much about human consciousness that we do not fully understand and cannot yet explain in terms of neurobiology. Humans have limitations, and no one knows this better than scientists. But a multitude of aspects of the natural world that were considered miraculous only a few generations ago are now thoroughly understood in terms of physics and chemistry. At least some of the mysteries of today will be comprehensively solved by our descendants. The fact that we cannot now produce a detailed understanding of, say, altered states of consciousness in terms of brain chemistry no more implies the existence of a spirit world than a sunflower following the sun in its course across the sky was evidence of a literal miracle before we knew about phototropism and plant hormones. And if the world does not in all respects correspond to our wishes, is this the fault of science? or of those who would impose their wishes on the world. All the mammals, and many other animals as well, experience emotions. Fear, lust, hope, pain, love, hate, the need to be led. Humans may brood about the future more, but there is nothing in our emotions unique to us. On the other hand, no other species does science as much or as well as we. How then can science be dehumanizing? Still, it seems so unfair. Some of us starve to death before we're out of infancy, while others, by an accident of birth, live out their lives in opulence and splendor. We can be born into an abusive family or a reviled ethnic group, or start out with some deformity. We go through life with the deck stacked against us, and then we die, and that's it? Nothing but a dreamless and endless sleep. Where's the justice in this? This is stark and brutal and heartless. Shouldn't we have a second chance on a level playing field? How much better if we were born again in circumstances that took account of how well we played our part in the last life, no matter how stacked against us the deck was then, or if there were a time of judgment after we die then, so long as we did well with the persona we were given in this life, and were humble and faithful and all the rest, we should be rewarded by living joyfully until the end of time, in a permanent refuge from the agony and turmoil of the world. That's how it would be if the world were thought out, pre-planned, fair. That's how it would be if those suffering from pain and torment were to receive the consolation they deserve. So societies that teach contentment with our present station in life, in expectation of post-mortem reward, tend to inoculate themselves against revolution. Further, fear of death, which in some respects is adaptive in the evolutionary struggle for existence, is maladaptive in warfare. Those cultures that teach an afterlife of bliss for heroes, or even for those who just did what those in authority told them, might gain a competitive advantage. Thus, the idea of a spiritual part of our nature that survives death, the notion of an afterlife, ought to be easy for religions and nations to sell. This is not an issue on which we might anticipate widespread skepticism. People will want to believe it, even if the evidence is meager to nil. True, brain lesions can make us lose major segments of our memory, or convert us from manic to placid, or vice versa. And changes in brain chemistry can convince us there's a massive conspiracy against us, or make us think we hear the voice of God. But as compelling testimony as this provides that our personality, character, memory, if you will, soul, resides in the matter of the brain, it is easy not to focus on it, to find ways to evade the weight of the evidence. And if there are powerful social institutions insisting that there is an afterlife, it should be no surprise that dissenters tend to be sparse, quiet, and resented. Some Eastern Christian and New Age religions, as well as Platonism, hold that the world is unreal, that suffering, death, and matter itself are illusions, and that nothing really exists except mind. In contrast, the prevailing scientific view is that the mind is how we perceive what the brain does. That is, it's a property of the hundred trillion neural connections in the brain. There is a strangely waxing academic opinion, with roots in the 1960s, that holds all views to be equally arbitrary and true or false, to be a delusion. Perhaps it is an attempt to turn the tables on scientists who have long argued that literary criticism, religion, aesthetics, and much of philosophy and ethics are mere subjective opinion, because they cannot be demonstrated like a theorem in Euclidean geometry, nor put to experimental test. There are people who want everything to be possible, to have their reality unconstrained. 
Our imagination and our needs require more, they feel, than the comparatively little that science teaches we may be reasonably sure of. Many New Age gurus, the actress Shirley MacLaine among them, go so far as to embrace solipsism, to assert that the only reality is their own thoughts. I am God, they actually say. I really think we are creating our own reality, MacLean once told a skeptic. I think I'm creating you right here. If I dream of being reunited with a dead parent or child, who is to tell me that it didn't really happen? If I have a vision of myself floating in space looking down on the earth, maybe I was really there. Who are some scientists, who didn't even share the experience, to tell me that it's all in my head? If my religion teaches that it is the inalterable and inerrant word of God that the universe is a few thousand years old, then scientists are being offensive and impious, as well as mistaken, when they claim it's a few billion. Irritatingly, science claims to set limits on what we can do, even in principle. Who says we can't travel faster than light? They used to say that about sound, didn't they? Who's going to stop us if we have really powerful instruments from measuring the position and the momentum of an electron simultaneously. Why can't we, if we're very clever, build a perpetual motion machine of the first kind, one that generates more energy than is supplied to it, or a perpetual motion machine of the second kind, one that never runs down? Who dares to set limits on human ingenuity? In fact, nature does. In fact, a fairly comprehensive and very brief statement of the laws of nature, of how the universe works, is contained in just such a list of prohibited acts. Tellingly, pseudoscience and superstition tend to recognize no constraints in nature. Instead, all things are possible. They promise a limitless production budget, however often their adherents have been disappointed and betrayed. A related complaint is that science is too simple-minded, too reductionist. It naively imagines that in the final accounting there will be only a few laws of nature, perhaps even rather simple ones, that explain everything, that the exquisite subtlety of the world, all the snow crystals, spiderweb latticework, spiral galaxies, and flashes of human insight can ultimately be reduced to such laws. Reductionism seems to pay insufficient respect to the complexity of the universe. It appears to some as a curious hybrid of arrogance and intellectual laziness. To Isaac Newton, who in the minds of critics of science personifies single vision, it looked like a clockwork universe, literally. The regular, predictable orbital motions of the planets around the sun, or the moon around the earth, were described to high precision by essentially the same differential equation that predicts the swing of a pendulum or the oscillation of a spring. We have a tendency today to think we occupy some exalted vantage point, and to pity the poor Newtonians for having so limited a worldview. But within certain reasonable limitations, the same harmonic equations that describe clockwork really do describe the motions of astronomical objects throughout the universe. This is a profound, not a trivial, parallelism. Of course, there are no gears in the solar system, and the component parts of the gravitational clockwork do not touch. Planets generally have more complicated motions than pendulums and springs. Also, the clockwork model breaks down in certain circumstances. Over very long periods of time, the gravitational tugs of distant worlds, tugs that might seem wholly insignificant over a few orbits, can build up, and some little world can go unexpectedly careening out of its accustomed course. However, something like chaotic motion is also known in pendulum clocks. If we displace the bob too far from the perpendicular, a wild and ugly motion ensues. But the solar system keeps better time than any mechanical clock and the whole idea of keeping time comes from the observed motion of the sun and stars. The astonishing fact is that similar mathematics applies so well to planets and to clocks. It needn't have been this way. We didn't impose it on the universe. That's the way the universe is. If this is reductionism, so be it. Until the middle 20th century, there had been a strong belief, among theologians, philosophers, and many biologists, that life was not reducible to the laws of physics and chemistry, that there was a vital force, an entelechy, a tau, a mana that made living things go. It animated life. It was impossible to see how mere atoms and molecules could account for the intricacy and elegance, the fitting of form to function, of a living thing. The world's religions were invoked. God or the gods breathed life, soul stuff, into inanimate matter. 
The 18th century chemist Joseph Priestley tried to find the vital force. He weighed a mouse just before and just after it died. It weighed the same. All such attempts have failed. If there is soul stuff, evidently it weighs nothing, that is, it is not made of matter. Nevertheless, even biological materialists entertained reservations. Perhaps, if not plant, animal, fungal, and microbial souls, some still undiscovered principle of science was needed to understand life. For example, the British physiologist J.S. Haldane, father of J.B.S. Haldane, asked in 1932, What intelligible account can the mechanistic theory of life give of the recovery from disease and injuries? Simply none at all, except that these phenomena are so complex and strange that as yet we cannot understand them. It is exactly the same with the closely related phenomena of reproduction. We cannot by any stretch of the imagination conceive a delicate and complex mechanism which is capable, like a living organism, of reproducing itself indefinitely often. But only a few decades later, and our knowledge of immunology and molecular biology have enormously clarified these once impenetrable mysteries. I remember very well when the molecular structure of DNA and the nature of the genetic code were first elucidated in the 1950s and 1960s. How biologists who studied whole organisms accused the new proponents of molecular biology of reductionism. They'll never understand even a worm with their DNA. Of course, reducing everything to a vital force is no less reductionism. But it is now clear that all life on Earth, every single living thing, has its genetic information encoded in its nucleic acids and employs fundamentally the same code book to implement the hereditary instructions. We have learned how to read the code. The same few dozen organic molecules are used over and over again in biology for the widest variety of functions. Genes bearing significant responsibility for cystic fibrosis and breast cancer have been identified. The 1.8 million rungs of the DNA ladder of the bacterium Haemophilus influenzae, comprising its 1,743 genes, have been sequenced. The specific function of most of these genes is beautifully detailed, from the manufacture and folding of hundreds of complex molecules to protection against heat and antibiotics, to increasing the mutation rate, to making identical copies of the bacterium. Much of the genomes of many other organisms, including the roundworm Chenorhabditis elegans, have now been mapped. Molecular biologists are busily recording the sequence of the three billion nucleotides that specify how to make a human being. In another decade or two, they'll be done. Whether the benefits will ultimately exceed the risks seems by no means certain. The continuity between atomic physics, molecular chemistry, and that holy of holies, the nature of reproduction and heredity, has now been established. No new principle of science need be invoked. It looks as if there are a small number of simple facts that can be used to understand the enormous intricacy and variety of living things. Molecular genetics also teaches that each organism has its own particularity. Reductionism is even better established in physics and chemistry. I will later describe the unexpected coalescence of our understanding of electricity, magnetism, light, and relativity into a single framework. We've known for centuries that a handful of comparatively simple laws not only explains, but quantitatively and accurately predicts a breathtaking variety of phenomena, not just on Earth but through the entire universe. We hear, for example from the theologian Langdon Gilkey in his Nature, Reality, and the Sacred, that the notion of the laws of nature being everywhere the same is simply a preconception imposed on the universe by fallible scientists and their social milieu. He longs for other kinds of knowledge, as valid in their context as science is in its. But the order of the universe is not an assumption. It's an observed fact. We detect the light from distant quasars only because the laws of electromagnetism are the same 10 billion light-years away as here. The spectra of those quasars are recognizable only because the same chemical elements are present there as here, and because the same laws of quantum mechanics apply. The motion of galaxies around one another follows familiar Newtonian gravity. Gravitational lenses and binary pulsar spin-downs reveal general relativity in the depths of space. We could have lived in a universe with different laws in every province, but we do not. This fact cannot but elicit feelings of reverence and awe. We might have lived in a universe in which nothing could be understood by a few simple laws, in which nature was complex beyond our abilities to understand. 
in which laws that apply on Earth are invalid on Mars, or in a distant quasar. But the evidence, not the preconceptions, the evidence proves otherwise. Luckily for us, we live in a universe in which much can be reduced to a small number of comparatively simple laws of nature. Otherwise, we might have lacked the intellectual capacity and grasp to comprehend the world. Of course, we may make mistakes in applying a reductionist program to science. There may be aspects which, for all we know, are not reducible to a few comparatively simple laws. But in the light of the findings in the last few centuries, it seems foolish to complain about reductionism. It is not a deficiency, but one of the chief triumphs of science. And it seems to me its findings are perfectly consonant with many religions, although it does not prove their validity. Why should a few simple laws of nature explain so much and hold sway throughout this vast universe? Isn't this just what you might expect from a creator of the universe? Why should some religious people oppose the reductionist program in science, except out of some misplaced love of mysticism? Attempts to reconcile religion and science have been on the religious agenda for centuries, at least for those who did not insist on biblical and Quranic literalism, with no room for allegory or metaphor. The crowning achievements of Roman Catholic theology are the Summa Theologica and the Summa Contra Gentiles, against the Gentiles, of St. Thomas Aquinas. Out of the maelstrom of sophisticated Islamic philosophy that tumbled into Christendom in the 12th and 13th centuries were the books of the ancient Greeks, especially Aristotle, works even on casual inspection of high accomplishment. Was this ancient learning compatible with God's holy word? In the Summa Theologica, Aquinas set himself the task of reconciling 631 questions between Christian and classical sources. But how to do this where a clear dispute arises? It cannot be accomplished without some supervening organizing principle, some superior way to know the world. Often, Aquinas appealed to common sense and the natural world, that is, science used as an error-correcting device. With some contortion of both common sense and nature, he managed to reconcile all 631 problems. Although when push came to shove, the desired answer was simply assumed. Faith always got the nod over reason. Similar attempts at reconciliation permeate Talmudic and post-Talmudic Jewish literature and medieval Islamic philosophy. But tenets at the heart of religion can be tested scientifically. This in itself makes some religious bureaucrats and believers wary of science. Is the Eucharist, as the Church teaches, in fact, and not just as productive metaphor, the flesh of Jesus Christ? Or is it chemically, microscopically, and in other ways, just a wafer handed to you by a priest? Will the world be destroyed at the end of the 52-year Venus cycle unless humans are sacrificed to the gods? Does the occasional uncircumcised Jewish man fare worse than his co-religionists who abide by the ancient covenant in which God demands a piece of foreskin from every male worshiper? Are there humans populating innumerable other planets as the Latter-day Saints teach? Were whites created from blacks by a mad scientist as the Nation of Islam asserts? Would the sun indeed not rise if the Hindu sacrificial rite is omitted, as we are assured would be the case in the Satapatha Brahmana? We can gain some insight into the human roots of prayer by examining those of unfamiliar religions and cultures. Here, for example, is what is written in a cuneiform inscription on a Babylonian cylinder seal from the second millennium B.C. O Ninlil, Lady of the Lands, in your marriage bed, in the abode of your delight, intercede for me with Enlil, your beloved. Signed, Mili Shipak, Shatamu of Ninma, asterisk. There was a time when the answer to this question was a matter of life or death. Miles Phillips was an English sailor, stranded in Spanish Mexico. He and his fellows were brought up before the Inquisition in the year 1574. They were asked whether we did not believe that the host of bread which the priest did hold up over his head, and the wine that was in the chalice, was the very true and perfect body and blood of our Saviour Christ, yea or no? To which, Phillips adds, if we answered not yea, then there was no way but death. Since this Mesoamerican ritual has not really been practiced for five centuries, we have the perspective to reflect on the tens of thousands of willing and unwilling sacrifices to the Aztec and Mayan gods who reconciled themselves to their fates with the confident faith that they were dying to save the universe. It's been a long time since there's been a Shatamu in Ninma, or even a Ninma. Despite the fact that Enlil and Ninlil were major gods, 
people all over the civilized Western world had prayed to them for 2,000 years. Was poor Millie Shipak in fact praying to a phantom, to a societally condoned product of his imagination? And if so, what about us? Or is this blasphemy, a forbidden question, as doubtless it was among the worshippers of Enlil? Does prayer work at all? Which ones? There's a category of prayer in which God is begged to intervene in human history, or just to right some real or imagined injustice or natural calamity. For example, when a bishop from the American West prays for God to intervene and end a devastating dry spell. Why is the prayer needed? Didn't God know of the drought? Was he unaware that it threatened the bishop's parishioners? What is implied here about the limitations of a supposedly omnipotent and omniscient deity? The bishop asked his followers to pray as well. Is God more likely to intervene when many pray for mercy or justice than when only a few do? Or consider the following request, printed in 1994 in the Prayer and Action Weekly News, Iowa's weekly Christian information source. Can you join me in praying that God will burn down the Planned Parenthood in Des Moines in a manner no one can mistake for any human torching, which impartial investigators will have to attribute to miraculous, unexplainable causes, and which Christians will have to attribute to the hand of God. We've discussed faith healing. What about longevity through prayer? The Victorian statistician Francis Galton argued that, other things being equal, British monarchs ought to be very long-lived, because millions of people all over the world daily intoned the heartfelt mantra, God save the Queen or king. Yet he showed, if anything, they don't live as long as other members of the wealthy and pampered aristocratic class. Tens of millions of people in concert publicly wished, although they did not exactly pray, that Mao Zedong would live for 10,000 years. Nearly everyone in ancient Egypt exhorted the gods to let the pharaoh live forever. These collective prayers failed. Their failure constitutes data. By making pronouncements that are, even if only in principle, testable religions, however unwillingly, enter the arena of science. Religions can no longer make unchallenged assertions about reality, so long as they do not seize secular power, provided they cannot coerce belief. This, in turn, has infuriated some followers of some religions. Occasionally, they threaten skeptics with the direst imaginable penalties. Consider the following high-stakes alternative by William Blake in his innocuously titled Auguries of Innocence. He who shall teach the child to doubt the rotting grave shall ne'er get out. He who respects the infant's faith triumphs over hell and death. Of course, many religions devoted to reverence, awe, ethics, ritual, community, family, charity, and political and economic justice are in no way challenged but rather uplifted by the findings of science. There is no necessary conflict between science and religion. On one level, they share similar and consonant roles, and each needs the other. Open and vigorous debate, even the consecration of doubt, is a Christian tradition going back to John Milton's Areopagitica, 1644. Some of mainstream Christianity and Judaism embraces and even anticipated at least a portion of the humility, self-criticism, reasoned debate, and questioning of received wisdom that the best of science offers. But other sects, sometimes called conservative or fundamentalist, and today they seem to be in the ascendant, with the mainstream religions almost inaudible and invisible, have chosen to make a stand on matters subject to disproof, and thus have something to fear from science. The religious traditions are often so rich and multivariate that they offer ample opportunity for renewal and revision, again especially when their sacred books can be interpreted metaphorically and allegorically. There is thus a middle ground of confessing Newton's sleep past errors, as the Roman Catholic Church did in its 1992 acknowledgement that Galileo was right after all, that the earth does revolve around the sun. Three centuries late, but courageous and most welcome nonetheless. Modern Roman Catholicism has no quarrel with the Big Bang. With a universe 15 billion or so years old, with the first living things arising from prebiological molecules, or with humans evolving from ape-like ancestors, although it has special opinions on ensoulment. Most mainstream Protestant and Jewish faiths take the same sturdy position. In theological discussion with religious leaders, I often ask what their response would be if a central tenet of their faith were disproved by science. When I put this question to the current 14th Dalai Lama, he unhesitatingly replied, as no conservative or fundamentalist religious leaders do, 
In such a case, he said, Tibetan Buddhism would have to change. Even, I asked, if it's a really central tenet, like I searched for an example, reincarnation. Even then, he answered. However, he added with a twinkle, it's going to be hard to disprove reincarnation. Plainly, the Dalai Lama is right. Religious doctrine that is insulated from disproof has little reason to worry about the advance of science. The grand idea, common to many faiths, of a creator of the universe is one such doctrine, difficult alike to demonstrate or to dismiss. Moses Maimonides, in his Guide for the Perplexed, held that God could be truly known only if there were free and open study of both physics and theology. I. 55. What would happen if science demonstrated an infinitely old universe? Then theology would have to be seriously revamped. 2. 25. Indeed, this is the one conceivable finding of science that could disprove a creator, because an infinitely old universe would never have been created. It would have always been here. There are other doctrines, interests, and concerns that also worry about what science will find out. Perhaps, they suggest, it's better not to know. If men and women turn out to have different hereditary propensities, won't this be used as an excuse for the former to suppress the latter? If there's a genetic component of violence, might this justify repression of one ethnic group by another, or even precautionary incarceration? If mental illness is just brain chemistry, doesn't this unravel our efforts to keep a grasp on reality, or to be responsible for our actions? If we are not the special handiwork of the creator of the universe, if our basic moral laws are merely invented by fallible lawgivers, isn't our struggle to maintain an orderly society undermined? I suggest that in every one of these cases, religious or secular, we are much better off if we know the best available approximation to the truth and if we keep before us a keen apprehension of the errors our interest group or belief system has committed in the past. In every case, the imagined dire consequences of the truth being generally known are exaggerated. And again, we are not wise enough to know which lies or even which shadings of the facts can competently serve some higher social purpose, especially in the long run. Chapter 16. When Scientists Know Sin, The Mind of Man, How Far Will It Advance? Where will its daring impudence find limits? If human villainy and human life shall wax in due proportion, if the son shall always grow in wickedness past his father, the gods must add another world to this that all the sinners may have space enough. Euripides Hippolytus, 428 B.C. In a post-war meeting with President Harry S. Truman, J. Robert Oppenheimer, the scientific director of the Manhattan Nuclear Weapons Project, mournfully commented that scientists had bloody hands, they had now known sin. Afterwards, Truman instructed his aides that he never wished to see Oppenheimer again. Sometimes scientists are castigated for doing evil, and sometimes for warning about the evil uses to which science may be put. More often, science is taken to task because it and its products are said to be morally neutral, ethically ambiguous, as readily employed in the service of evil as of good. This is an old indictment. It goes back probably to the flaking of stone tools and the domestication of fire. Since technology has been with our ancestral line from before the first human, since we are a technological species, this problem is not so much one of science as of human nature. By this I don't mean that science has no responsibility for the misuse of its findings. It has profound responsibility, and the more powerful its products, the greater its responsibility. Like assault weapons and market derivatives, the technologies that allow us to alter the global environment that sustains us should mandate caution and prudence. Yes, it's the same old humans who have made it so far. Yes, we're developing new technologies as we always have. But when the weaknesses we've always had join forces with a capacity to do harm on an unprecedented planetary scale, something more is required of us, an emerging ethic that also must be established on an unprecedented planetary scale. Sometimes scientists try to have it both ways, to take credit for those applications of science that enrich our lives, but to distance themselves from the instruments of death, intentional and inadvertent, that also trace back to scientific research. The Australian philosopher John Passmore writes in his book, Science and Its Critics. The Spanish Inquisition sought to avoid direct responsibility for the burning of heretics by handing them over to the secular arm. To burn them itself, it piously explained, would be wholly inconsistent with its Christian principles. Few of us would allow the Inquisition thus easily to wipe its hands clean of bloodshed. 
it knew quite well what would happen. Equally, where the technological application of scientific discoveries is clear and obvious, as when a scientist works on nerve gases, he cannot properly claim that such applications are none of his business, merely on the grounds that it is the military forces, not scientists, who use the gases to disable or kill. This is even more obvious when the scientist deliberately offers help to governments in exchange for funds. If a scientist or a philosopher accepts funds from some such body as an office of naval research, then he is cheating if he knows his work will be useless to them and must take some responsibility for the outcome if he knows that it will be useful. He is subject, properly subject, to praise or blame in relation to any innovations which flow from his work. An important case history is provided by the career of the Hungarian-born physicist Edward Teller. Teller was marked at a young age by the Belakun communist revolution in Hungary, in which the property of middle-class families like his was expropriated, and by losing part of his leg in a streetcar accident, leaving him in permanent pain. His early contributions ranged from quantum mechanical selection rules and solid-state physics to cosmology. It was he who chauffeured the physicist Leo Szilard to the vacationing Albert Einstein on Long Island in July 1939, a meeting that led to the historic letter from Einstein to President Franklin Roosevelt urging, in view of both scientific and political events in Nazi Germany, that the United States develop a fission or atomic bomb. Recruited to work on the Manhattan Project, Teller arrived at Los Alamos and promptly refused to cooperate not because he was dismayed at what an atomic bomb might do, but just the opposite, because he wanted to work on a much more destructive weapon, the fusion, or thermonuclear, or hydrogen bomb. While there is a practical upper limit on the yield or destructive energy of an atomic bomb, there is no such limit for a hydrogen bomb. But a hydrogen bomb needs an atomic bomb as trigger. After the fission bomb was invented, after Germany and Japan surrendered, after the war was over, Teller remained a persistent advocate of what was called the super, specifically intended to intimidate the Soviet Union. Concern about the rebuilding, toughened and militarized Soviet Union under Stalin, and the national paranoia in America called McCarthyism, eased Teller's path. A substantial obstacle was offered, though, in the person of Oppenheimer, who had become the chairman of the General Advisory Committee to the Post-War Atomic Energy Commission. Teller provided critical testimony at a government hearing, questioning Oppenheimer's loyalty to the United States. Teller's involvement is generally thought to have played a major role in the aftermath. Although Oppenheimer's loyalty was not exactly impugned by the review board, somehow his security clearance was denied. He was retired from the AEC, and Teller's way to the super was greased. The technique for making a thermonuclear weapon is generally attributed to Teller and the mathematician Stanislas Ulam. Hans Bethe, the Nobel laureate physicist who headed the theoretical division at the Manhattan Project and who played a major role in the development of both the atomic and the hydrogen bombs, attests that Teller's original suggestion was flawed and that the work of many people was necessary to bring the thermonuclear weapon to reality. With fundamental technical contributions from a young physicist named Richard Garwin, the first U.S. thermonuclear device was exploded in 1952. It was too unwieldy to be carried by a missile or bomber. It just sat there where it was assembled and blew up. The first true hydrogen bomb was a Soviet invention exploded one year later. There has been debate on whether the Soviet Union would have developed a thermonuclear weapon if the United States had not, and whether a U.S. thermonuclear weapon was even needed to deter Soviet use of their hydrogen bomb, since the U.S. by then possessed a substantial arsenal of fission weapons. The preponderance of current evidence is that the USSR, even before it exploded its first fission bomb, had a workable design for a thermonuclear weapon. It was the next logical step, but Soviet pursuit of fusion weapons was much aided by the knowledge, from espionage, that the Americans were working on them. From my point of view, the consequences of global nuclear war became much more dangerous with the invention of the hydrogen bomb, because airbursts of thermonuclear weapons are much more capable of burning cities generating vast amounts of smoke, cooling and darkening the earth, and inducing global-scale nuclear winter. This was perhaps the most controversial scientific debate I've been involved in, from about 1983 to 1990. Much of the debate was politically driven. 
The strategic implications of nuclear winter were disquieting to those wedded to a policy of massive retaliation to deter a nuclear attack, or to those wishing to preserve the option of a massive first strike. In either case, the environmental consequences work the self-destruction of any nation, launching large numbers of thermonuclear weapons, even with no retaliation from the adversary. A major segment of the strategic policy of decades, and the reason for accumulating tens of thousands of nuclear weapons, suddenly became much less credible. The global temperature declines predicted in the original 1983 nuclear winter scientific paper were 1520 degrees C. Current estimates are 1015 degrees C. The two values are in good agreement considering the irreducible uncertainties in the calculations. Both temperature declines are much greater than the difference between current global temperatures and those of the last ice age. The long-term consequences of global thermonuclear war have been estimated by an international team of 200 scientists who concluded that through nuclear winter, the global civilization and most of the people on Earth, including those far from the northern mid-latitude target zone, would be at risk, mainly from starvation. If large-scale nuclear war ever occurs, with cities targeted, the effort of Edward Teller and his colleagues in the United States and the counterpart team headed by Andrei Sakharov in the Soviet Union might be responsible for lowering the curtain on the human future. The hydrogen bomb is by far the most horrific weapon ever invented. When nuclear winter was discovered in 1983, Teller was quick to argue both, one, that the physics was mistaken, and two, that the discovery had been made years earlier under his tutelage at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. There is, in fact, no evidence for such a prior discovery, and considerable evidence that those in every nation charged to inform their national leaders of the effects of nuclear weapons had consistently overlooked nuclear winter. But if Teller is right, then it was unconscionable of him not to have disclosed the purported discovery to the affected parties, the citizens and leaders of his nation and the world as in the Stanley Kubrick movie Dr. Strangelove classifying the ultimate weapon, so no one knows that it exists or what it can do, is the ultimate absurdity. It seems to me impossible for any normal human being to be untroubled by helping to make such an invention, even putting nuclear winter aside. The stresses, conscious or unconscious, on those who take credit for the contrivance must be considerable. Whatever his actual contributions, Edward Teller has been widely described as the father of the hydrogen bomb. In an admiring 1954 article, Life magazine described his almost fanatic determination to build the hydrogen bomb. Much of his subsequent career can, I think, be understood as an attempt to justify what he begat. Teller has contended, not implausibly, that hydrogen bombs keep the peace, or at least prevent thermonuclear war because the consequences of warfare between nuclear powers are now too dangerous. We haven't had a nuclear war yet, have we? But all such arguments assume that the nuclear-armed nations are, and always will be, without exception, rational actors, and that bouts of anger and revenge and madness will never overtake their leaders or military and secret police officers in charge of nuclear weapons. In the century of Hitler and Stalin, this seems ingenuous. Teller has been a major force in preventing a comprehensive treaty banning nuclear weapons tests. He made it much more difficult to accomplish the 1963 limited above-ground test ban treaty. His argument that above-ground testing was essential to maintain and improve the nuclear arsenals, that ratifying the treaty would give away the future safety of our country, has proven specious. He has also been a vigorous proponent of the safety and cost-effectiveness of fission power plants claiming himself to be the only casualty of the Three Mile Island nuclear accident in Pennsylvania in 1979. He had a heart attack, he says, debating the issue. Teller advocated exploding nuclear weapons from Alaska to South Africa, to dredge harbors and canals, to obliterate troublesome mountains, to do heavy earth moving. When he proposed such a scheme to Queen Frederica of Greece, she is said to have responded, Thank you, Dr. Teller, but Greece has enough quaint ruins already want to test Einstein's general relativity, then explode a nuclear weapon on the far side of the sun, Teller proposed, want to understand the chemical composition of the moon, then fly a hydrogen bomb to the moon, explode it, and examine the spectrum of the flash and fireball. Also in the 1980s, Teller sold President Ronald Reagan the notion of Star Wars, called by them the Strategic Defense Initiative, 
SDI Reagan seems to have believed a highly imaginative story of tellers that it was possible to build a desk-sized orbiting hydrogen bomb-driven X-ray laser that would destroy 10,000 Soviet warheads in flight and provide genuine protection for the citizens of the United States in case of global thermonuclear war. It is claimed by apologists for the Reagan administration that, whatever the exaggerations in capability, some of it intentional, SDI was responsible for the collapse of the Soviet Union. There is no serious evidence in support of this contention. Andrei Sakharov, Yevgeny Velikov, Roald Sagdiv, and other scientists who advised President Mikhail Gorbachev made it clear that if the United States really went ahead with a Star Wars program, the safest and cheapest Soviet response would be merely to augment its existing arsenal of nuclear weapons and delivery systems. In this way, Star Wars could have increased, not decreased, the peril of thermonuclear war. At any rate, Soviet expenditures on space-based defenses against American nuclear missiles were comparatively paltry, hardly of a magnitude to trigger a collapse of the Soviet economy. The fall of the USSR has much more to do with the failure of the command economy, growing awareness of the standard of living in the West, widespread disaffection from a moribund communist ideology, and, although he did not intend such an outcome, Gorbachev's promotion of glasnost, or openness. Ten thousand American scientists and engineers publicly pledged they would not work on Star Wars or accept money from the SDI organization. This provides an example of widespread and courageous non-cooperation by scientists, at some conceivable personal cost, with a democratic government that had, temporarily at least, lost its way. Teller has also advocated the development of burrowing nuclear warheads, so that underground command centers and deeply buried shelters for the leadership and their families of an adversary nation might be dug down to and wiped out and 0.1 kiloton nuclear warheads that would saturate an enemy country, obliterating its infrastructure without a single casualty. Civilians would be alerted in advance. Nuclear war would be humane. As I write, Edward Teller, still vigorous and retaining considerable intellectual powers into his late 80s, has mounted a campaign, with his counterpart in the former Soviet nuclear weapons establishment, to develop and explode new generations of high-yield thermonuclear weapons in space in order to destroy or deflect asteroids that might be on collision trajectories with the Earth. I worry that premature experimentation with the orbits of nearby asteroids may involve extreme dangers for our species. Dr. Teller and I have met privately. We've debated at scientific meetings, in the national media, and in a closed rump session of Congress. We've had strong disagreements especially on Star Wars, nuclear winter, and asteroid defense. Perhaps all this has hopelessly colored my view of him. Although he has always been a fervent anti-communist and technophile, as I look back over his life, it seems to me I see something more in his desperate attempt to justify the hydrogen bomb. Its effects aren't as bad as you might think. It can be used to defend the world from other hydrogen bombs, for science, for civil engineering, to protect the population of the United States against an enemy's thermonuclear weapons, to wage war humanely, to save the planet from random hazards from space. Somehow, somewhere, he wants to believe that thermonuclear weapons, and he will be acknowledged by the human species as its savior and not its destroyer. When scientific research provides fallible nations and political leaders with formidable, indeed awesome powers, many dangers present themselves, one is that some of the scientists involved may lose all but a superficial semblance of objectivity. As always, power tends to corrupt. In this circumstance, the institution of secrecy is especially pernicious, and the checks and balances of a democracy become especially valuable. Teller, who has flourished in the secrecy culture, has also repeatedly attacked it. The CIA Inspector General commented in 1995 that absolute secrecy corrupts absolutely. The most open and vigorous debate is often the only protection against the most perilous misuse of technology. The critical piece of the counter-argument may be something obvious that many scientists or even lay people could come up with provided there were no penalties for speaking out. Or it might be something more subtle, something that would be noted by an obscure graduate student in some locale remote from Washington, D.C., who, if the arguments were closely held and highly secret, would never have the opportunity to address the issue. 
What realm of human endeavor is not morally ambiguous? Even folk institutions that purport to give us advice on behavior and ethics seem fraught with contradictions. Consider aphorisms. Haste makes waste, yes, but a stitch in time saves nine. Better safe than sorry, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. Where there's smoke, there's fire, but you can't tell a book by its cover. A penny saved is a penny earned, but you can't take it with you. He who hesitates is lost, but fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Two heads are better than one, but too many cooks spoil the broth. There was a time when people planned or justified their actions on the basis of such contradictory platitudes. What is the moral responsibility of the aphorist? Or the sun sign astrologer, the tarot card reader, the tabloid prophet? Or consider the mainstream religions? We are enjoined in Micah to do justly and love mercy. In Exodus we are forbidden to commit murder. In Leviticus we are commanded to love our neighbor as ourselves, and in the Gospels we are urged to love our enemies. Yet think of the rivers of blood spilled by fervent followers of the books in which these well-meaning exhortations are embedded. In Joshua and in the second half of Numbers is celebrated the mass murder of men, women, children, down to the domestic animals in city after city across the whole land of Canaan. Jericho is obliterated in a carom, a holy war. The only justification offered for this slaughter is the mass murderer's claim that, in exchange for circumcising their sons and adopting a particular set of rituals, their ancestors were long before promised that this land was their land. Not a hint of self-reproach, not a muttering of patriarchal or divine disquiet at these campaigns of extermination can be dug out of Holy Scripture. Instead, Joshua destroyed all that breathed, as the Lord God of Israel commanded. Joshua X, 40. And these events are not incidental, but central to the main narrative thrust of the Old Testament. Similar stories of mass murder, and in the case of the Amalekites' genocide, can be found in the books of Saul, Esther, and elsewhere in the Bible, with hardly a pang of moral doubt. It was all, of course, troubling to liberal theologians of a later age. It is properly said that the devil can quote Scripture to his purpose. The Bible is full of so many stories of contradictory moral purpose that every generation can find scriptural justification for nearly any action it proposes, from incest, slavery, and mass murder to the most refined love, courage, and self-sacrifice. And this moral multiple personality disorder is hardly restricted to Judaism and Christianity. You can find it deep within Islam, the Hindu tradition, indeed nearly all the world's religions. Perhaps then it is not so much scientists as people who are morally ambiguous. It is the particular task of scientists, I believe, to alert the public to possible dangers, especially those emanating from science or foreseeable through the use of science. Such a mission is, you might say, prophetic. Clearly the warnings need to be judicious and not more flamboyant than the dangers require. But if we must make errors, given the stakes, they should be on the side of safety. Among the Kung San hunter-gatherers of the Kalahari Desert, when two men, perhaps testosterone-inflamed, would begin to argue, the women would reach for their poison arrows and put the weapons out of harm's way. Today, our poison arrows can destroy the global civilization and just possibly annihilate our species. The price of moral ambiguity is now too high. For this reason, and not because of its approach to knowledge, the ethical responsibility of scientists must also be high extraordinarily high, unprecedentedly high. I wish graduate science programs explicitly and systematically raised these questions with fledgling scientists and engineers, and sometimes I wonder whether in our society too, the women and the children will eventually put the poison arrows out of harm's way. Chapter 17. The Marriage of Skepticism and Wonder Nothing is too wonderful to be true. Remark attributed to Michael Faraday 1791 to 1867. Insight, untested and unsupported, is an insufficient guarantee of truth. Bertrand Russell, Mysticism and Logic, 1929. When we are asked to swear in courts of law that we will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, we are being asked the impossible. It is simply beyond our powers. Our memories are fallible. Even scientific truth is merely an approximation and we are ignorant about nearly all of the universe. Nevertheless, a life may depend on our testimony. To swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to the limit of our abilities, is a fair request. Without the qualifying phrase, though, 
It's simply out of touch. But such a qualification, however consonant with human reality, is unacceptable to any legal system. If everyone tells the truth only to a degree determined by individual judgment, then incriminating or awkward facts might be withheld, events shaded, culpability hidden, responsibility evaded, and justice denied. So the law strives for an impossible standard of accuracy, and we do the best we can. In the jury selection process, the court needs to be reassured that the verdict will be based on evidence. It makes heroic efforts to weed out bias. It is aware of human imperfection. Does the potential juror personally know the district attorney, or the prosecutor, or the defense attorney? What about the judge or the other jurors? Has she formed an opinion about this case not from the facts laid out in court, but from pretrial publicity? Will she assign evidence from police officers greater or lesser weight than evidence from witnesses for the defense? Is she biased against the defendant's ethnic group? Does the potential juror live in the neighborhood where the crimes were committed? And might that influence her judgment? Does she have a scientific background about matters on which expert witnesses will testify? This is often a count against her. Are any of her relatives or close family members employed in law enforcement or criminal law? Has she herself ever had any run-ins with police that might influence her judgment in the trial? Was any close friend or relative ever arrested on a similar charge? The American system of jurisprudence recognizes a wide range of factors, predispositions, prejudices, and experiences that might cloud our judgment or affect our objectivity, sometimes even without our knowing it. It goes to great, perhaps even extravagant lengths to safeguard the process of judgment in a criminal trial from the human weaknesses of those who must decide on innocence or guilt. Even then, of course, the process sometimes fails. Why would we settle for anything less when interrogating the natural world, or when attempting to decide on vital matters of politics, economics, religion, and ethics? If it is to be applied consistently, science imposes, in exchange for its manifold gifts, a certain onerous burden. We are enjoined, no matter how uncomfortable it might be, to consider ourselves and our cultural institutions scientifically, and not to accept uncritically whatever we're told, to surmount as best we can our hopes, conceits, and unexamined beliefs, to view ourselves as we really are. Can we conscientiously and courageously follow planetary motion or bacterial genetics wherever the search may lead, but declare the origin of matter or human behavior off-limits? Because its explanatory power is so great, once you get the hang of scientific reasoning, you're eager to apply it everywhere. However, in the course of looking deeply within ourselves, we may challenge notions that give comfort before the terrors of the world. I'm aware that some of the discussion in, say, the preceding chapter may have such a character. When anthropologists survey the thousands of distinct cultures and ethnicities that comprise the human family, they are struck by how few features there are that are givens, always present no matter how exotic the society. There are, for example, cultures, the Ik of Uganda is one, where all Ten Commandments seem to be systematically, institutionally ignored. There are societies that abandon their old and their newborn, that eat their enemies, that use seashells or pigs or young women for money. But they all have a strong incest taboo. They all use technology, and almost all believe in a supernatural world of gods and spirits, often connected with the natural environment they inhabit and the well-being of the plants and animals they eat. The ones with a supreme god who lives in the sky tend to be the most ferocious, torturing their enemies, for example. But this is a statistical correlation only. The causal link has not been established, although speculations naturally present themselves. In every such society, there is a cherished world of myth and metaphor which coexists with the workaday world. Efforts to reconcile the two are made, and any rough edges at the joints tend to be off-limits and ignored. We compartmentalize. Some scientists do this too, effortlessly stepping between the skeptical world of science and the credulous world of religious belief without skipping a beat. Of course, the greater the mismatch between these two worlds, the more difficult it is to be comfortable, with untroubled conscience, with both. In a life short and uncertain, it seems heartless to do anything that might deprive people of the consolation of faith when science cannot remedy their anguish. Those who cannot bear the burden of science are free to ignore its precepts. But we cannot have science in bits and pieces, applying it where we feel safe and ignoring it where we feel threatened. Again, 
because we are not wise enough to do so, except by sealing the brain off into separate airtight compartments. How is it possible to fly in airplanes, listen to the radio, or take antibiotics while holding that the Earth is around 10,000 years old, or that all Sagittarians are gregarious and affable? Have I ever heard a skeptic wax superior and contemptuous? Certainly. I've even sometimes heard, to my retrospective dismay, that unpleasant tone in my own voice. There are human imperfections on both sides of this issue. Even when it's applied sensitively, scientific skepticism may come across as arrogant, dogmatic, heartless, and dismissive of the feelings and deeply held beliefs of others. And it must be said, some scientists and dedicated skeptics apply this tool as a blunt instrument, with little finesse. Sometimes it looks as if the skeptical conclusion came first, that contentions were dismissed before, not after the evidence was examined. All of us cherish our beliefs. They are, to a degree, self-defining. When someone comes along who challenges our belief system as insufficiently well-based, or who, like Socrates, merely asks embarrassing questions that we haven't thought of, or demonstrates that we've swept key underlying assumptions under the rug, it becomes much more than a search for knowledge. It feels like a personal assault. The scientist who first proposed to consecrate doubt as a prime virtue of the inquiring mind made it clear that it was a tool and not an end in itself. René Descartes wrote, I did not imitate the skeptics who doubt only for doubting's sake and pretend to be always undecided. On the contrary, my whole intention was to arrive at a certainty and to dig away the drift and the sand until I reached the rock or the clay beneath. In the way that skepticism is sometimes applied to issues of public concern, there is a tendency to belittle, to condescend, to ignore the fact that, deluded or not, supporters of superstition and pseudoscience are human beings with real feelings who, like the skeptics, are trying to figure out how the world works and what our role in it might be. Their motives are in many cases consonant with science. If their culture has not given them all the tools they need to pursue this great quest, let us temper our criticism with kindness. None of us comes fully equipped. Clearly there are limits to the uses of skepticism. There is some cost-benefit analysis which must be applied. And if the comfort, consolation, and hope delivered by mysticism and superstition is high, and the dangers of belief comparatively low, should we not keep our misgivings to ourselves? But the issue is tricky. Imagine that you enter a big city taxicab, and the moment you get settled in, the driver begins a harangue about the supposed iniquities and inferiorities of another ethnic group. Is your best course to keep quiet, bearing in mind that silence conveys assent? Or is it your moral responsibility to argue with him, to express outrage, even to leave the cab, because you know that every silent assent will encourage him next time, and every vigorous dissent will cause him next time to think twice? Likewise, if we offer too much silent assent about mysticism and superstition, even when it seems to be doing a little good, we abet a general climate in which skepticism is considered impolite, science tiresome, and rigorous thinking somehow stuffy and inappropriate. Figuring out a prudent balance takes wisdom. The Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal is an organization of scientists, academics, magicians, and others dedicated to skeptical scrutiny of emerging or full-blown pseudosciences. It was founded by the University of Buffalo philosopher Paul Kurtz in 1976. I've been affiliated with it since its beginning. Its acronym, CSICOP, is pronounced PSYCOP, as if it's an organization of scientists performing a police function. Those wounded by CSICOP's analyses sometimes make just such a complaint. It's hostile to every new idea, they say, will go to absurd lengths in its knee-jerk debunking, is a vigilante organization, a new inquisition, and so on. CSICOP is imperfect. In certain cases, such a critique is to some degree justified. But from my point of view, CSICOP serves an important social function as a well-known organization to which media can apply when they wish to hear the other side of the story, especially when some amazing claim to pseudoscience is adjudged newsworthy. It used to be, and for much of the global news media it still is, that every levitating guru, visiting alien, channeler, and faith healer when covered by the media, would be treated non-substantively and uncritically. There would be no institutional memory at the television studio or newspaper or magazine about other similar claims previously shown to be scams and bamboozles. CSICOP represents a counterbalance, although not yet nearly a loud enough voice, 
to the pseudoscience gullibility that seems second nature to so much of the media. One of my favorite cartoons shows a fortune teller scrutinizing the Mark's palm and gravely concluding, You are very gullible. Sissi Cop publishes a bi-monthly periodical called The Skeptical Inquirer. On the day it arrives, I take it home from the office and pour through its pages, wondering what new misunderstandings will be revealed. There's always another bamboozle that I never thought of. Crop circles. Aliens have come and made perfect circles and mathematical messages. In wheat. Who would have thought it? So unlikely an artistic medium. Or they've come and eviscerated cows, on a large scale, systematically. Farmers are furious. At first, I'm impressed by the inventiveness of the stories. But then, on more sober reflection, it always strikes me how dull and routine these accounts are. What a compilation of unimaginative stale ideas, chauvinisms, hopes and fears dressed up as facts. The contentions from this point of view are suspect on their face. That's all they can conceive the extraterrestrials doing. Making circles in wheat? What a failure of the imagination. With every issue, another facet of pseudoscience is revealed and criticized. And yet the chief deficiency I see in the skeptical movement is in its polarization. Us vi them. The sense that we have a monopoly on the truth. That those other people who believe in all these stupid doctrines are morons. That if you're sensible, you'll listen to us. And if not, you're beyond redemption. This is unconstructive. It does not get the message across. It condemns the skeptics to permanent minority status, whereas a compassionate approach that from the beginning acknowledges the human roots of pseudoscience and superstition might be much more widely accepted. If we understand this, then of course we feel the uncertainty and pain of the abductees, or those who dare not leave home without consulting their horoscopes, or those who pin their hopes on crystals from Atlantis. And such compassion for kindred spirits in a common quest also works to make science and the scientific method less off-putting, especially to the young. Many pseudoscientific and New Age belief systems emerge out of dissatisfaction with conventional values and perspectives, and are therefore themselves a kind of skepticism. The same is true of the origins of most religions. David Hess, in Science and the New Age, argues that the world of paranormal beliefs and practices cannot be reduced to cranks, crackpots, and charlatans. A large number of sincere people are exploring alternative approaches to questions of personal meaning, spirituality, healing, and paranormal experience in general. To the skeptic, their quest may ultimately rest on a delusion, but debunking is hardly likely to be an effective rhetorical device for their rationalist project of getting people to recognize what appears to the skeptic as mistaken or magical thinking. The skeptic might take a clue from cultural anthropology and develop a more sophisticated skepticism by understanding alternative belief systems from the perspective of the people who hold them and by situating these beliefs in their historical, social, and cultural contexts. As a result, the world of the paranormal may appear less as a silly turn toward irrationalism and more as an idiom through which segments of society express their conflicts, dilemmas, and identities. To the extent that skeptics have a psychological or sociological theory of New Age beliefs, it tends to be very simplistic. Paranormal beliefs are comforting to people who cannot handle the reality of an atheistic universe, or their beliefs are the product of an irresponsible media that is not encouraging the public to think critically. But Hess's just criticism promptly deteriorates into complaints that parapsychologists have had their careers ruined by skeptical colleagues, and that skeptics exhibit a kind of religious zeal to defend the materialistic and atheistic worldview that smacks of what has been called scientific fundamentalism or irrational rationalism. This is a common but to me deeply mysterious, indeed occult, complaint. Again, we know a great deal about the existence and properties of matter. If a given phenomenon can already be plausibly understood in terms of matter and energy, why should we hypothesize that something else, something for which there is as yet no other good evidence, is responsible? Yet the complaint persists. Skeptics won't accept that there's an invisible fire-breathing dragon in my garage because they're all atheistic materialists. In Science in the New Age, skepticism is discussed, but it is not understood, and it is certainly not practiced. All sorts of paranormal claims are quoted, 
skeptics are deconstructed, but you can never learn from reading it that there are ways to decide whether New Age and parapsychological claims to knowledge are promising or false. It's all, as in many postmodernist texts, a matter of how strongly people feel and what their biases may be. Robert Anton Wilson, in The New Inquisition, Irrational Rationalism and the Citadel of Science, 1986, describes skeptics as the New Inquisition. But to my knowledge, no skeptic compels belief. Indeed, on most TV documentaries and talk shows, skeptics get short shrift and almost no airtime. All that's happening is that some doctrines and methods are being criticized, at the worst, ridiculed, in magazines like The Skeptical Inquirer with circulations of a few tens of thousands. New Agers are not much, as in earlier times, being called up before criminal tribunals, nor whipped for having visions, and they are certainly not being burned at the stake. Why fear a little criticism? Aren't they interested to see how well their beliefs hold up against the best counter-arguments the skeptics can muster? Perhaps one percent of the time, someone who has an idea that smells, feels, and looks indistinguishable from the usual run of pseudoscience will turn out to be right. Maybe some undiscovered reptile left over from the Cretaceous period will indeed be found in Loch Ness or the Congo Republic, or we will find artifacts of an advanced non-human species elsewhere in the solar system. At the time of writing, there are three claims in the ESP field which, in my opinion, deserve serious study. One, that by thought alone humans can barely affect random number generators in computers. Two, that people under mild sensory deprivation can receive thoughts or images projected at them. And three, that young children sometimes report the details of a previous life, which upon checking turn out to be accurate, and which they could not have known about in any other way than reincarnation. I pick these claims not because I think they're likely to be valid, I don't, but as examples of contentions that might be true. The last three have at least some, although still dubious, experimental support. Of course, I could be wrong. In the middle 1970s, an astronomer I admire put together a modest manifesto called Objections to Astrology and asked me to endorse it. I struggled with his wording and in the end found myself unable to sign not because I thought astrology has any validity whatever, but because I felt, and still feel, that the tone of the statement was authoritarian. It criticized astrology for having origins shrouded in superstition. But this is true as well for religion, chemistry, medicine, and astronomy, to mention only four. The issue is not what faltering and rudimentary knowledge astrology came from, but what is its present validity. Then there was speculation on the psychological motivations of those who believe in astrology. These motivations, for example, the feeling of powerlessness in a complex, troublesome, and unpredictable world, might explain why astrology is not generally given the skeptical scrutiny it deserves, but is quite peripheral to whether it works. The statement stressed that we can think of no mechanism by which astrology could work. This is certainly a relevant point, but by itself it's unconvincing. No mechanism was known for continental drift, now subsumed in plate tectonics, when it was proposed by Alfred Wegener in the first quarter of the 20th century to explain a range of puzzling data in geology and paleontology. Ore bearing veins of rocks and fossils seemed to run continuously from eastern South America to West Africa. Were the two continents once touching and the Atlantic Ocean new to our planet? The notion was roundly dismissed by all the great geophysicists, who were certain that continents were fixed, not floating on anything, and therefore unable to drift. Instead, the key 20th century idea in geophysics turns out to be plate tectonics. We now understand that continental plates do indeed float and drift, or better, are carried by a kind of conveyor belt driven by the great heat engine of the Earth's interior. And all those great geophysicists were simply wrong. Objections to pseudoscience on the grounds of unavailable mechanism can be mistaken, although if the contentions violate well-established laws of physics, such objections, of course, carry great weight. Many valid criticisms of astrology can be formulated in a few sentences. For example, its acceptance of precession of the equinoxes in announcing an age of Aquarius and its rejection of precession of the equinoxes in casting horoscopes, its neglect of atmospheric refraction, its list of supposedly significant celestial objects that is mainly limited to naked eye objects known to Ptolemy in the 2nd century, 
and that ignores an enormous variety of new astronomical objects discovered since, where is the astrology of near-Earth asteroids? Inconsistent requirements for detailed information on the time as compared to the latitude and longitude of birth. The failure of astrology to pass the identical twin test. The major differences in horoscopes cast from the same birth information by different astrologers. And the absence of demonstrated correlation between horoscopes and such psychological tests as the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. What I would have signed is a statement describing and refuting the principal tenets of astrological belief. Such a statement would have been far more persuasive than what was actually circulated and published. But astrology, which has been with us for 4,000 years or more, today seems more popular than ever. At least a quarter of all Americans, according to opinion polls, believe in astrology. A third thinks sun sign astrology is scientific. The fraction of schoolchildren believing in astrology rose from 40% to 59% between 1978 and 1984. There are perhaps ten times more astrologers than astronomers in the United States. In France, there are more astrologers than Roman Catholic clergy. No stuffy dismissal by a gaggle of scientists makes contact with the social needs that astrology, no matter how invalid it is, addresses and science does not. As I've tried to stress, at the heart of science is an essential balance between two seemingly contradictory attitudes, an openness to new ideas, no matter how bizarre or counterintuitive, and the most ruthlessly skeptical scrutiny of all ideas, old and new. This is how deep truths are winnowed from deep nonsense, the collective enterprise of creative thinking and skeptical thinking, working together, keeps the field on track. Those two seemingly contradictory attitudes are, though, in some tension. Consider this claim. As I walk along, time, as measured by my wristwatch or my aging process, slows down. Also, I shrink in the direction of motion. Also, I get more massive. Who has ever witnessed such a thing? It's easy to dismiss it out of hand. Here's another. Matter and antimatter are all the time throughout the universe being created from nothing. Here's a third. Once in a very great while, your car will spontaneously ooze through the brick wall of your garage and be found the next morning on the street. They're all absurd. But the first is a statement of special relativity, and the other two are consequences of quantum mechanics, vacuum fluctuations and barrier tunneling. They're called. Like it or not, that's the way the world is. If you insist it's ridiculous, you'll be forever closed to some of the major findings on the rules that govern the universe. If you're only skeptical, then no new ideas make it through to you. You never learn anything. You become a crotchety misanthrope convinced that nonsense is ruling the world. There is, of course, much data to support you. Since major discoveries in the borderlines of science are rare, experience will tend to confirm your grumpiness. But every now and then a new idea turns out to be on the mark, valid and wonderful. If you're too resolutely and uncompromisingly skeptical, you're going to miss or resent the transforming discoveries in science, and either way you will be obstructing understanding and progress. Mere skepticism is not enough. At the same time, science requires the most vigorous and uncompromising skepticism, because the vast majority of ideas are simply wrong, and the only way to winnow the wheat from the chaff is by critical experiment and analysis. If you're open to the point of gullibility and have not a microgram of skeptical sense in you, then you cannot distinguish the promising ideas from the worthless ones. Uncritically accepting every proffered notion, idea, and hypothesis is tantamount to knowing nothing. Ideas contradict one another. Only through skeptical scrutiny can we decide among them. Some ideas really are better than others. The judicious mix of these two modes of thought is central to the success of science. Good scientists do both. On their own, talking to themselves, they churn up many new ideas, and criticize them systematically. Most of the ideas never make it to the outside world. Only those that pass a rigorous self-filtration make it out to be criticized by the rest of the scientific community. Because of this dogged mutual and self-criticism, and the proper reliance on experiment as the arbiter between contending hypotheses, many scientists tend to be diffident about describing their own sense of wonder at the dawning of a wild surmise. This is a pity, because these rare exultant moments demystify and humanize the scientific endeavor. No one can be entirely open or completely skeptical. We all must draw the line somewhere.
An ancient Chinese proverb advises, better to be too credulous than too skeptical. But this is from an extremely conservative society in which stability was much more prized than freedom, and where the rulers had a powerful vested interest in not being challenged. Most scientists, I believe, would say, better to be too skeptical than too credulous. But neither is easy. Responsible, thoroughgoing, rigorous skepticism requires a hard-nosed habit of thought that takes practice and training to master. Credulity, I think a better word here is openness or wonder, does not come easily either. If we really are to be open to counterintuitive ideas in physics or social organization or anything else, we must grasp those ideas. It means nothing to be open to a proposition we don't understand. Both skepticism and wonder are skills that need honing and practice. Their harmonious marriage within the mind of every school child ought to be a principal goal of public education. I'd love to see such a domestic felicity portrayed in the media, television especially, a community of people really working the mix, full of wonder, generously open to every notion, dismissing nothing except for good reason, but at the same time, and as second nature, demanding stringent standards of evidence. And these standards applied with at least as much rigor to what they hold dear as to what they are tempted to reject with impunity. Chapter 18. The Wind Makes Dust. The wind makes dust because it intends to blow, taking away our footprints. Specimens of Bushman folklore, Wai Chai. Bleak and L.C. Lloyd, Collectors, L.C. Lloyd, Editor, 1911. Every time a savage tracks his game, he employs a minuteness of observation and an accuracy of inductive and deductive reasoning which, applied to other matters, would assure some reputation as a man of science. The intellectual labor of a good hunter or warrior considerably exceeds that of an ordinary Englishman. Thomas H. Huxley, Collected Essays, Volume 2, Darwiniana, Essays, London Macmillan, 1907, pp. 175, 6 from Mr. Darwin's Critics, 1871. Why should so many people find science hard to learn and hard to teach? I've tried to suggest some of the reasons. Its precision, its counterintuitive and disquieting aspects, its prospects of misuse, its independence of authority, and so on. But is there something deeper? Alan Cromer is a physics professor at Northeastern University in Boston, who was surprised to find so many students unable to grasp the most elementary concepts in his physics class. In Uncommon Sense, the Heretical Nature of Science, 1993, Cromer proposes that science is difficult because it's new. We, a species that's a few hundred thousand years old, discovered the method of science only a few centuries ago, he says. Like writing, which is only a few millennia old, we haven't gotten the hang of it yet, or at least not without very serious and attentive study. Except for an unlikely concatenation of historical events, he suggests, we would never have invented science. This hostility to science in the face of its obvious triumphs and benefits is evidence that it is something outside the mainstream of human development, perhaps a fluke. Chinese civilization invented movable type, gunpowder, the rocket, the magnetic compass, the seismograph, and systematic observations and chronicles of the heavens. Indian mathematicians invented the zero, the key to comfortable arithmetic, and therefore to quantitative science. Aztec civilization developed a far better calendar than that of the European civilization that inundated and destroyed it. They were better able, and for longer periods into the future, to predict where the planets would be. But none of these civilizations, Cromer argues, had developed the skeptical, inquiring, experimental method of science. All of that came out of ancient Greece. The development of objective thinking by the Greeks appears to have required a number of specific cultural factors. First was the assembly, where men first learned to persuade one another by means of rational debate. Second was a maritime economy that prevented isolation and parochialism. Third was the existence of a widespread Greek-speaking world around which travelers and scholars could wander. Fourth was the existence of an independent merchant class that could hire its own teachers. Fifth was the Iliad and the Odyssey, literary masterpieces that are themselves the epitome of liberal rational thinking. Sixth was a literary religion not dominated by priests, and seventh was the persistence of these factors for one thousand years. That all these factors came together in one great civilization is quite fortuitous. It didn't happen twice. I'm sympathetic to part of this thesis.
The ancient Ionians were the first we know of to argue systematically that laws and forces of nature, rather than gods, are responsible for the order and even the existence of the world. As Lucretius summarized their views, nature free at once and rid of her haughty lords is seen to do all things spontaneously of herself without the meddling of the gods. Except for the first week of introductory philosophy courses, though, the names and notions of the early Ionians are almost never mentioned in our society. Those who dismiss the gods tend to be forgotten. We are not anxious to preserve the memory of such skeptics, much less their ideas. Heroes who try to explain the world in terms of matter and energy may have arisen many times in many cultures, only to be obliterated by the priests and philosophers in charge of the conventional wisdom, as the Ionian approach was almost wholly lost after the time of Plato and Aristotle. With many cultures and many experiments of this sort, it may be that only on rare occasions does the idea take root. Plants and animals were domesticated, and civilization began only ten or twelve thousand years ago. The Ionian experiment is two thousand five hundred years old. It was almost entirely expunged. We can see steps towards science in ancient China, India, and elsewhere, even though faltering, incomplete, and bearing less fruit. But suppose the Ionians had never existed, and Greek science and mathematics never flourished. Is it possible that never again in the history of the human species would science have emerged? Or given many cultures and many alternative historical skeins, isn't it likely that the right combination of factors would come into play somewhere else sooner or later, in the islands of Indonesia, say, or in the Caribbean on the outskirts of a Mesoamerican civilization, untouched by conquistadores, or in Norse colonies on the shores of the Black Sea? The impediment to scientific thinking is not, I think, the difficulty of the subject. Complex intellectual feats have been mainstays even of oppressed cultures. Shamans, magicians, and theologians are highly skilled in their intricate and arcane arts. No, the impediment is political and hierarchical. In those cultures lacking unfamiliar challenges, external or internal, where fundamental change is unneeded, novel ideas need not be encouraged. Indeed, heresies can be declared dangerous thinking can be rigidified, and sanctions against impermissible ideas can be enforced, all without much harm. But under varied and changing environmental or biological or political circumstances, simply copying the old ways no longer works. Then, a premium awaits those who, instead of blandly following tradition or trying to foist their preferences onto the physical or social universe, are open to what the universe teaches. Each society must decide where in the continuum between openness and rigidity safety lies. Greek mathematics was a brilliant step forward. Greek science, on the other hand, its first steps rudimentary and often uninformed by experiment, was riddled with error. Despite the fact that we cannot see in pitch darkness, they believe that vision depends on a kind of radar that emanates from the eye, bounces off what we're seeing, and returns to the eye. Nevertheless, they made substantial progress in optics. Despite the obvious resemblance of children to their mothers, they believed that heredity was carried by semen alone, the woman a mere passive receptacle. They believed that the horizontal motion of a thrown rock somehow lifts it up, so that it takes longer to reach the ground than a rock dropped from the same height at the same moment. Enamored of simple geometry, they believed the circle to be perfect, despite the man in the moon and sunspots, occasionally visible to the naked eye at sunset, they held the heavens also to be perfect. Therefore, planetary orbits had to be circular. Being freed from superstition isn't enough for science to grow. One must also have the idea of interrogating nature, of doing experiments. There were some brilliant examples. Eratosthenes' measurement of the Earth's diameter, say, or Empedocles' clepsydra experiment demonstrating the material nature of air. But in a society in which manual labor is demeaned and thought fit only for slaves, as in the classical Greco-Roman world, the experimental method does not thrive. Science requires us to be freed of gross superstition and gross injustice both. Often, superstition and injustice are imposed by the same ecclesiastical and secular authorities, working hand in glove. It is no surprise that political revolutions, skepticism about religion, and the rise of science might go together. Liberation from superstition is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for science. At the same time, it is undeniable that central figures in the transition from medieval superstition to modern science were profoundly influenced by the idea of one supreme god 
who created the universe and established not only commandments that humans must live by, but laws that nature itself must abide by. The 17th century German astronomer Johannes Kepler, without whom Newtonian physics might not have come to be, described his pursuit of science as a wish to know the mind of God. In our own time, leading scientists, including Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking, have described their quest in nearly identical terms. The philosopher Alfred North Whitehead and the historian of Chinese technology Joseph Needham have also suggested that what was lacking in the development of science in non-Western cultures was monotheism. And yet, I think there is strong contrary evidence to this whole thesis, calling out to us from across the millennia. The small hunting party follows the trail of hoofprints and other spoor. They pause for a moment by a stand of trees. Squatting on their heels, they examine the evidence more carefully. The trail they've been following has been crossed by another. Quickly they agree on which animals are responsible, how many of them, what ages and sexes, whether any are injured, how fast they're traveling, how long ago they passed, whether any other hunters are in pursuit, whether the party can overtake the game, and if so, how long it will take. The decision made, they flick their hands over the trail they will follow, make a quiet sound between their teeth like the wind, and off they lope. Despite their bows and poison arrows, they continue at championship marathon racing form for hours. Almost always they've read the message in the ground correctly. The wildebeests or elands or okapis are where they thought, in the numbers and condition they estimated. The hunt is successful. Meat is carried back to the temporary camp. Everyone feasts. This more or less typical hunting vignette comes from the Kung San people of the Kalahari Desert, in the republics of Botswana and Namibia, who are now, tragically, on the verge of extinction. But for decades they and their way of life were studied by anthropologists. The Kung San may be typical of the hunter-gatherer mode of existence in which we humans spent most of our time until 10,000 years ago, when plants and animals were domesticated and the human condition began to change, perhaps forever. They were trackers of such legendary prowess that they were enlisted by the apartheid South African army to hunt down human prey in the wars against the front-line states. This encounter with the white South African military in several different ways accelerated the destruction of the Kung San way of life. It had, in any case, been deteriorating bit by bit over the centuries from every contact with European civilization. How did they do it? How could they tell so much from barely more than a glance? Saying their keen observers explains nothing, what actually did they do? According to anthropologist Richard Lee, they scrutinized the shape of the depressions. The footprints of a fast-moving animal display a more elongated symmetry. A slightly lame animal favors the afflicted foot, puts less weight on it, and leaves a fainter imprint. A heavier animal leaves a deeper and broader hollow. The correlation functions are in the heads of the hunters. In the course of the day, the footprints erode a little. The walls of the depression tend to crumble. Wind-blown sand accumulates on the floor of the hollow. Perhaps bits of leaf, twigs, or grass are blown into it. The longer you wait, the more erosion there is. This method is essentially identical to what planetary astronomers use in analyzing craters left by impacting worldlets. Other things being equal, the shallower the crater, the older it is. Craters with slumped walls, with modest depth-to-diameter ratios, with fine particles accumulated in their interiors tend to be more ancient, because they had to be around long enough for these erosive processes to come into play. The sources of degradation may differ from world to world, or desert to desert, or epoch to epoch. But if you know what they are, you can determine a great deal from how crisp or blurred the crater is. If insect or other animal tracks are superposed on the hoof prints, this also argues against their freshness. The subsurface moisture content of the soil and the rate at which it dries out after being exposed by a hoof determine how crumbly the crater walls are. All these matters are closely studied by the Kung. The galloping herd hates the hot sun. The animals will use whatever shade they can find. They will alter course to take brief advantage of the shade from a stand of trees. But where the shadow is depends on the time of day, because the sun is moving across the sky. In the morning, as the sun is rising in the east, shadows are cast west of the trees. Later in the afternoon, as the sun is setting toward the west, shadows are cast to the east.
From the swerve of the tracks, it's possible to tell how long ago the animals passed. This calculation will be different in different seasons of the year, so the hunters must carry in their heads a kind of astronomical calendar predicting the apparent solar motion. To me, all of these formidable forensic tracking skills are science in action. Not only are hunter-gatherers expert in the tracks of other animals, they also know human tracks very well. Every member of the band is recognizable by his or her footprints. They are as familiar as their faces. Lawrence van der Post recounts, I'm many miles from home and separated from the rest, and you and I, on the track of a wounded buck, suddenly found another set of prints and spoor joining our own. He gave a deep grunt of satisfaction and said it was Bauxhau's footmarks made not many minutes before. He declared Bauxhau was running fast and that we would soon see him and the animal. We topped the dune in front of us and there was Bauxhau, already skinning the animal. Or Richard Lee, also among the Kung San, relates how when briefly examining some tracks a hunter commented, Oh look, Tunu is here with his brother-in-law. But where is his son? Is this really science? Does every tracker in the course of his training sit on his haunches for hours, following the slow degradation of an eland hoofprint? When the anthropologist asks this question, the answer given is that hunters have always used such methods. They observed their fathers and other accomplished hunters during their apprenticeships. They learned by imitation. The general principles were passed down from generation to generation. The local variations, wind speed, soil moisture, are updated as needed in each generation or seasonally or day by day. But modern scientists do just the same. Every time we try to judge the age of a crater on the moon or Mercury or Triton by its degree of erosion, we do not perform the calculation from scratch. We dust off a certain scientific paper and read the tried and true numbers that have been set down perhaps as much as a generation earlier. Physicists do not derive Maxwell's equations or quantum mechanics from scratch. They try to understand the principles and the mathematics. They observe its utility. They note how nature follows these rules, and they take these sciences to heart, making them their own. Yet someone had to figure out all these tracking protocols for the first time, perhaps some paleolithic genius, or more likely a succession of geniuses in widely separated times and places. There is no hint in the Kung tracking protocols of magical methods. Examining the stars the night before, or the entrails of an animal, or casting dice, or interpreting dreams, or conjuring demons, or any of the myriad other spurious claims to knowledge that humans have intermittently entertained. Here there's a specific, well-defined question. Which way did the prey go, and what are its characteristics? You need a precise answer that magic and divination simply do not provide, or at least not often enough to stave off starvation. Instead, hunter-gatherers, who are not very superstitious in their everyday life, except during trance dances around the fire and under the influence of mild euphorians, are practical, workaday, motivated, social, and often very cheerful. They employ skills winnowed from past successes and failures. Scientific thinking has almost certainly been with us from the beginning. You can even see it in chimpanzees when tracking on patrol of the frontiers of their territory, or when preparing a reed to insert into the termite mound to extract a modest but much-needed source of protein. The development of tracking skills delivers a powerful evolutionary selective advantage. Those groups unable to figure it out get less protein and leave fewer offspring. Those with a scientific bent, those able patiently to observe, those with a penchant for figuring out acquire more food, especially more protein and live in more varied habitats. They and their hereditary lines prosper. The same is true, for instance, of Polynesian seafaring skills. A scientific bent brings tangible rewards. The other principal food-garnering activity of pre-agrarian societies is foraging. To forage, you must know the properties of many plants, and you must certainly be able to distinguish one from another. Botanists and anthropologists have repeatedly found that all over the world hunter-gatherer peoples have distinguished the various plant species with the precision of Western taxonomists. They have mentally mapped their territory with the finesse of cartographers. Again, all this is a precondition for survival. So the claim that just as children are not developmentally ready for certain concepts in mathematics or logic, so primitive peoples are not intellectually able to grasp science and technology, is nonsense.
This vestige of colonialism and racism is belied by the everyday activities of people living with no fixed abode and almost no possessions, the few remaining hunter-gatherers, the custodians of our deep past. Of Cromer's criteria for objective thinking, we can certainly find in hunter-gatherer peoples vigorous and substantive debate, direct participatory democracy, wide-ranging travel, no priests, and the persistence of these factors not for 1,000 but for 300,000 years or more, by his criteria, hunter-gatherers ought to have science. I think they do. Or did. What Ionia and ancient Greece provided is not so much inventions or technology or engineering, but the idea of systematic inquiry, the notion that laws of nature, rather than capricious gods, govern the world. Water, air, earth, and fire all had their turn as candidate explanations of the nature and origin of the world. Each such explanation identified with a different pre-Socratic philosopher, was deeply flawed in its details. But the mode of explanation, an alternative to divine intervention, was productive and new. Likewise, in the history of ancient Greece, we can see nearly all significant events driven by the caprice of the gods in Homer, only a few events in Herodotus, and essentially none at all in Thucydides. In a few hundred years, history passed from god-driven to human-driven. Something akin to laws of nature were once glimpsed in a determinedly polytheistic society, in which some scholars toyed with a form of atheism. This approach of the pre-Socratics was, beginning in about the 4th century B.C., quenched by Plato, Aristotle, and then Christian theologians. If the skein of historical causality had been different, if the brilliant guesses of the atomists on the nature of matter, the plurality of worlds, the vastness of space and time had been treasured and built upon, if the innovative technology of Archimedes had been taught and emulated, if the notion of invariable laws of nature that humans must seek out and understand had been widely propagated, I wonder what kind of world we would live in now. I don't think science is hard to teach because humans aren't ready for it, or because it arose only through a fluke, or because, by and large, we don't have the brain power to grapple with it. Instead, the enormous zest for science that I see in first graders and the lesson from the remnant hunter-gatherers both speak eloquently. A proclivity for science is embedded deeply within us, in all times, places, and cultures. It has been the means for our survival. It is our birthright. When, through indifference, inattention, incompetence, or fear of skepticism, we discourage children from science, we are disenfranchising them, taking from them the tools needed to manage their future. Chapter 19. No such thing as a dumb question. So we keep asking over and over, until a handful of earth stops our mouths. But is that an answer? Heinrich Heine, Lazarus, 1854. In East Africa, in the records of the rocks dating back to about two million years ago, you can find a sequence of work tools that our ancestors designed and executed. Their lives depended on making and using these tools. This was, of course, early Stone Age technology. Over time, specially fashioned stones were used for stabbing, chipping, flaking, cutting, carving. Although there are many ways of making stone tools, what is remarkable is that in a given site for enormous periods of time, the tools were made in the same way, which means that there must have been educational institutions hundreds of thousands of years ago, even if it was mainly an apprenticeship system. While it's easy to exaggerate the similarities, it's also easy to imagine the equivalent of professors and students in loincloths, laboratory courses, examinations, failing grades, graduation ceremonies, and postgraduate education. When the training is unchanged for immense periods of time, traditions are passed on intact to the next generation. But when what needs to be learned changes quickly, especially in the course of a single generation, it becomes much harder to know what to teach and how to teach it. Then students complain about relevance. Respect for their elders diminishes. Teachers despair at how educational standards have deteriorated and how lackadaisical students have become. In a world in transition, Students and teachers both need to teach themselves one essential skill, learning how to learn. Except for children, who don't know enough not to ask the important questions, few of us spend much time wondering why nature is the way it is, where the cosmos came from, or whether it was always here. If time will one day flow backward and effects precede causes, or whether there are ultimate limits to what humans can know. There are even children, 
and I have met some of them who want to know what a black hole looks like, what is the smallest piece of matter, why we remember the past and not the future, and why there is a universe. Every now and then I'm lucky enough to teach a kindergarten or first grade class. Many of these children are natural-born scientists, although heavy on the wonder side and light on skepticism. They're curious, intellectually vigorous. Provocative and insightful questions bubble out of them. They exhibit enormous enthusiasm. I'm asked follow-up questions. They've never heard of the notion of a dumb question. But when I talk to high school seniors, I find something different. They memorize facts. By and large, though, the joy of discovery, the life behind those facts, has gone out of them. They've lost much of the wonder and gained very little skepticism. They're worried about asking dumb questions. They're willing to accept inadequate answers. They don't pose follow-up questions. The room is awash with sidelong glances to judge, second by second, the approval of their peers. They come to class with their questions written out on pieces of paper, which they surreptitiously examine, waiting their turn and oblivious of whatever discussion their peers are at this moment engaged in. Something has happened between first and twelfth grade, and it's not just puberty. I'd guess that it's partly peer pressure not to excel, except in sports. Partly that the society teaches short-term gratification. Partly the impression that science or mathematics won't buy you a sports car. Partly that so little is expected of students. And partly that there are few rewards or role models for intelligent discussion of science and technology. Or even for learning for its own sake. Those few who remain interested are vilified as nerds or geeks or grinds. But there's something else. I find many adults are put off when young children pose scientific questions. Why is the moon round, the children ask. Why is grass green? What is a dream? How deep can you dig a hole? When is the world's birthday? Why do we have toes? Too many teachers and parents answer with irritation or ridicule, or quickly move on to something else. What did you expect the moon to be, square? Children soon recognize that somehow this kind of question annoys the grown-ups. A few more experiences like it, and another child has been lost to science. Why adults should pretend to omniscience before six-year-olds, I can't for the life of me understand. What's wrong with admitting that we don't know something? Is our self-esteem so fragile? What's more, many of these questions go to deep issues in science, a few of which are not yet fully resolved. Why the moon is round has to do with the fact that gravity is a central force pulling towards the middle of any world, and with how strong rocks are. Grass is green because of the pigment chlorophyll, of course. We've all had that drummed into us by high schools. But why do plants have chlorophyll? It seems foolish since the sun puts out its peak energy in the yellow and green part of the spectrum. Why should plants all over the world reject sunlight in its most abundant wavelengths? Maybe it's a frozen accident from the ancient history of life on Earth. But there's something we still don't understand about why grass is green. There are many better responses than making the child feel that asking deep questions constitutes a social blunder. If we have an idea of the answer, we can try to explain. Even an incomplete attempt constitutes a reassurance and encouragement. If we have no idea of the answer, we can go to the encyclopedia. If we don't have an encyclopedia, we can take the child to the library. Or we might say, I don't know the answer. Maybe no one knows. Maybe when you grow up, you'll be the first person to find out. There are naive questions, tedious questions, ill-phrased questions, questions put after inadequate self-criticism. But every question is a cry to understand the world. There is no such thing as a dumb question. Bright, curious children are a national and world resource. They need to be cared for, cherished, and encouraged. But mere encouragement isn't enough. We must also give them the essential tools to think with. It's official reads one newspaper headline, We Stink in Science. In tests of average 17-year-olds in many world regions, the U.S. ranked dead last in algebra. On identical tests, the U.S. kids averaged 43%, and their Japanese counterparts 78%. In my book, 78% is pretty good. It corresponds to a C+, plus or maybe even a B. 43% is an F. In a chemistry test, students in only two of 13 nations did worse than the U.S., Britain, Singapore, and Hong Kong were so high, they were almost off scale, and 25% of Canadian 18-year-olds knew just as much chemistry as a select 1% of American high school seniors in their second chemistry course, 
and most of them in advanced placement programs. The best of 25th grade classrooms in Minneapolis was outpaced by every one of 20 classrooms in Sendai, Japan, and 19 out of 20 in Taipei, Taiwan. South Korean students were far ahead of American students in all aspects of mathematics and science, and 13-year-olds in British Columbia, in Western Canada, outpaced their U.S. counterparts across the board. In some areas, they did better than the Koreans. Of the U.S. kids, 22% say they dislike school. Only 8% of the Koreans do. Yet two-thirds of the Americans, but only a quarter of the Koreans, say they are good at mathematics. Such dismal trends for average students in the United States are occasionally offset by the performance of outstanding students. In 1994, American students at the International Mathematical Olympiad in Hong Kong achieved an unprecedented perfect score, defeating 360 other students from 68 nations in algebra, geometry, and number theory. One of them, 17-year-old Jeremy Bem, commented, Math's problems are logic puzzles. There's no routine. It's all very creative and artistic. But here I'm concerned not with producing a new generation of first-rate scientists and mathematicians, but a scientifically literate public. 63% of American adults are unaware that the last dinosaur died before the first human arose. 75% do not know that antibiotics kill bacteria but not viruses. 57% do not know that electrons are smaller than atoms. Polls show that something like half of American adults do not know that the Earth goes around the sun and takes a year to do it. I can find in my undergraduate classes at Cornell University bright students who do not know that the stars rise and set at night, or even that the sun is a star. Because of science fiction, the educational system, NASA, and the role that science plays in society, Americans have much more exposure to the Copernican insight than does the average human. A 1993 poll by the China Association of Science and Technology shows that, as in America, no more than half the people in China know that the Earth revolves around the sun once a year. It may very well be, then, that more than four and a half centuries after Copernicus, most people on Earth still think, in their heart of hearts, that our planet sits immobile at the center of the universe and that we are profoundly special. These are typical questions in scientific literacy. The results are appalling, but what do they measure? The memorization of authoritative pronouncements. What they should be asking is how we know that antibiotics discriminate between microbes, that electrons are smaller than atoms, that the sun is a star which the Earth orbits once a year. Such questions are a much truer measure of public understanding of science, and the results of such tests would doubtless be more disheartening still. If you accept the literal truth of every word of the Bible, then the earth must be flat. The same is true for the Quran. Pronouncing the earth round then means you're an atheist. In 1993, the supreme religious authority of Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Abdelaziz Ibn Baz, issued an edict or fatwa declaring that the world is flat. Anyone of the round persuasion does not believe in God and should be punished. Among many ironies, the lucid evidence that the earth is a sphere accumulated by the second-century Greco-Egyptian astronomer Claudius Ptolemaeus, was transmitted to the West by astronomers who were Muslim and Arab. In the ninth century, they named Ptolemy's book in which the sphericity of the earth is demonstrated, the Almagest, the greatest. I meet many people offended by evolution, who passionately prefer to be the personal handicraft of God than to arise by blind physical and chemical forces over eons from slime. They also tend to be less than assiduous in exposing themselves to the evidence. Evidence has little to do with it. What they wish to be true, they believe is true. Only 9% of Americans accept the central finding of modern biology that human beings, and all the other species, have slowly evolved by natural processes from a succession of more ancient beings with no divine intervention needed along the way. When asked merely if they accept evolution, 45% of Americans say yes. The figure is 70% in China. When the movie Jurassic Park was shown in Israel, it was condemned by some Orthodox rabbis because it accepted evolution and because it taught that dinosaurs lived a hundred million years ago, when, as is plainly stated at every Rosh Hashanah and every Jewish wedding ceremony, the universe is less than 6,000 years old. The clearest evidence of our evolution can be found in our genes. But evolution is still being fought. 
ironically by those whose own DNA proclaims it, in the schools, in the courts, in textbook publishing houses, and on the question of just how much pain we can inflict on other animals without crossing some ethical threshold. During the Great Depression in America, teachers enjoyed job security, good salaries, respectability. Teaching was an admired profession, partly because learning was widely recognized as the road out of poverty. Little of that is true today, and so science and other teaching is too often incompetently or uninspiringly done, its practitioners astonishingly having little or no training in their subjects, impatient with the method and in a hurry to get to the findings of science, and sometimes themselves unable to distinguish science from pseudoscience. Those who do have the training often get higher-paying jobs elsewhere. Children need hands-on experience with the experimental method rather than just reading about science in a book. We can be told about oxidation of wax as the explanation of the candle flame, but we have a much more vivid sense of what's going on if we witness the candle burning briefly in a bell jar until the carbon dioxide produced by the burning surrounds the wick, blocks access to oxygen, and the flame flickers and dies. We can be taught about mitochondria in cells, how they mediate the oxidation of food like the flame burning the wax, but it's another thing altogether to see them under the microscope. We may be told that oxygen is necessary for the life of some organisms and not others, but we begin really to understand when we test the proposition in a bell jar fully depleted of oxygen. What does oxygen do for us? Why do we die without it? Where does the oxygen in the air come from? How secure is the supply? Experiment and the scientific method can be taught in many matters other than science. Daniel Kunitz is a friend of mine from college. He spent his life as an innovative junior and senior high school social sciences teacher. Want the students to understand the Constitution of the United States? You could have them read it article by article and then discuss it in class, but sadly this will put most of them to sleep. Or you could try the Kunitz method. You forbid the students to read the Constitution. Instead, you assign them, two for each state, to attend a constitutional convention. You brief each of the 13 teams in detail on the particular interests of their state and region. The South Carolina delegation, say, would be told of the primacy of cotton, the necessity and morality of the slave trade, the danger posed by the industrial North, and so on. The 13 delegations assemble, and with a little faculty guidance, but mainly on their own, over some weeks write a constitution. Then they read the real Constitution. The students have reserved war-making powers to the President. The delegates of 1787 assigned them to Congress. Why? The students have freed the slaves. The original Constitutional Convention did not. Why? This takes more preparation by the teachers and more work by the students. But the experience is unforgettable. It's hard not to think that the nations of the earth would be in better shape if every citizen went through a comparable experience. We need more money for teachers' training and salaries, and for laboratories. But all across America, school bond issues are regularly voted down. No one suggests that property taxes be used to provide for the military budget, or for agriculture subsidies, or for cleaning up toxic wastes. Why just education? Why not support it from general taxes on the local and state levels? What about a special education tax for those industries with special needs for technically trained workers? American schoolchildren don't do enough schoolwork. There are 180 days in the standard school year in the United States, as compared with 220 in South Korea, about 230 in Germany, and 243 in Japan. Children in some of these countries go to school on Saturday. The average American high school student spends 3.5 hours a week on homework. The total time devoted to studies, in and out of the classroom, is about 20 hours a week. Japanese fifth graders average 33 hours a week. Japan, with half the population of the United States, produces twice as many scientists and engineers with advanced degrees every year. During four years of high school, American students spend less than 1,500 hours on such subjects as mathematics, science, and history. Japanese, French, and German students spend more than twice as much time. A 1994 report commissioned by the U.S. Department of Education notes, the traditional school day must now fit in a whole set of requirements for what has been called the new work of the schools. Education about personal safety, consumer affairs, AIDS, conservation and energy, family life and driver's training. 
So, because of the deficiencies of society and the inadequacies of education in the home, only about three hours a day are spent in high school on the core academic subjects. There's a widely held perception that science is too hard for ordinary people. We can see this reflected in the statistic that only around 10% of American high school students ever opt for a course in physics. What makes science suddenly too hard? Why isn't it too hard for the citizens of all those other countries that are outperforming the United States? What has happened to the American genius for science, technical innovation, and hard work? Americans once took enormous pride in their inventors, who pioneered the telegraph, telephone, electric light, phonograph, automobile, and airplane. Except for computers, all that seems a thing of the past. Where did all that Yankee ingenuity go? Most American children aren't stupid. Part of the reason they don't study hard is that they receive few tangible benefits when they do. Competency, that is, actually knowing the stuff, in verbal skills, mathematics, science, and history these days, doesn't increase earnings for average young men in their first eight years out of high school, many of whom take service rather than industrial jobs. In the productive sectors of the economy, though, the story is often different. There are furniture factories, for example, in danger of going out of business, not because there are no customers, but because so few entry-level workers can do simple arithmetic. A major electronics company reports that 80% of its job applicants can't pass a fifth-grade mathematics test. The United States already is losing some $40 billion a year, mainly in lost productivity and the cost of remedial education, because workers, to too great a degree, can't read, write, count, or think. In a survey by the U.S. National Science Board of 139 high-technology companies in the United States, the chief causes of the research and development decline attributable to national policy were, one, lack of a long-term strategy for dealing with the problem, two, too little attention paid to the training of future scientists and engineers, three, too much investment in defense and not enough in civilian research and development, and four, too little attention paid to pre-college education. Ignorance feeds on ignorance. Science phobia is contagious. Those in America with the most favorable view of science tend to be young, well-to-do, college-educated white males. But three-quarters of new American workers in the next decade will be women, non-whites, and immigrants. Failing to rouse their enthusiasm, to say nothing of discriminating against them, isn't only unjust, it's also stupid and self-defeating. It deprives the economy of desperately needed skilled workers. African American and Hispanic students are doing significantly better in standardized science tests now than in the late 1960s, but they're the only ones who are. The average maths gap between white and black U.S. high school graduates is still huge, two to three grade levels, but the gap between white U.S. high school graduates and those in, say, Japan, Canada, Great Britain, or Finland is more than twice as large with the U.S. students behind. If you're poorly motivated and poorly educated, you won't know much. No mystery there. Suburban African Americans with college-educated parents do just as well in college as suburban whites with college-educated parents. According to some statistics, enrolling a poor child in a Head Start program doubles his or her chances to be employed later in life. One who completes an upward-bound program is four times as likely to get a college education. If we're serious, we know what to do. What about college and university? There are obvious steps to take. Improved status based on teaching success and promotions of teachers based on the performance of their students in standardized, double-blind tests. Salaries for teachers that approach what they could get in industry. More scholarships, fellowships, and laboratory equipment. Imaginative, inspiring curricula and textbooks in which the leading faculty members play a major role. Laboratory courses required of everyone to graduate, and special attention paid to those traditionally steered away from science. We should also encourage the best academic scientists to spend more time on public education, textbooks, lectures, newspaper and magazine articles, TV appearances, and a mandatory freshman or sophomore, first or second year course in skeptical thinking, and the methods of science might be worth trying. The mystic William Blake stared at the sun and saw angels there, while others, more worldly, perceived only an object of about the size and color of a golden guinea. Did Blake really see angels in the sun, or was it some perceptual or cognitive error? 
I know of no photograph of the sun that shows anything of the sort. Did Blake see what the camera and the telescope cannot? Or does the explanation lie much more inside Blake's head than outside? And is not the truth of the sun's nature, as revealed by modern science, far more wonderful? No mere angels or gold coin, but an enormous sphere into which a million Earths could be packed, in the core of which the hidden nuclei of atoms are being jammed together, hydrogen transfigured into helium, the energy latent in hydrogen for billions of years released, the Earth and other planets warmed and lit thereby and the same process repeated 400 billion times elsewhere in the Milky Way galaxy. The blueprints, detailed instructions, and job orders for building you from scratch would fill about 1,000 encyclopedia volumes if written out in English. Yet every cell in your body has a set of these encyclopedias. A quasar is so far away that the light we see from it began its intergalactic voyage before the Earth was formed. Every person on Earth is descended from the same not-quite-human ancestors in East Africa a few million years ago, making us all cousins. Whenever I think about any of these discoveries, I feel a tingle of exhilaration. My heart races. I can't help it. Science is an astonishment and a delight. Every time a spacecraft flies by a new world, I find myself amazed. Planetary scientists ask themselves, Oh, is that the way it is? Why didn't we think of that? But nature is always more subtle, more intricate, more elegant than what we are able to imagine. Given our manifest human limitations, what is surprising is that we have been able to penetrate so far into the secrets of nature. Nearly every scientist has experienced, in a moment of discovery or sudden understanding, a reverential astonishment. Science. Pure science. Science not for any practical application but for its own sake. Is a deeply emotional matter for those who practice it as well as for those non-scientists who every now and then dip in to see what's been discovered lately. And, as in a detective story, it's a joy to frame key questions, to work through alternative explanations, and maybe even to advance the process of scientific discovery. Consider these examples, some very simple, some not, chosen more or less at random. Could there be an undiscovered integer between six and seven? Could there be an undiscovered chemical element between atomic number six? which is carbon, and atomic number seven, which is nitrogen. Yes, the new preservative causes cancer in rats. But what if you have to give a person, who weighs much more than a rat, a pound a day of the stuff to induce cancer? In that case, maybe the new preservative isn't all that dangerous. Might the benefit of having food preserved for long periods outweigh the small additional risk of cancer? Who decides? What data do they need to make a prudent decision? In a 3.8 billion-year-old rock, you find a ratio of carbon isotopes typical of living things today and different from inorganic sediments. Do you deduce abundant life on Earth 3.8 billion years ago? Or could the chemical remains of more modern organisms have infiltrated into the rock? Or is there a way for isotopes to separate in the rock apart from biological processes? Sensitive measurements of electrical currents in the human brain show that when certain memories or mental processes occur, particular regions of the brain go into action. Can our thoughts, memories, and passions all be generated by particular circuitry of the brain neurons? Might it ever be possible to simulate such circuitry in a robot? Would it ever be feasible to insert new circuits or alter old ones in the brain in such a way as to change opinions, memories, emotions, logical deductions? Is such tampering wildly dangerous? Your theory of the origin of the solar system predicts many flat disks of gas and dust all over the Milky Way galaxy. You look through the telescope and you find flat disks everywhere. You happily conclude that your theory is confirmed. But it turns out the disks you cited were spiral galaxies far beyond the Milky Way and much too big to be nascent solar systems. Should you abandon your theory? Or should you look for a different kind of disk? Or is this just an expression of your unwillingness to abandon a discredited hypothesis? A growing cancer sends out an all-points bulletin to the cells lining adjacent blood vessels. We need blood, the message says. The endothelial cells obligingly build blood vessel bridges to supply the cancer cells with blood. How does this come about? Can the message be intercepted or cancelled? You mix violet, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red paints and make a murky brown. Then you mix light of the same colors and you get white. What's going on? 
In the genes of humans and many other animals, there are long, repetitive sequences of hereditary information called nonsense. Some of these sequences cause genetic diseases. Could it be that segments of the DNA are rogue nucleic acids, reproducing on their own, in business for themselves, disdaining the well-being of the organism they inhabit? Many animals behave strangely just before an earthquake. What do they know that seismologists don't? The ancient Aztec and the ancient Greek words for God are nearly the same. Is this evidence of some contact or commonality between the two civilizations? Or should we expect occasional such coincidences between two wholly unrelated languages merely by chance? Or could, as Plato thought in the Cratylus, certain words be built into us from birth? The second law of thermodynamics states that in the universe as a whole, disorder increases as time goes on. Of course, locally, worlds and life and intelligence can emerge at the cost of a decrease in order elsewhere in the universe. But if we live in a universe in which the present Big Bang expansion will slow, stop, and be replaced by a contraction, might the second law then be reversed? Can effects precede causes? The human body uses concentrated hydrochloric acid in the stomach to dissolve food and aid digestion. Why doesn't the hydrochloric acid dissolve the stomach? The oldest stars seem to be, at the time I'm writing, older than the universe. Like the claim that an acquaintance has children older than she is, you don't have to know very much to recognize that someone has made a mistake. Who? The technology now exists to move individual atoms around. So long and complex messages can be written on an ultra-microscopic scale. It is also possible to make machines the size of molecules. Rudimentary examples of both these nanotechnologies are now well demonstrated. Where does this take us in another few decades? In several different laboratories, complex molecules have been found that under suitable conditions make copies of themselves in the test tube. Some of these molecules are, like DNA and RNA, built out of nucleotides, others are not. Some use enzymes to hasten the pace of the chemistry, others do not. Sometimes there is a mistake in copying. From that point forward, the mistake is copied in successive generations of molecules. Thus, there get to be slightly different species of self-replicating molecules, some of which reproduce faster or more efficiently than others. These preferentially thrive. As time goes on, the molecules in the test tube become more and more efficient. We are beginning to witness the evolution of molecules. How much insight does this provide about the origin of life? Why is ordinary ice white, but pure glacial ice blue? Life has been found miles below the surface of the Earth. How deep does it go? The Dogon people in the Republic of Mali are said by a French anthropologist to have a legend that the star Sirius has an extremely dense companion star. Sirius, in fact, does have such a companion, although it requires fairly sophisticated astronomy to detect it. So, one... Did the Dogon people descend from a forgotten civilization that had large optical telescopes and theoretical astrophysics? Or, two, were they instructed by extraterrestrials? Or, three, did the Dogon hear about the white dwarf companion of Sirius from a visiting European? Or, four, was the French anthropologist mistaken, and the Dogon, in fact, never had such a legend? Why should it be hard for scientists to get science across? Some scientists, including some very good ones, tell me they'd love to popularize but feel they lack talent in this area. Knowing and explaining, they say, are not the same thing. What's the secret? There's only one, I think. Don't talk to the general audience as you would to your scientific colleagues. There are terms that convey your meaning instantly and accurately to fellow experts. You may parse these phrases every day in your professional work but they do no more than mystify an audience of non-specialists. Use the simplest possible language. Above all, remember how it was before you yourself grasped whatever it is you're explaining. Remember the misunderstandings that you almost fell into, and note them explicitly. Keep firmly in mind that there was a time when you didn't understand any of this either. Recapitulate the first steps that led you from ignorance to knowledge. Never forget that native intelligence is widely distributed in our species. Indeed, it is the secret of our success. The effort involved is slight. The benefits great. Among the potential pitfalls are oversimplification, the need to be sparing with qualifications and quantifications, inadequate credit given to the many scientists involved, and insufficient distinctions drawn between helpful analogy and reality. 
doubtless compromises must be made. The more you make such presentations, the clearer it is which approaches work and which do not. There is a natural selection of metaphors, images, analogies, anecdotes. After a while, you find that you can get almost anywhere you want to go, walking on consumer-tested stepping stones. You can then fine-tune your presentations for the needs of a given audience. Like some editors and television producers, some scientists believe the public is too ignorant or too stupid to understand science, that the enterprise of popularization is fundamentally a lost cause, or even that it's tantamount to fraternization, if not outright cohabitation with the enemy. Among the many criticisms that could be made of this judgment, along with its insufferable arrogance and its neglect of a host of examples of highly successful science popularizations, is that it is self-confirming, and also, for the scientists involved, self-defeating. Large-scale government support for science is fairly new, dating back only to World War II, although patronage of a few scientists by the rich and powerful is much older. With the end of the Cold War, the National Defense Trump Card that provided support for all sorts of fundamental science became virtually unplayable. Only partly for this reason, most scientists, I think, are now comfortable with the idea of popularizing science. Since nearly all support for science comes from the public coffers, it would be an odd flirtation with suicide for scientists to oppose competent popularization. What the public understands and appreciates, it is more likely to support. I don't mean writing articles for Scientific American, say, that are read by science enthusiasts and scientists in other fields. I'm not just talking about teaching introductory courses for undergraduates. I'm talking about efforts to communicate the substance and approach of science in newspapers, magazines, on radio and television, in lectures for the general public, and in elementary, middle, and high school textbooks. Of course, there are judgment calls to be made in popularizing. It's important neither to mystify nor to patronize. In attempting to prod public interest, scientists have on occasion gone too far, for example, in drawing unjustified religious conclusions. Astronomer George Smoot described his discovery of small irregularities in the ratio radiation left over from the Big Bang as seeing God face to face. Physics Nobel laureate Leon Lederman described the Higgs boson, a hypothetical building block of matter, as the God particle, and so titled a book. In my opinion, they're all God particles. If the Higgs boson doesn't exist, is the God hypothesis disproved? Physicist Frank Tipler proposes that computers in the remote future will prove the existence of God and work our bodily resurrection. Periodicals and television can strike sparks as they give us a glimpse of science, and this is very important. But, apart from apprenticeship or well-structured classes and seminars, the best way to popularize science is through textbooks, popular books, CD-ROMs, and laser discs. You can mull things over, go at your own pace, revisit the hard parts, compare texts, dig deep. It has to be done right, though. And in the schools especially, it generally isn't. There, as the philosopher John Passmore comments, science is often presented as a matter of learning principles and applying them by routine procedures. It is learned from textbooks, not by reading the works of great scientists or even the day-to-day -day contributions to the scientific literature. The beginning scientist, unlike the beginning humanist, does not have an immediate contact with genius. Indeed, school courses can attract quite the wrong sort of person into science, unimaginative boys and girls who like routine. I hold that popularization of science is successful if, at first, it does no more than spark the sense of wonder. To do that, it is sufficient to provide a glimpse of the findings of science without thoroughly explaining how those findings were achieved. It is easier to portray the destination than the journey. But where possible, popularizers should try to chronicle some of the mistakes, false starts, dead ends, and apparently hopeless confusion along the way. At least every now and then we should provide the evidence and let the reader draw his or her own conclusion. This converts obedient assimilation of new knowledge into personal discovery. When you make the finding yourself, even if you're the last person on earth to see the light, you never forget it. As a youngster, I was inspired by the popular science books and articles of George Gamow, James Jeans, Arthur Eddington, J.B.S. Haldane, Julian Huxley, Rachel Carson, and Arthur C. Clarke. All of them trained in, and most of them leading practitioners of science.
The popularity of well-written, well-explained, deeply imaginative books on science that touch our hearts as well as our minds seems greater in the last 20 years than ever before, and the number and disciplinary diversity of scientists writing these books is likewise unprecedented. Among the best contemporary scientist popularizers, I think of Stephen Jay Gould, E.O. Wilson, Lewis Thomas, and Richard Dawkins in biology, Stephen Weinberg, Alan Lightman and Kip Thorne in physics, Roald Hoffman in chemistry, and the early works of Fred Hoyle in astronomy. Isaac Asimov wrote capably on everything, and while requiring calculus, the most consistently exciting, provocative, and inspiring science popularization of the last few decades seems to me to be Volume 1 of Richard Feynman's Introductory Lectures on Physics. Nevertheless, current efforts are clearly nowhere near commensurate with the public good, and of course, if we can't read, we can't benefit from such works, no matter how inspiring they are. I want us to rescue Mr. Buckley and the millions like him. I also want us to stop turning out leaden, incurious, uncritical, and unimaginative high school seniors. Our species needs and deserves a citizenry with minds wide awake and a basic understanding of how the world works. Science, I maintain, is an absolutely essential tool for any society with a hope of surviving well into the next century with its fundamental values intact. Not just science as engaged in by its practitioners, but science understood and embraced by the entire human community. And if the scientists will not bring this about, who will? Chapter 20. House on Fire The Lord Buddha replied to the Venerable Sariputra, In some village, city, market town, country district, province, kingdom, or capital, there lived a householder, old, advanced in years, decrepit, weak in health and strength, but rich, wealthy, and well-to-do. His house was a large one, both extensive and high, and it was old, having been built a long time ago. It was inhabited by many living beings, some two, three, four, or five hundred. It had one single door only. It was thatched with straw, its terraces had fallen down, its foundations were rotten, its walls, matting screens, and plaster were in an advanced state of decay. Suddenly a great blaze of fire broke out, and the house started burning on all sides, and that man had many young sons, five or ten or twenty, and he himself got out of the house. When that man saw his own house ablaze all around with the great mass of fire, he became afraid and trembled. His mind became agitated, and he thought to himself, I, it is true, have been competent enough to run out of the door and to escape from my burning house quickly and safely without being touched or scorched by that great mass of fire. But what about my sons? my young boys, my little sons. There, in this burning house, they play, sport, and amuse themselves with all sorts of games. They do not know that this dwelling is a fire. They do not understand it, do not perceive it, pay no attention to it, and so they feel no agitation. Though threatened by this great fire, though in such close contact with so much ill, they pay no attention to their danger and make no efforts to get out. From the Sadharma Pundarika, in Buddhist scriptures, Edward Conze, E.D., Penguin Books, 1959. One of the reasons it's so interesting to write for Parade Magazine is feedback. With 80 million readers, you can really sample the opinion of the citizens of the United States. You can understand how people think, what their anxieties and hopes are, and even perhaps where we have lost our way. An abbreviated version of the preceding chapter, emphasizing the performance of students and teachers, was published in Parade. I was flooded with mail. Some people denied there was a problem. Others said that Americans were losing cutting-edge intelligence and know-how. Some thought there were easy solutions. Others, that the problems were too deeply ingrained to fix. Many opinions were a surprise to me. A tenth-grade teacher in Minnesota handed out copies of the article and asked his students to tell me what they thought. Here's what some American high school students wrote spelling, grammar, and punctuation as in the original letters. Not our Americans are stupid. We just rank lower in school, big deal. Maybe that's good that we are not as smart as the other countries. So then we can just import all of our products, and then we don't have to spend all of our money on the parts for the goods. Our society is doing just fine with what discoveries we are making. It's going slowly, but the cure for cancer is coming right along. The U.S. has its own learning system and it may not be as advanced as theirs, but it is just as good. Otherwise, I think your article is a very educating one. Not one kid in this school likes science, 
I really didn't understand the point of the article. I thought that it was very boring. I'm just not into anything like that. I am studying to be a lawyer, and frankly, I do agree with my parents when they say I have an attitude problem toward science. It's true that some American kids don't try, but we could be smarter than any other country if we wanted to. Instead of homework, kids will watch TV. I have to agree that I do it. I have cut it down from about four HRS a day. I don't believe it is the school system's fault. I think the whole country is brought up with not enough emphasis on school. I know my mom would rather be watching me play basketball or soccer instead of helping me with an assignment. Most of the kids I know could care less about making sure they're doing their work right. I don't think American kids are stupid. It's just they don't study hard enough because most of kids work. Lots of people said that Asian people are smarter than American, and they are good at everything, but that's not true. They are not good at sports. They don't have time to play sports. I'm in sports myself, and I feel that the other kids on my team push to you to excel more in that sport than in school. If we want to rank first, we could go to school all day and not have any social life. I can see why a lot of science teachers would get mad at you for insulting their job. Maybe if the teachers could be more exciting, the children will want to learn. If science is made to be fun, kids will want to learn. To accomplish this, it needs to be started early on, not just taught as facts and figures. I really find it hard to believe those facts about the U.S. in science. If we are so far behind, how come Michael Gorbachev came to Minnesota and Montana to control data to see how we run our computers and thing? Around 33 hours for fifth graders. In my opinion, that's too much that's almost as many hours as a full job, practically. So instead of homework, we can be making money. When you put down how far behind we are in science and math, why don't you try tell us this in a little nicer manner? Have a little pride in your country and its capabilities. I think your facts were inconclusive and the evidence very flimsy. All in all, you raised a good point. All in all, these students don't think there's much of a problem, and if there is, not much can be done about it. Many also complained that the lectures, classroom discussions, and homework were boring, especially for an MTV generation beset by attention deficit disorders in various degrees of severity. It is boring. But spending three or four grades practicing once again the addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division of fractions would bore anyone. And the tragedy is that, say, elementary probability theory is within reach of these students. Likewise, for the forms of plants and animals presented without evolution, history presented as wars, dates, and kings without the role of obedience to authority, greed, incompetence, and ignorance, English without new words entering the language and old words disappearing, and chemistry without where the elements come from. The means of awakening these students are at hand and ignored. Since most school children emerge with only a tiny fraction of what they've been taught permanently engraved in their long-term memories, isn't it essential to infect them with consumer-tested topics that aren't boring and a zest for learning? Most adults who wrote thought there's a substantial problem. I received letters from parents about inquisitive children willing to work hard, passionate about science, but with no adequate community or school resources to satisfy their interests. Other letters told of parents who knew nothing about science sacrificing their own comfort so their children could have science books, microscopes, telescopes, computers, or chemistry sets. Of parents teach. In their children, that hard work will get them out of poverty. Of a grandmother bringing tea to a student up late at night still doing homework. Of peer pressure not to do well in school because it makes the other kids look bad. Here's a sampling, not an opinion poll, but representative commentary of other responses by parents. Do parents understand that you can't be a full human being if you're ignorant? Are there books at home? How about a magnifying glass? Encyclopedia? Do they encourage children to learn? Parents have to teach patience and perseverance. The most important gift they can give their children is the ethos of hard work, but they can't just talk about it. The kids who learn to work hard are the ones who see their parents work hard and never give up. My child is fascinated by science, but she doesn't get any in school or on TV. My child is identified as gifted, but the school has no program for science enrichment. The guidance counselor told me to send her to a private school, but we can't afford a private school. There's enormous peer pressure. Shy children don't want to stand out by doing well in science. 
When my daughter reached thirteen and fourteen, her lifelong interest in science seemed to disappear. Parents also had much to say about teachers, and some of the comments by teachers echoed the parents. For example, people complain that teachers are trained how to teach, but not what to teach. That a large number of physics and chemistry teachers have no degree in physics or chemistry and are uncomfortable and incompetent in teaching science. That teachers themselves have too much science and maths anxiety. That they resist being asked questions. Or they answer, it's in the book, look it up. Some complain that the biology teacher was a creationist. Some complain that he wasn't. Among other comments by or about teachers, we are breeding a collection of half-wits. It's easier to memorize than to think. Kids have to be taught to think. The teachers and curricula are dumbing down to the lowest common denominator. Why is the basketball coach teaching chemistry? Teachers are required to spend much too much time on discipline and on social curricula. There's no incentive to use our own judgment. The brass are always looking over our shoulders. Abandon tenure in schools and colleges. Get rid of the deadwood. Leave hiring and firing to principals, deans, and superintendents. My joy in teaching was repeatedly thwarted by militaristic-type principals. Teachers should be rewarded on the basis of performance, especially student performance on standardized nationwide tests, and improvements in student performance on such tests from one year to the next. Teachers are stifling our children's minds by telling them they're not smart enough, for example, for a career in physics. Why not give the students a chance to take the course? My son was promoted even though he's reading two grade levels behind the rest of his class. The reason given was social, not educational. He'll never catch up unless he's left back. Science should be required in all school and especially high school curricula. It should be carefully coordinated with the math courses the students are taking at the same time. Most homework is busy work rather than something that makes you think. I think Diane Ravitch, New Republic, the 6th of March, 1989, tells it like it is. As a female student at Hunter High School in New York City recently explained, I make straight A's, but I never talk about it. It's cool to do really badly. If you are interested in school and you show it, you're a nerd. The popular culture, through television, movies, magazines, and videos, incessantly drums in the message to young women that it is better to be popular, sexy, and cool than to be intelligent, accomplished, and outspoken. In 1986, researchers found a similar anti-academic ethos among both high school and female students in Washington, D.C. They noted that able students face strong peer pressure not to succeed in school. If they did well in their studies, they might be accused of acting white. Schools could easily give much more recognition and rewards to kids who are outstanding in science and math. Why don't they? Why not special jackets with school letters? Announcements in assembly in the school newspaper and the local press local industry and social organizations to give special awards. This costs very little and could overcome peer pressure not to excel. Head Start is the single most effective program for improving children's understanding of science and everything else. There were also many passionate, highly controversial opinions expressed, which at the very least give a sense of how deeply people feel about the subject. Here's a smattering. All the smart kids are looking for the fast buck these days, so they become lawyers, not scientists. I don't want you to improve education. Then there'd be nobody to drive the cabs. The problem in science education is that God isn't sufficiently honored. The fundamentalist teaching that science is humanism and is to be mistrusted is the reason nobody understands science. Religions are afraid of the skeptical thinking at the heart of science. Students are brainwashed not to accept scientific thinking long before they get to college. Science has discredited itself. It works for politicians. It makes weapons. It lies about marijuana hazards. It ignores about the dangers of Agent Orange, etc. The public schools don't work. Abandon them. Let's have private schools only. We have let the advocates of permissiveness, fuzzy thinking, and rampant socialism destroy what was once a great educational system. The school system has enough money. The problem is that the white males, usually coaches who run the schools, would never, and I mean never, hire an intellectual. They care more about the football team than the curriculum, and hire only sub-mediocre, flag-waving, God-loving automatons to teach. What kind of students can emerge from schools that oppress, punish, and neglect logical thinking? Release schools from the stranglehold of the ACLU.
American Civil Liberties Union, NEA, National Education Association, and others engaged in the breakdown of the discipline and competence in the schools. I'm afraid you have no understanding of the country in which you live. The people are incredibly ignorant and fearful. They will not tolerate listening to any new idea. Don't you get it? The system survives only because it has an ignorant, God-fearing population. There's a reason lots of educated people are unemployed. I'm sometimes required to explain technological issues to congressional staffers. Believe me, there's a problem in science education in this country. There is no single solution to the problem of illiteracy in science, or maths, history, English, geography, and many of the other skills which our society needs more of. The responsibilities are broadly shared. Parents, the voting public, local school boards, the media, teachers, administrators, federal, state, and logical governments, plus, of course, the students themselves. At every level, teachers complain that the problem lies in earlier grades, and first-grade teachers can, with justice, despair of teaching children with learning deficits because of malnutrition or no books in the home or a culture of violence in which the leisure to think is unavailable. I know very well from my own experience how much a child can benefit from parents who have a little learning and are able to pass it on. Even small improvements in the education, communication skills, and passion for learning in one generation might work much larger improvements in the next. I think of this every time I hear a complaint that school and collegiate standards are falling, or that a bachelor's degree doesn't mean what it once did. Dorothy Rich, an innovative teacher from Yonkers, New York, believes that far more important than specific academic subjects is the honing of key skills which she lists as confidence, perseverance, caring, teamwork, common sense, and problem-solving, to which I'd add skeptical thinking and an aptitude for wonder. At the same time, children with special abilities and skills need to be nourished and encouraged. They are a national treasure. Challenging programs for the gifted are sometimes decried as elitism. Why aren't intensive practice sessions for varsity football, baseball, and basketball players and inter-school competition deemed elitism? After all, only the most gifted athletes participate. There is a self-defeating double standard at work here nationwide. The problems in public education in science and other subjects run so deep that it's easy to despair and conclude that they can never be fixed. And yet, there are institutions hidden away in big cities and small towns that provide reason for hope, places that strike the spark, awaken slumbering curiosities, and ignite the scientist that lives in all of us. The enormous metallic iron meteorite in front of you is as full of holes as a Swiss cheese. Gingerly, you reach out to touch it. It feels smooth and cold. The thought occurs to you that this is a piece of another world. How did it get to Earth? What happened in space to make it so beat up? The display shows maps of 18th century London and the spread of a horrifying cholera epidemic. People in one house got it from people in neighboring houses. By running the wave of infection back, you can see where it started. It's like being a detective. And when you pinpoint the origin, you find it's a place with open sewers. It occurs to you that there's a life-and-death reason why modern cities have adequate sanitation. You think of all those cities and towns and villages in the world that don't. You get to thinking maybe there's a simpler, cheaper way to do it. You're crawling through a long, utterly black tunnel. There are sudden turns, ups and downs. You go through a forest of feathery things, beady things, big solid round things. You imagine what it must be like to be blind. You think about how little we rely on our sense of touch. In the dark and the quiet, you're alone with your thoughts. Somehow the experience is exhilarating. You examine a detailed reconstruction of a procession of priests climbing up one of the great ziggurats of Sumer, or a gorgeously painted tomb in the Valley of the Kings in ancient Egypt, or a house in ancient Rome, or a full-scale turn-of-the-century street in small-town America. You think of all those civilizations, so different from yours, how if you'd been born into them, you would have thought them completely natural. How you'd consider our society, if you had somehow been told of it, as weird. You squeeze the eyedropper, and a drop of pond water drips out onto the microscope stage. You look at the projected image. The drop is full of life. Strange beings swimming, crawling, tumbling. High dramas of pursuit and escape, triumph and tragedy. This is a world populated by beings far more exotic than in any science fiction movie. 
Seated in the theater, you find yourself inside the head of an 11-year-old boy. You look out through his eyes. You encounter his typical daily crises. Bullies, authoritarian adults, crushes on girls. You hear the voice inside his head. You witness his neurological and hormonal responses to his social environment. And you get to wonder how you work on the inside. Following the simple instructions, you type in the commands. What will the Earth look like if we continue to burn coal, oil, and gas, and double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? How much hotter will it be? How much polar ice will melt? How much higher will the oceans be? Why are we pouring so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere? What if we put five times more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere? Also, how could anybody know what the future climate will be like? It gets you thinking. In my childhood, I was taken to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. I was transfixed by the dioramas, lifelike representations of animals and their habitats all over the world. Penguins on the dimly lit Antarctic ice, Okapi in the bright African veldt, a family of gorillas, the male beating his chest, in a shaded forest glade, an American grizzly bear standing on his hind legs, ten or twelve feet tall, and staring me right in the eye. These were three-dimensional freeze frames captured by some genie of the lamp. Did the grizzly move just then? Did the gorilla blink? Might the genie return, lift the spell, and permit this gorgeous array of living things to go on with their lives as, jaws agape, I watch? Kids have an irresistible urge to touch. Back in those days, the most commonly heard two words in museums were, don't touch. Decades ago, there was almost nothing hands-on in museums of science or natural history, not even a simulated tidal pool in which you could pick up a crab and inspect it. The closest thing to an interactive exhibit that I knew were the scales in the Hayden Planetarium, one for each planet. Weighing a mere 40 pounds on Earth, there was something reassuring in the thought that if only you lived on Jupiter, you would weigh a 100 pounds. But sadly, on the Moon, you would weigh only 7 pounds. On the moon, it seemed you would hardly be there at all. Today, children are encouraged to touch, to poke, to run through a branched contingency tree of questions and answers via computer, or to make funny noises and see what the sound waves look like. Even kids who don't get everything out of the exhibit, or who don't even get the point of the exhibit, usually extract something valuable. You go to these museums and you're struck by the wide-eyed looks of wonder, by kids racing from exhibit to exhibit, by the triumphant smiles of discovery. They're wildly popular. Almost as many of us go to them each year as attend professional baseball, basketball, and football games combined. These exhibits do not replace instruction in school or at home, but they awaken and excite. A great science museum inspires a child to read a book, or take a course, or return to the museum again to engage in a process of discovery, and most important, to learn the method of scientific thinking. Another glorious feature of many modern scientific museums is a movie theater showing IMAX or Omnimax films. In some cases, the screen is ten stories tall and wraps around you. The Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, the most popular museum on Earth, has premiered in its Langley Theater some of the best of these films. To fly brings a catch to my throat even after five or six viewings. I've seen religious leaders of many denominations witness Blue Planet and be converted on the spot to the need to protect the Earth's environment. Not every exhibit and science museum is exemplary. A few still are commercials for firms that have contributed money to promote their products. How an automobile engine works or the cleanliness of one fossil fuel as compared to another. Too many museums that claim to be about science are really about technology and medicine. Too many biology exhibits are still afraid to mention the key idea of modern biology, evolution. Beings develop or emerge, but never evolve. The absence of humans from the deep fossil record is underplayed. We are shown nothing of the anatomical and DNA near identity between humans and chimps or gorillas. Nothing is displayed on complex organic molecules in space and on other worlds, nor about experiments showing the stuff of life forming in enormous numbers in the known atmospheres of other worlds and the presumptive atmosphere of the early Earth. A notable exception, the Natural History Museum of the Smithsonian Institution once had an unforgettable exhibit on evolution. It began with two cockroaches in a modern kitchen with open cereal boxes and other food. Left alone for a few weeks, the place was crowded with cockroaches, buckets of them everywhere, competing for the little food now available 
and the long-term hereditary advantage that a slightly better adapted cockroach might have over its competitors became crystal clear. Also, too, many planetaria are still devoted to picking out constellations rather than traveling to other worlds and depicting the evolution of galaxies, stars, and planets. They also have an insect-like projector always visible which robs the sky of its reality. Perhaps the grandest museum exhibit can't be seen. It has no home. George Awad is one of the leading architectural model makers in America, specializing in skyscrapers. He is also a dedicated student of astronomy who has made a spectacular model of the universe, starting with a prosaic scene on Earth and following a scheme proposed by the designers Charles and Ray Eames, he goes progressively by factors of ten to show us the whole Earth, the solar system, the Milky Way, and the universe. Every astronomical body is meticulously detailed. You can lose yourself in them. It's one of the best tools I know of to explain the scale and nature of the universe to children. Isaac Asimov described it as the most imaginative representation of the universe that I have ever seen or could have conceived of. I could have wandered through it for hours, seeing something new at every turn that I hadn't observed before. Versions of it ought to be available throughout the country, for stirring the imagination, for inspiration, and for teaching. But instead, Mr. Awad cannot give this exhibit to any major science museum in the country. No one is willing to devote to it the floor space needed. As I write, it still sits forlornly, crated in storage. The population of my town, Ithaca, New York, doubles to a grand total of about 50,000 when Cornell University and Ithaca College are in session. Ethnically diverse, surrounded by farmland, it has suffered, like so much of the Northeast, the decline of its 19th century manufacturing base. Half the children at Beverly J. Martin Elementary School, which our daughter attended, live below the poverty line. Those are the kids that two volunteer science teachers, Debbie Levin and Ilma Levine, worried about most. It didn't seem right that for some, the children of Cornell faculty say, even the sky wasn't the limit. For others, there was no access to the liberating power of science education. Starting in the 1960s, they made regular trips to the school, dragging their portable library cart, laden with household chemicals and other familiar items, to convey something of the magic of science. They dreamed of creating a place for kids to go, where they could get a personal, hands-on feel for science. In 1983, Levin and Levine placed a small ad in our local paper inviting the community to discuss the idea. Fifty people showed up. From that group came the first board of directors of the Science Center. Within a year, they secured exhibition space in the first floor of an unrented office building. When the owner found a paying tenant, the tadpoles and litmus paper were packed up again and carted off to a vacant shop. Moves to other empty shops followed until an Ithacan named Bob Leathers, an architect world-renowned for designing innovative community-built playgrounds, drew up and donated the plans for a permanent science center. Gifts from local firms provided enough money to purchase an abandoned lot from the city and then hire an executive director, Charles Troutman, a Cornell civil engineer. He and Leathers traveled to the annual meeting of the National Association of Home Builders in Atlanta. Troutman relates how they told the story of a community eager to take responsibility for the education of its youth and secured donations of many key items such as windows, skylights, and lumber. Before they could start building, some of the old pump house on the site had to be torn down. Members of a Cornell fraternity were enlisted. With hard hats and sledgehammers, they demolished the place joyfully. This is the kind of thing, they said, we usually get into trouble for doing. In two days, they carted away 200 tons of rubble. What followed were images straight out of an America that many of us fear has vanished. In the tradition of pioneer barn raising, members of the community, bricklayers, doctors, carpenters, university professors, plumbers, farmers, the very young and the very old, all rolled up their sleeves to build the science center. The continuous seven days a week schedule was maintained, says Troutman, so that anyone would be able to help any time. Everyone was given a job. Experienced volunteers built stairs, laid carpet and tile, and trimmed windows. Others painted, nailed, and carried supplies. Some 2,200 townspeople donated more than 40,000 hours. Roughly 10% of the construction work was performed by people convicted of minor offenses, 
They preferred to do something for the community than to sit idle in jail. Ten months later, Ithaca had the only community-built science museum in the world. Among the 75 interactive exhibits emphasizing both the processes and principles of science are the Magicam, a microscope that visitors can use to view on a color monitor and then photograph any object at 40 times magnification, the world's only public connection to the satellite-based National Lightning Detection Network, a 6 by 9 feet walk-in camera, a fossil pit seeded with local shale where visitors hunt for fossils from 380 million years ago and keep their finds, an 8-foot-long boa constrictor named Spot, and a dazzling array of other experiments, computers, and activities. Levin and Levine can still be found there, full-time volunteers teaching the citizens and scientists of the future. The DeWitt Wallace Reader's Digest Fund supports and extends their dream of reaching kids who would ordinarily be denied their scientific birthright. Through the fund's nationwide Youth Alive program, Ithaca teenagers receive intensive mentoring to develop their science, conflict resolution, and employment skills. Levin and Levine thought science should belong to everyone. Their community agreed and made a commitment to realize that dream. In the Science Center's first year, 55,000 people came from all 50 states and 60 countries. Not bad for a small town. It makes you wonder what else we could do if we worked together for a better future for our kids. Chapter 21. The Path to Freedom. We must not believe the many who say that only free people ought to be educated, but we should rather believe the philosophers who say that only the educated are free. Epictetus, Roman philosopher and former slave, discourses Frederick Bailey was a slave. As a boy in Maryland in the 1820s, he had no mother or father to look after him. It is a common custom, he later wrote, to part children from their mothers before the child has reached its twelfth month. He was one of countless millions of slave children whose realistic prospects for a hopeful life were nil. What Bailey witnessed and experienced in his growing up marked him forever. I have often been awakened at the dawn of the day by the most heart-rending shrieks of an own aunt of mine, whom the overseer used to tie up to a joist and whip upon her naked back till she was literally covered with blood. From the rising till the going down of the sun he was cursing, raving, cutting and slashing among the slaves of the field. He seemed to take pleasure in manifesting his fiendish barbarity. The slaves had drummed into them, from plantation and pulpit alike, from courthouse and statehouse, the notion that they were hereditary inferiors, that God intended them for their misery. The Holy Bible, as countless passages confirmed, condoned slavery. In these ways, the peculiar institution maintained itself despite its monstrous nature, something even its practitioners must have glimpsed. There was a most revealing rule. Slaves were to remain illiterate. In the antebellum South, Whites who taught a slave to read were severely punished. To make a contented slave, Bailey later wrote, it is necessary to make a thoughtless one. It is necessary to darken his moral and mental vision, and as far as possible, to annihilate the power of reason. This is why the slaveholders must control what slaves hear and see and think. This is why reading and critical thinking are dangerous, indeed subversive, in an unjust society. So now picture Frederick Bailey in 1828, a ten-year-old African-American child enslaved with no legal rights of any kind, long since torn from his mother's arms, sold away from the tattered remnants of his extended family as if he were a calf or a pony, conveyed to an unknown household in the strange city of Baltimore, and condemned to a life of drudgery with no prospect of reprieve. Bailey was sent to work for Capt. Hugh Auld and his wife, Sophia, moving from plantation to urban bustle, from field work to housework. In this new environment, he came every day upon letters, books, and people who could read. He discovered what he called this mystery of reading. There was a connection between the letters on the page and the movement of the reader's lips, a nearly one-to-one -one correlation between the black squiggles and the sounds uttered. Surreptitiously, he studied from young Tommy Auld's Webster's spelling book. He memorized the letters of the alphabet. He tried to understand the sounds they stood for. Eventually, he asked Sophia All to help him learn. Impressed with the intelligence and dedication of the boy, and perhaps ignorant of the prohibitions, she complied. By the time Frederick was spelling words of three and four letters, Captain All discovered what was going on. Furious, he ordered Sophia to stop. In Frederick's presence, he explained, 
A nigger should know nothing but to obey his master, to do as he is told to do. Learning would spoil the best nigger in the world. Now, if you teach that nigger how to read, there would be no keeping him. It would forever unfit him to be a slave. All chastised Sophia in this way, as if Frederick Bailey were not there in the room with them, or as if he were a block of wood. But Ald had revealed to Bailey the great secret. I now understood the white man's power to enslave the black man. From that moment I understood the pathway from slavery to freedom. Without further help from the now reticent and intimidated Sophia Ald, Frederick found ways to continue learning how to read, including buttonholing white schoolchildren on the streets. Then he began teaching his fellow slaves. Their minds had been starved. They had been shut up in mental darkness. I taught them because it was the delight of my soul. With his knowledge of reading playing a key role in his escape, Bailey fled to New England, where slavery was illegal and black people were free. He changed his name to Frederick Douglass, after a character in Walter Scott's The Lady of the Lake, eluded the bounty hunters who tracked down escaped slaves, and became one of the greatest orators, writers, and political leaders in American history. All his life, he understood that literacy had been the way out. For 99% of the tenure of humans on Earth, nobody could read or write. The great invention had not yet been made. Except for first-hand experience, almost everything we knew was passed on by word of mouth. As in the game of Chinese whispers, over tens and hundreds of generations, information would slowly be distorted and lost. Books changed all that. Books, purchasable at low cost, permit us to interrogate the past with high accuracy, to tap the wisdom of our species, to understand the point of view of others, and not just those in power, to contemplate, with the best teachers, the insights, painfully extracted from nature, of the greatest minds that ever were, drawn from the entire planet and from all of our history. They allow people long dead to talk inside our heads. Books can accompany us everywhere. Books are patient where we are slow to understand, allow us to go over the hard parts as many times as we wish, and are never critical of our lapses. Books are key to understanding the world and participating in a democratic society. By some standards, African Americans have made enormous strides in literacy since emancipation. In 1860, it is estimated only about 5% of African Americans could read and write. By 1890, 39% were judged literate by the U.S. Census, and by 1969, 96%. Between 1940 and 1992, the fraction of African Americans who had completed high school soared from 7% to 82%. But fair questions can be asked about the quality of that education and the standards of literacy tested. These questions apply to every ethnic group. A national survey done for the U.S. Department of Education paints a picture of a country with more than 40 million barely literate adults. Other estimates are much worse. The literacy of young adults has slipped dramatically in the last decade. Only 3 to 4 percent of the population scores at the highest of five reading levels. Essentially, everybody in this group has gone to college. The vast majority have no idea how bad their reading is. Only 4 percent of those at the highest reading level are in poverty but 43% of those at the lowest reading level are. Although it's not the only factor, of course, in general, the better you read, the more you make. An average of about $12,000 a year at the lowest of these reading levels, and about $34,000 a year at the highest. It looks to be a necessary, if not a sufficient, condition for making money. And you're much more likely to be in prison if you're illiterate or barely literate. In evaluating these facts, we must be careful not to improperly deduce causation from correlation. Also, marginally literate poorer people tend not to understand ballot initiatives that might help them and their children, and in stunningly disproportionate numbers fail to vote at all. This works to undermine democracy at its roots. If Frederick Douglass as an enslaved child could teach himself into literacy and greatness, why should anyone in our more enlightened day and age remain unable to read? Well, it's not that simple, in part because few of us are as brilliant and courageous as Frederick Douglass, but for other important reasons as well. If you grow up in a household where there are books, where you are read to, where parents, siblings, aunts, uncles, and cousins read for their own pleasure, naturally you learn to read. If no one close to you takes joy in reading, where is the evidence that it's worth the effort? If the quality of education available to you is inadequate, 
if you're taught rote memorization rather than how to think, if the content of what you're first given to read comes from a nearly alien culture, literacy can be a rocky road. You have to internalize, so they're second nature, dozens of upper and lowercase letters, symbols, and punctuation marks, memorize thousands of dumb spellings on a word-by-word -word basis, and conform to a range of rigid and arbitrary rules of grammar. If you're preoccupied by the absence of basic family support or dropped into a roiling sea of anger, neglect, exploitation, danger, and self-hatred, you might well conclude that reading takes too much work and just isn't worth the trouble. If you're repeatedly given the message that you're too stupid to learn, or the functional equivalent too cool to learn, and if there's no one there to contradict it, you might very well buy this pernicious advice. There are always some children, like Frederick Bailey, who beat the odds. Too many don't. But beyond all this, there's a particularly insidious way in which, if you're poor, you may have another strike against you in your effort to read and even to think, too. But beyond all this, there's a particularly insidious way in which, if you're poor, you may have another strike against you in your effort to read and even to think. Andrewian and I come from families that knew grinding poverty, but our parents were passionate readers. One of our grandmothers learned to read because her father, a subsistence farmer, traded a sack of onions to an itinerant teacher. She read for the next hundred years. Our parents had personal hygiene and the germ theory of disease drummed into them by the New York public schools. They followed prescriptions on childhood nutrition recommended by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, as if hay had been handed down from Mount Sinai. Our government book on children's health had been repeatedly taped together as its pages fell out. The corners were tattered. Key advice was underlined. It was consulted in every medical crisis. For a while, my parents gave up smoking, one of the few pleasures available to them in the Depression years, so that their infant could have vitamin and mineral supplements. Anne and I were very lucky. Recent research shows that many children without enough to eat wind up with diminished capacity to understand and learn cognitive impairment. Children don't have to be starving for this to happen. Even mild undernourishment, the kind most common among poor people in America, can do it. This can happen before the baby is born, if the mother isn't eating enough, in infancy or in childhood. When there isn't enough food, the body has to decide how to invest the limited foodstuffs available. Survival comes first. Growth comes second. In this nutritional triage, the body seems obliged to rank learning last. Better to be stupid and alive, it judges, than smart and dead. Instead of showing an enthusiasm, a zest for learning as most healthy youngsters do, the undernourished child becomes bored, apathetic, unresponsive. More severe malnutrition leads to lower birth weights, and in its most extreme forms, smaller brains. However, even a child who looks perfectly healthy but has not enough iron, say, suffers an immediate decline in the ability to concentrate. Iron deficiency anemia may affect as much as a quarter of all low-income children in America. It attacks the child's attention span and memory, and may have consequences reaching well into adulthood. What once was considered relatively mild undernutrition is now understood to be potentially associated with lifelong cognitive impairment. Children who are undernourished even on a short-term basis have a diminished capacity to learn, and millions of American children go hungry every week. Lead poisoning, which is endemic in inner cities, also causes serious learning deficits. By many criteria, the prevalence of poverty in America has been steadily increasing since the early 1980s. Almost a quarter of American children now live in poverty, the highest rate of childhood poverty in the industrialized world. According to one estimate, between 1980 and 1985 alone, more American infants and children died of preventable disease, malnutrition, and other consequences of dire poverty than all American battle deaths during the Vietnam War. Some programs wisely instituted on the federal or state level in America deal with malnutrition. The Special Supplemental Food Program for Women, Infants, and Children, WIC, school breakfast and lunch programs, the Summer Food Service Program, all have been shown to work, although they do not get to all the people who need them. So rich a country is well able to provide enough food for all its children. Some deleterious effects of undernutrition can be undone. Iron repletion therapy, for example, can repair some consequences of iron deficiency anemia. But not all of the damage is reversible. Dyslexia, 
various disorders that impair reading skills, may affect 15% of us or more, rich and poor alike. Its causes, whether biological, psychological, or environmental, are often undetermined. But methods now exist to help many with dyslexia to learn to read. No one should be unable to learn to read because education is unavailable. But there are many schools in America in which reading is taught as a tedious and reluctant excursion into the hieroglyphics of an unknown civilization, and many classrooms in which not a single book can be found. Sadly, the demand for adult literacy classes far outweighs the supply. High-quality early education programs such as Head Start can be enormously successful in preparing children for reading. But Head Start reaches only a third to a quarter of eligible preschoolers. Many of its programs have been enfeebled by cuts in funding, and it and the nutrition programs mentioned are under renewed congressional attack as I write. Head Start is criticized in a 1994 book called The Bell Curve by Richard J. Herrnstein and Charles Murray. Their argument has been characterized by Gerald Coles of the University of Rochester. First, inadequately fund a program for poor children, then deny whatever success is achieved in the face of overwhelming obstacles, and finally conclude that the program must be eliminated because the children are intellectually inferior. The book, which received surprisingly respectful attention from the media, concludes that there is an irreducible hereditary gap between blacks and whites, about 10 or 15 points on IQ tests. In a review, the psychologist Leon J. Kamen concludes that the authors repeatedly fail to distinguish between correlation and causation, one of the fallacies of our baloney detection kit. The National Center for Family Literacy, based in Louisville, Kentucky, has been implementing programs aimed at low-income families to teach both children and their parents to read. It works like this. The child, three to four years old, attends school three days a week along with a parent, or possibly a grandparent or guardian. While the grown-up spends the morning learning basic academic skills, the child is in a preschool class. Parent and child meet for lunch, and then learn how to learn together for the rest of the afternoon. A follow-up study of 14 such programs in three states revealed, one, although all of the children had been designated as being at risk for school failure as preschoolers, only 10% were still rated at risk by their current elementary school teachers. Two, more than 90% were considered by their current elementary school teachers as motivated to learn. Three, not one of the children had to repeat any grade in elementary school. The growth of the parents was no less dramatic. When asked to describe how their lives had changed as a result of the family literacy program, typical responses described improved self-confidence, nearly every participant, and self-control, passing high school equivalency exams, admission to college, new jobs, and much better relations with their children. The children are described as more attentive to parents, eager to learn, and in some cases for the first time, hopeful about the future. Such programs could also be used in later grades for teaching mathematics, science, and much else. Tyrants and autocrats have always understood that literacy, learning, books, and newspapers are potentially dangerous. They can put independent and even rebellious ideas in the heads of their subjects. The British royal governor of the colony of Virginia wrote in 1671, I thank God there are no free schools nor printing, and I hope we shall not have them these next hundred years for learning has brought disobedience and heresy and sects into the world, and printing has divulged them and libels against the best government. God keep us from both. But the American colonists, understanding where liberty lies, would have none of this. In its early years, the United States boasted one of the highest, perhaps the highest, literacy rates in the world. Of course, slaves and women didn't count in those days. As early as 1635, there had been public schools in Massachusetts, and by 1647, compulsory education in all townships there of more than 50 households. By the next century and a half, educational democracy had spread all over the country. Political theorists came from other countries to witness this national wonder. Vast numbers of ordinary working people who could read and write. The American devotion to education for all propelled discovery and invention a vigorous democratic process, and an upward mobility that pumped the nation's economic vitality. Today, the United States is not the world leader in literacy. Many of those judged literate are unable to read and understand very simple material, much less a sixth-grade textbook, an instruction manual, a bus schedule, 
a mortgage statement, or a ballot initiative. And the sixth grade textbooks of today are much less challenging than those of a few decades ago, while the literacy requirements at the workplace have become more demanding than ever before. The gears of poverty, ignorance, hopelessness, and low self-esteem mesh to create a kind of perpetual failure machine that grinds down dreams from generation to generation. We all bear the cost of keeping it running. Illiteracy is its linchpin. Even if we hardened our hearts to the shame and misery experienced by the victims, the cost of illiteracy to everyone else is severe. The cost in medical expenses and hospitalization, the cost in crime and prisons, the cost in special education, the cost in lost productivity, and in potentially brilliant minds who could help solve the dilemmas besetting us. Frederick Douglass taught that literacy is the path from slavery to freedom. There are many kinds of slavery and many kinds of freedom, but reading is still the path. Frederick Douglass After the escape, when he was barely twenty, he ran away to freedom. Settling in New Bedford with his bride, Anna Murray, he worked as a common laborer. Four years later, Douglas was invited to address a meeting. By that time, in the North, it was not unusual to hear the great orators of the day, the white ones, that is, railing against slavery. But even many of those opposed to slavery thought of the slaves themselves as somehow less than human. On the night of the 16th of August, 1841, on the small island of Nantucket, the members of the mostly Quaker Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society leaned forward in their chairs to hear something new, a voice raised in opposition to slavery by someone who knew it from bitter personal experience. His very appearance and demeanor destroyed the then prevalent myth of the natural servility of African Americans. By all accounts, his eloquent analysis of the evils of slavery was one of the most brilliant debuts in American oratorical history. William Lloyd Garrison, the leading abolitionist of the day, sat in the front row. When Douglas finished his speech, Garrison rose, turned to the stunned audience, and challenged them with a shouted question, Have we been listening to a thing, a chattel personal, or a man? A man, a man, the audience roared back as one voice. Shall such a man be held a slave in a Christian land, called out Garrison. No, no, shouted the audience. And even louder, Garrison asked, Shall such a man ever be sent back to bondage from the free soil of old Massachusetts? And now the crowd was on its feet, crying out, No, no, no. He never did return to slavery. Instead, as an author, editor, and publisher of journals, as a speaker in America and abroad, and as the first African American to occupy a high advisory position in the U.S. government, he spent the rest of his life fighting for human rights. During the Civil War, he was a consultant to President Lincoln. Douglas successfully advocated the arming of ex-slaves to fight for the North, federal retaliation against Confederate prisoners of war for Confederate summary execution of captured African-American soldiers, and freedom for the slaves as a principal objective of the war. Many of his opinions were scathing and ill-designed to win him friends in high places. I assert most unhesitatingly that the religion of the South is a mere covering for the most horrid crimes a justifier of the most appalling barbarity, a sanctifier of the most hateful frauds, and a dark shelter under which the darkest, foulest, grossest, and most infernal deeds of slaveholders find the strongest protection. Were I to be again reduced to the chains of slavery, next to that enslavement, I should regard being the slave of a religious master, the greatest calamity that could befall me. I... Hate the corrupt, slave-holding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Compared to some of the religiously inspired racist rhetoric of that time and later, Douglas's comments do not seem hyperbolic. Slavery is of God, they used to say in antebellum times. As one of many loathsome post-Civil War examples, Charles Carroll's The Negro a Beast, American Book and Bible House, taught its pious readers that the Bible and divine revelation, as well as reason, all teach that the Negro is not human. In more modern times, some racists still reject the plain testimony written in the DNA that all the races are not only human, but nearly indistinguishable with appeals to the Bible as an impregnable bulwark against even examining the evidence. It is worth noting, though, that much of the abolitionist ferment arose out of Christian, especially Quaker, communities of the North. 
that the traditional black Southern Christian churches played a key role in the historic American civil rights struggle of the 1960s, and that many of its leaders, most notably Martin Luther King, Jr., were ministers ordained in those churches. Douglas addressed the white community in these words, Slavery fetters your progress. It is the enemy of improvement, the deadly foe of education. It fosters pride. It breeds indolence. It promotes vice. It shelters crime. It is a curse of the earth that supports it, and yet you cling to it as if it were the sheet anchor of all your hopes. In 1843, on a speaking tour of Ireland shortly before the potato famine, he was moved by the dire poverty there to write home to Garrison. I see much here to remind me of my former condition, and I confess I should be ashamed to lift my voice against American slavery, but that I know the cause of humanity is one the world over. He was outspoken in opposition to the policy of extermination of the Native Americans, and in 1848, at the Seneca Falls Convention, when Elizabeth Cady Stanton Asterisk had the nerve to call for an effort to secure the vote for women, he was the only man of any ethnic group to stand in support. On the night of the 20th of February, 1895, more than 30 years after emancipation, following an appearance at a women's rights rally with Susan B. Anthony, he collapsed and died, a true American hero. Asterisk. Years later, she wrote of the Bible in words reminiscent of Douglas's, I know of no other books that so fully teach the subjection and degradation of women. Chapter 22 significance junkies. We also know how cruel the truth often is, and we wonder whether delusion is not more consoling. Henri Poincaré, 1854-1912. I hope no one will consider me unduly cynical if I assert that a good first-order model of how commercial and public television programming work is simply this. Money is everything. In prime time, a single rating point difference is worth millions of dollars in advertising, especially since the early 1980s, Television has become almost entirely profit-motivated. You can see this, say, in the decline of network news and news specials, or in the pathetic evasions that the major networks offered to circumvent a Federal Communications Commission mandate that they improve the level of children's programming. For example, educational virtues were asserted for a cartoon series that systematically misrepresents the technology and lifestyles of our Pleistocene ancestors, and that portrays dinosaurs as pets. As I write, public television in America is in real danger of losing government support, and the content of commercial programming is in the course of a steep long-term dumbing down. In this perspective, fighting for more real science on television seems naive and forlorn. But owners of networks and television producers have children and grandchildren about whose future they rightly worry. They must feel some responsibility for the future of their nation. There is evidence that science programming can be successful and that people hunger for more of it. I remain hopeful that sooner or later we'll see real science skillfully and appealingly presented as regular fare on major network television worldwide. Baseball and soccer have Aztec antecedents. Football is a thinly disguised reenactment of hunting. We played it before we were human. Lacrosse is an ancient Native American game, and hockey is related to it. But basketball is new. We've been making movies longer than we've been playing basketball. At first, they didn't think to make a hole in the peach basket so the ball could be retrieved without climbing a flight of stairs. But in the brief time since then, the game has evolved. In the hands mainly of African-American players, basketball has become, at its best, the paramount synthesis in sport of intelligence, precision, courage, audacity, anticipation, artifice, teamwork, elegance, and grace. Five-foot-three-inch Muggsy Bogues negotiates a forest of giants. Michael Jordan sails in from some outer darkness beyond the free-throw line. Larry Bird threads a precise, no-look pass. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar unleashes a skyhook. This is not fundamentally a contact sport like football. It's a game of finesse. The full-court press passes out of the double-team, the pick-and-roll, cutting off the passing lanes, a tip-in from a high-flying forward soaring from out of nowhere, all constitute a coordination of intellect and athleticism, a harmony of mind and body. It's not surprising that the game has caught fire in America. Ever since National Basketball Association games became a television staple, it seemed to me that it could be used to teach science and mathematics. To appreciate a free-throw average of 0 0.926, 
you must know something about converting fractions into decimals. A layup is Newton's first law of motion in action. Every shot represents the launching of a basketball on a parabolic arc, a curve determined by the same gravitational physics that specifies the flight of a ballistic missile, or the Earth orbiting the sun, or a spacecraft on its rendezvous with some distant world. The center of mass of the player's body during a slam dunk is briefly in orbit about the center of the Earth. To get the ball in the basket, you must loft it at exactly the right speed. A 1% error in gravity will make you look bad. Three-point shooters, whether they know it or not, compensate for aerodynamic drag. Each successive bounce of a dropped basketball is nearer to the ground because of the second law of thermodynamics. Daryl Dawkins or Shaquille O'Neal shattering a backboard is an opportunity for teaching, among some other things, the propagation of shock waves. A spin shot off the glass from under the backboard goes in because of the conservation of angular momentum. It's an infraction of the rules to touch the basketball in the cylinder above the basket. We're now talking about a key mathematical idea, generating n-dimensional objects by moving n-l-dimensional objects. In the classroom, in newspapers, and on television, why aren't we using sports to teach science? When I was growing up, my father would bring home a daily paper and consume, often with great gusto, the baseball box scores. There they were, to me dry as dust, with obscure abbreviations, W, S, S, K, W, L, A, B, R, B, I. But they spoke to him. Newspapers everywhere printed them. I figured maybe they weren't too hard for me. Eventually, I too got caught up in the world of baseball statistics. I know it helped me in learning decimals, and I still cringe a little when I hear, usually at the very beginning of the baseball season, that someone's batting a thousand. But 1.000 is not 1,000. The lucky player is batting one. Or take a look at the financial pages. Any introductory material? Explanatory footnotes? Definitions of abbreviations? Almost none. It's sink or swim. Look at those acres of statistics. Yet people voluntarily read the stuff. It's not beyond their ability. It's only a matter of motivation. Why can't we do the same with maths, science, and technology? In every sport, the players seem to perform in streaks. In basketball, it's called the hot hand. You can do no wrong. I remember a playoff game in which Michael Jordan, not ordinarily a superb long-range shooter, was effortlessly making so many consecutive three-point baskets from all over the floor that he shrugged his shoulders in amazement at himself. In contrast, there are times when you're cold, when nothing goes in. When a player is in the groove, he seems to be tapping into some mysterious power, and when ice cold, he's under some kind of jinx or spell. But this is magical, not scientific thinking. Streakiness, far from being remarkable, is expected, even for random events. What would be amazing would be no streaks. If I flip a penny ten times in a row, I might get this sequence of heads and tails, H H H T H T H H H H, eight heads out of ten, and four in a row. Was I exercising some psychokinetic control over my penny? Was I in a heads groove? It looks much too regular to be due to chance. But then I remember that I was flipping before and after I got this run of heads, that it's embedded in a much longer and less interesting sequence. H H T H T T H H H T H T H H H H T H T T H T H T T. If I'm permitted to pay attention to some results and ignore others, I'll always be able to prove there's something exceptional about my streak. This is one of the fallacies in the baloney detection kit, the enumeration of favorable circumstances. We remember the hits and forget the misses. If your ordinary field goal shooting percentage is 50% and you can't improve your statistics by an effort of will, you're exactly as likely to have a hot hand in basketball as I am in coin flipping. As often as I get 8 out of 10 heads, you'll get eight out of ten baskets. Basketball can teach something about probability and statistics, as well as critical thinking. An investigation by my colleague Tom Gilovich, professor of psychology at Cornell, shows persuasively that our ordinary understanding of the basketball streak is a misperception. Gilovich studied whether shots made by NBA players tend to cluster more than you'd expect by chance. After making one or two or three baskets, players were no more likely to succeed than after a missed basket. This was true for the great and the near great, not only for field goals but for free throws, where there's no hand in your face. Of course, some attenuation of shooting streaks can be attributed to increased attention by the defense to the player with the hot hand. 
In baseball, there's the related but contrary myth that someone batting below his average is due to make a hit. This is no more true than that a few heads in a row makes the chance of flipping tails next time anything other than 50%. If there are streaks beyond what you'd expect statistically, they're hard to find. But somehow this doesn't satisfy. It doesn't feel true. Ask the players or the coaches or the fans. We seek meaning, even in random numbers. We're significance junkies. When the celebrated coach Red Auerbach heard of Gilovich's study, his response was, who is this guy? So he makes a study. I couldn't care less. And you know exactly how he feels. But if basketball streaks don't show up more often than sequences of heads or tails, there's nothing magical about them. Does this reduce players to mere marionettes, manipulated by the laws of chance? Certainly not. Their average shooting percentages are a true reflection of their personal skills. This is only about the frequency and duration of streaks. Of course, it's much more fun to think that the gods have touched the player who's on a streak and scorned the one with a cold hand. So what? What's the harm of a little mystification? It sure beats boring statistical analyses. In basketball and sports, no harm. But as a habitual way of thinking, it gets us into trouble in some of the other games we like to play. Scientist, yes. Mad no giggles the mad scientist on Gilligan's Island as he adjusts the electronic device that permits him to control the minds of others for his own nefarious purpose. I'm sorry, Dr. Nerdnik. The people of Earth will not appreciate being shrunk to three inches high, even if it will save room and energy. The cartoon superhero is patiently explaining an ethical dilemma to the typical scientist portrayed on Saturday morning children's television. Many of these so-called scientists, judging from the programs I've seen, and plausible inference about ones I haven't, such as the mad scientist Toon Club, are moral cripples driven by a lust for power or endowed with a spectacular insensitivity to the feelings of others. The message conveyed to the Moppet audience is that science is dangerous and scientists worse than weird. They're crazed. The applications of science, of course, can be dangerous. And as I've tried to stress, virtually every major technological advance in the history of the human species back to the invention of stone tools and the domestication of fire, has been ethically ambiguous. These advances can be used by ignorant or evil people for dangerous purposes, or by wise and good people for the benefit of the human species. But only one side of the ambiguity ever seems to be presented in these offerings to our children. Where in these programs are the joys of science, the delights in discovering how the universe is put together, the exhilaration in knowing a deep thing well, what about the crucial contributions that science and technology have made to human welfare? Or the billions of lives saved or made possible by medical and agricultural technology? In fairness, though, I should mention that the professor in Gilligan's Island often used his knowledge of science to solve practical problems for the castaways. We live in a complex age where many of the problems we face can, whatever their origins, only have solutions that involve a deep understanding of science and technology. Modern society desperately needs the finest minds available to devise solutions to these problems. I do not think that many gifted youngsters will be encouraged towards a career in science or engineering by watching Saturday morning television or much of the rest of the available American video menu. Over the years, a profusion of credulous, uncritical TV series and specials on ESP, channeling, the Bermuda Triangle, UFOs, ancient astronauts, Bigfoot and the like have been spawned. The style-setting series In Search Of begins with a disclaimer disavowing any responsibility to present a balanced view of the subject. You can see a thirst for wonder here untempered by even rudimentary scientific skepticism. Pretty much whatever anyone says on camera is true. The idea that there might be alternative explanations to be decided among by the weight of evidence never surfaces. The same is true of sightings and unsolved mysteries, in which, as the very title suggests, prosaic solutions are unwelcome, and innumerable other clones. In Search of frequently takes an intrinsically interesting subject and systematically distorts the evidence. If there is a mundane scientific explanation and one which requires the most extravagant paranormal or psychic explanation, you can be sure which will be highlighted. An almost random example, an author is presented who argues that a major planet lies beyond Pluto. His evidence is cylinder seals from ancient Sumer, carved long before the invention of the telescope. 
His views are increasingly accepted by professional astronomers, he says. Not a word is mentioned of the failure of astronomers, studying the motions of Neptune, Pluto, and the four spacecraft beyond, to find a trace of the alleged planet. The graphics are indiscriminate. When an off-screen narrator is talking about dinosaurs, we see a woolly mammoth. The narrator describes a hovercraft. The screen shows a shuttle liftoff. We hear about lakes and floodplains, but are shown mountains. It doesn't matter. The visuals are as indifferent to the facts as is the voiceover. A series called The X-Files, which pays lip service to skeptical examination of the paranormal, is skewed heavily towards the reality of alien abductions, strange powers, and government complicity in covering up just about everything interesting. Almost never does the paranormal claim turn out to be a hoax or a psychological aberration or a misunderstanding of the natural world. Much closer to reality, as well as a much greater public service, would be an adult series, Scooby-Doo Does It for Children, in which paranormal claims are systematically investigated and every case is found to be explicable in prosaic terms. The dramatic tension would be in uncovering how misapprehension and hoax could generate apparently genuine paranormal phenomena. Perhaps one of the investigators would always be disappointed, hoping that next time an unambiguously paranormal case will survive skeptical scrutiny. Other shortcomings are evident in television science fiction programming. Star Trek, for example, despite its charm and strong international and interspecies perspective, often ignores the most elementary scientific facts. The idea that Mr. Spock could be a cross between a human being and a life form independently evolved on the planet Vulcan is genetically far less probable than a successful cross of a man and an artichoke. The idea does, however, provide a precedent in popular culture for the extraterrestrial human hybrids that later became so central a component of the alien abduction story. There must be dozens of alien species on the various Star Trek TV series and movies. Almost all we spend any time with are minor variants of humans. This is driven by economic necessity, costing only an actor and a latex mask, but it flies in the face of the stochastic nature of the evolutionary process. If there are aliens, almost all of them, I think, will look devastatingly less human than Klingons and Romulans, and be at widely different levels of technology. Star Trek doesn't come to grips with evolution. In many TV programs and films, even the casual science, the throwaway lines that are not essential to a plot already innocent of science, is done incompetently. It costs very little to hire a graduate student to read the script for scientific accuracy. But so far as I can tell, this is almost never done. As a result, we have such howlers as Parsec mentioned as a unit of speed instead of distance in the, in many other ways, exemplary film Star Wars. If such things were done with a modicum of care, they might even improve the plot. Certainly, they might help convey a little science to a mass audience. There's a great deal of pseudoscience for the gullible on TV, a fair amount of medicine and technology, but hardly any science, especially on the big commercial networks, whose executives tend to think that science programming means ratings declines and lost profits, and nothing else matters. There are network employees with the title Science Correspondent, and an occasional news feature said to be devoted to science. But we almost never hear any science from them, just medicine and technology. In all the networks, I doubt if there's a single employee whose job it is to read each week's issue of Nature or Science to see if anything newsworthy has been discovered. When the Nobel Prizes in Science are announced each fall, there's a superb news hook for science, a chance to explain what the prizes were given for. But almost always all we hear is something like, may one day lead to a cure for cancer. Today in Belgrade, how much science is there on the radio or television talk shows? or on those dreary Sunday morning programs in which middle-aged white people sit around agreeing with each other. When is the last time you heard an intelligent comment on science by a president of the United States? Why in all America is there no TV drama that has as its hero someone devoted to figuring out how the universe works? When a highly publicized murder trial has everyone casually mentioning DNA testing, where are the primetime network specials devoted to nucleic acids and heredity? I can't even recall seeing an accurate and comprehensible description on television of how television works. By far the most effective means of raising interest in science is television, but this enormously powerful medium is doing close to nothing to convey the joys and methods of science.
while its mad scientist engine continues to huff and puff away. In American polls in the early 1990s, two-thirds of all adults had no idea what the information superhighway was. 42% didn't know where Japan is, and 38% were ignorant of the term Holocaust. But the proportion was in the high 90s who had heard of the Menendez, Bobbitt, and O.J. Simpson criminal cases. 99% had heard that the singer Michael Jackson had allegedly sexually molested a boy. The United States may be the best entertained nation on earth, but a steep price is being paid. Surveys in Canada and the United States in the same period show that television viewers wish there were more science programming. In North America, often there's a good science program in the Nova series of the public broadcasting system, and occasionally on the Discovery or Learning channels, or the Canadian Broadcasting Company. Bill Nye's The Science Guy programs for young children on PBS are fast-paced, feature arresting graphics, range over many realms of science, and sometimes even illuminate the process of discovery. But the depth of public interest in science engrossingly and accurately presented, to say nothing of the immense good that would result from better public understanding of science, is not yet reflected in network programming. How could we put more science on television? Here are some possibilities. The wonders and methods of science routinely presented on news and talk programs. There's real human drama in the process of discovery. A series called Solved Mysteries, in which tremulous speculations have rational resolutions, including puzzling cases in forensic medicine and epidemiology. Ring My Bells Again, a series in which we relive the media and the public falling hook, line, and sinker for a coordinated government lie. The first two episodes might be the Bay of Tonkin incident and the systematic irradiation of unsuspecting and unprotected American civilians and military personnel in the alleged requirements of national defense following 1945. A separate series on fundamental misunderstandings and mistakes made by famous scientists, national leaders, and religious figures. Regular exposés of pernicious pseudoscience and audience participation how-to programs. How to Bend Spoons, Read Minds, Appear to Foretell the Future, Perform Psychic Surgery, Do Cold Reads, and Press the TV Viewer's Personal Buttons. How We're Bamboozled, Learn by Doing. A state-of-the-art computer graphics facility to prepare and advance scientific visuals for a wide range of news contingencies. A set of inexpensive televised debates, each perhaps an hour long, with a computer graphics budget for each side provided by the producers, rigorous standards of evidence required by the moderator, and the widest range of topics broached. They could address issues where the scientific evidence is overwhelming, as on the matter of the shape of the earth, controversial matters where the answer is less clear, such as the survival of one's personality after death, or abortion, or animal rights, or genetic engineering or any of the presumptive pseudosciences mentioned in this book. There is a pressing national need for more public knowledge of science. Television cannot provide it all by itself. But if we want to make short-term improvements in the understanding of science, television is the place to start. Chapter 23. Maxwell and the Nerds. Why should we subsidize intellectual curiosity? Ronald Reagan, Campaign Speech, 1980. There is nothing which can better deserve our patronage than the promotion of science and literature. Knowledge is in every country the surest basis of public happiness. George Washington, addressed to Congress the 8th of January, 1790. Stereotypes abound. Ethnic groups are stereotyped. The citizens of other nations and religions are stereotyped. The genders and sexual preferences are stereotyped. People born in various times of the year are stereotyped. Sun sign astrology and occupations are stereotyped. The most generous interpretation ascribes it to a kind of intellectual laziness. Instead of judging people on their individual merits and deficits, we concentrate on one or two bits of information about them, and then place them in a small number of previously constructed pigeonholes. This saves the trouble of thinking at the price in many cases of committing a profound injustice. It also shields the stereotyper from contact with the enormous variety of people, the multiplicity of ways of being human. Even if stereotyping were valid on average, it is bound to fail in many individual cases. Human variation runs to bell-type curves. There's an average value of any quality, and smaller numbers of people running off in both extremes. Some stereotyping is the result of not controlling the variables, 
of forgetting what other factors might be in play. For example, it used to be that there were almost no women in science. Many male scientists were vehement. This proved that women lacked the ability to do science. Temperamentally, it didn't fit them. It was too difficult. It required a kind of intelligence that women don't have. They're too emotional to be objective. Can you think of any great women theoretical physicists? And so on. Since then, the barriers have come tumbling down. Today, women populate most of the subdisciplines of science. In my own fields of astronomy and planetary studies, women have recently burst upon the scene, making discovery after discovery and providing a desperately needed breath of fresh air. So what data were they missing? All those famous male scientists of the 1950s and 1960s and earlier who had pronounced so authoritatively on the intellectual deficiencies of women. Plainly, society was preventing women from entering science and then criticizing them for it, confusing cause and effect. You want to be an astronomer, young woman? Sorry. Why can't you? Because you're unsuited. How do we know you're unsuited? Because women have never been astronomers. Put so baldly, the case sounds absurd. But the contrivances of bias can be subtle. The despised group is rejected by spurious arguments, sometimes done with such confidence and contempt that many of us, including some of the victims themselves, fail to recognize it as self-serving sleight of hand. Casual observers of meetings of skeptics and those who glance at the list of CSI cop fellows have noted a great preponderance of men. Others claim disproportionate numbers of women among believers in astrology, horoscopes in most women's but few men's magazines, crystals, ESP and the like. Some commentators suggest that there is something peculiarly male about skepticism. It's hard-driving, competitive, confrontational, tough-minded, whereas women, they say, are more accepting, consensus-building, and uninterested in challenging conventional wisdom. But in my experience, women scientists have just as finely honed skeptical senses as their male counterparts. That's just part of being a scientist. This criticism, if that's what it is, is presented to the world in the usual ragged disguise. If you discourage women from being skeptical and don't train them in skepticism, then sure enough you may find that many women aren't skeptical. Open the doors and let them in, and they're as skeptical as anybody else. One of the stereotyped occupations is science. Scientists are nerds, socially inept, working on incomprehensible subjects that no normal person would find in any way interesting, even if he were willing to invest the time required, which, again, no sensible person would. Get a life, you might want to tell them. I asked for a fleshed-out contemporary characterization of science nerds from an expert on 11-year-olds of my acquaintance. I should stress that she is merely reporting, not necessarily endorsing, the conventional prejudices. Nerds wear their belts just under their rib cages. Their short sleeve shirts are equipped with pocket protectors in which is displayed a formidable array of multicolored pens and pencils. A programmable calculator is carried in a special belt holster. They all wear thick glasses with broken nose pieces that have been repaired with band-aids. They are bereft of social skills and oblivious or indifferent to the lack. When they laugh, what comes out is a snort. They jabber at each other in an incomprehensible language. They'll jump at the opportunity to work for extra credit in all classes except gym. They look down on normal people who in turn laugh at them. Most nerds have names like Norman. The Norman Conquest involved a horde of high-belted, pocket-protected, calculator-carrying nerds with broken glasses invading England. There are more boy nerds than girl nerds, but there are plenty of both. Nerds don't date. If you're a nerd, you can't be cool. Also vice versa. This, of course, is a stereotype. There are scientists who dress elegantly, who are devastatingly cool, who many people long to date, who do not carry concealed calculators to social events. Some you'd never guess were scientists if you invited them to your home. But other scientists do match the stereotype, more or less. They're pretty socially inept. There may be proportionately many more nerds among scientists than among backhoe operators or fashion designers or traffic wardens. Perhaps scientists are more nerdish than bartenders or surgeons or short-order cooks. Why should this be? Maybe people untalented in getting along with others find a refuge in impersonal pursuits, particularly mathematics and the physical sciences. Maybe the serious study of difficult subjects requires so much time and dedication that very little is left over for learning more than the barest social niceties. Maybe it's a combination of both. 
Like the mad scientist image to which it's closely related, the nerd scientist stereotype is pervasive in our society. What's wrong with a little good-natured fun at the expense of scientists? If, for whatever reason, people dislike the stereotypical scientist, they are less likely to support science. Why subsidize geeks to pursue their absurd and incomprehensible little projects? Well, we know the answer to that. Science is supported because it provides spectacular benefits at all levels in society, as I have argued earlier in this book. So those who find nerds distasteful, but at the same time crave the products of science, face a kind of dilemma. A tempting resolution is to direct the activities of the scientists. Don't give them money to go off in weird directions. Instead, tell them what we need, this invention, or that process. Subsidize not the curiosity of the nerds, but what will benefit society. It seems simple enough. The trouble is that ordering someone to go out and make a specific invention, even if price is no object, hardly guarantees that it gets done. There may be an underpinning of knowledge that's unavailable, without which no one will ever build the contrivance you have in mind. And the history of science shows that often you can't go after the underpinnings in a directed way either. They may emerge out of the idle musings of some lonely young person off in the boondocks. They're ignored or rejected even by other scientists, sometimes until a new generation of scientists comes along, urging major practical inventions while discouraging curiosity-driven research would be spectacularly counterproductive. Suppose you are, by the grace of God, Victoria, Queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, and defender of the faith in the most prosperous and triumphant age of the British Empire. Your dominions stretch across the planet. Maps of the world are abundantly splashed with British pink. You preside over the world's leading technological power. The steam engine is perfected in Great Britain, largely by Scottish engineers, who provide technical expertise on the railways and steamships that bind up the empire. Suppose in the year 1860 you have a visionary idea, so daring it would have been rejected by Jules Verne's publisher. You want a machine that will carry your voice, as well as moving pictures of the glory of the empire, into every home in the kingdom. What's more, the sounds and pictures must come not through conduits or wires, but somehow out of the air, so people at work and in the field can receive instantaneous inspirational offerings designed to ensure loyalty and the work ethic. The word of God could also be conveyed by the same contrivance. Other socially desirable applications would doubtless be found. So with the Prime Minister's support, you convene the Cabinet, the Imperial General Staff, and the leading scientists and engineers of the Empire. You will allocate a million pounds, you tell them. Big money in 1860. If they need more, just ask. You don't care how they do it. Just get it done. Oh yes, it's to be called the Westminster Project. Probably there would be some useful inventions emerging out of such an endeavor. Spin-off. There always are when you spend huge amounts of money on technology. But the Westminster Project would almost certainly fail. Why? Because the underlying science hadn't been done. By 1860, the telegraph was in existence. You could imagine at great expense telegraphy sets in every home, with people didding and dying messages out in Morse code. But that's not what the Queen asked for. She had radio and television in mind, but they were far out of reach. In the real world, the physics necessary to invent radio and television would come from a direction that no one could have predicted. James Clerk Maxwell was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, in 1831. At age two, he found that he could use a tin plate to bounce an image of the sun off the furniture and make it dance against the walls. As his parents came running, he cried out, It's the sun! I got it with the tin plate! In his boyhood, he was fascinated by bugs, grubs, rocks, flowers, lenses, machines. It was humiliating, later recalled his Aunt Jane, to be asked so many questions one couldn't answer by a child like that. Naturally, by the time he got to school, he was called Dafty, not quite right in the head. He was an exceptionally handsome young man, but he dressed carelessly for comfort rather than style, and his Scottish provincialisms in speech and conduct were a cause for derision especially by the time he reached college, and he had peculiar interests. Maxwell was a nerd. He fared little better with his teachers than with his fellow students. Here's a poignant couplet he wrote at the time. Ye years roll on, and haste the expected time when flogging boys shall be accounted crime. 
Many years later, in 1872, in his inaugural lecture as professor of experimental physics at Cambridge University, he alluded to the nerdish stereotype. It is not so long ago since any man who devoted himself to geometry, or to any science requiring continued application, was looked upon as necessarily a misanthrope, who must have abandoned all human interests, and betaken himself to abstractions so far removed from all the world of life and action, that he has become insensible alike to the attractions of pleasure and to the claims of duty. I suspect that not so long ago was Maxwell's way of recalling the experiences of his youth. He then went on to say, In the present day men of science are not looked upon with the same awe or with the same suspicion. They are supposed to be in league with the material spirit of the age, and to form a kind of advanced radical party among men of learning. We no longer live in a time of untrammeled optimism about the benefits of science and technology. We understand that there is a downside. Circumstances today are much closer to what Maxwell remembered from his childhood. He made enormous contributions to astronomy and physics, from the conclusive demonstration that the rings of Saturn are composed of small particles, to the elastic properties of solids, to the disciplines now called the kinetic theory of gases and statistical mechanics. It was he who first showed that an enormous number of tiny molecules, moving on their own and incessantly colliding with each other and bouncing elastically, leads not to confusion, but to precise statistical laws. The properties of such a gas can be predicted and understood. The bell-shaped curve that describes the speeds of molecules in a gas is now called the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. He invented a mythical being, now Maxwell's demon, whose actions generated a paradox that took modern information theory and quantum mechanics to resolve. The nature of light had been a mystery since antiquity. There were acrimonious learned debates on whether it was a particle or a wave. Popular definitions ran to the style, light is darkness, lit up. Maxwell's greatest contribution was his discovery that electricity and magnetism, of all things, joined together to become light. The now conventional understanding of the electromagnetic spectrum, running in wavelength from gamma rays to X-rays to ultraviolet light to visible light to infrared light to radio waves, is due to Maxwell. So is radio, television, and radar. But Maxwell wasn't after any of this. He was interested in how electricity makes magnetism and vice versa. I want to describe what Maxwell did, but his historic accomplishment is highly mathematical. In a few pages, I can at best give you only a flavor. If you do not fully understand what I'm about to say, please bear with me. There's no way we can get a feeling for what Maxwell did without looking at a little mathematics. Mesmer, the inventor of mesmerism, believed he had discovered a magnetic fluid, almost the same thing as the electric fluid, that permeated all things. On this matter as well, he was mistaken. We now know that there is no special magnetic fluid, and that all magnetism, including the power that resides in a bar or horseshoe magnet, is due to moving electricity. The Danish physicist Hans Christian Oersted had performed a little experiment in which electricity was made to flow down a wire and induce a nearby compass needle to waver and tremble. The wire and the compass were not in physical contact. The great English physicist Michael Faraday had done the complementary experiment. He made a magnetic force turn on and off, and thereby generated a current of electricity in a nearby wire. Time-varying electricity had somehow reached out and generated magnetism, and time-varying magnetism had somehow reached out and generated electricity. This was called induction, and was deeply mysterious, close to magic. Faraday proposed that the magnet had an invisible field of force that extended into surrounding space, stronger close to the magnet, weaker farther away. You could track the form of the field by placing tiny iron filings on a piece of paper and waving a magnet underneath. Likewise, your hair, after a good combing on a low humidity day, generates an electric field which invisibly extends out from your head and which can even make small pieces of paper move by themselves. The electricity in a wire, we now know, is caused by submicroscopic electrical particles, called electrons, which respond to an electric field and move. The wires are made of materials like copper, which have lots of free electrons, electrons not bound within atoms, but able to move. Unlike copper, though, most materials, say wood, are not good conductors. They are instead insulators or dielectrics. In them, 
comparatively few electrons are available to move in response to the impressed electric or magnetic field. Not much of a current is produced. Of course, there's some movement or displacement of electrons, and the bigger the electric field, the more displacement occurs. Maxwell devised a way of writing what was known about electricity and magnetism in his time, a method of summarizing precisely all those experiments with wires and currents and magnets. Here they are, the four Maxwell equations for the behavior of electricity and magnetism in matter. It takes a few years of university-level physics to understand these equations. They are written using a branch of mathematics called vector calculus. A vector, written in boldface type, is any quantity with both a magnitude and a direction. 60 miles an hour isn't a vector, but 60 miles an hour due north on Highway 1 is. E and B represent the electric and magnetic fields. The triangle called a nabla, because of its resemblance to a certain ancient Middle Eastern harp, expresses how the electric or magnetic fields vary in three-dimensional space. The dot product and the cross product, after the nablas, are statements of two different kinds of spatial variation. Vector E and vector B represent the time variation, the rate of change of the electric and magnetic fields. J stands for the electrical current. The lowercase Greek letter RO, RO, represents the density of electrical charges, while epsilon zero, Edo, and mu zero, M no, are not variables, but properties of the substance in which E and B are measured and determined by experiment. In a vacuum, epsilon zero and mu zero are constants of nature. Considering how many different quantities are being brought together in these equations, it's striking how simple they are. They could have gone on for pages, but they don't. The first of the four Maxwell equations tells how an electric field due to electrical charges, electrons, for example, varies with distance. It gets weaker the farther away we go. But the greater the charge density, the more electrons, say, in a given space, the stronger the field. The second equation tells us that there's no comparable statement in magnetism, because Mesmer's magnetic charges, or magnetic monopoles, do not exist. Saw a magnet in half, and you won't be holding an isolated north pole and an isolated south pole. Each piece now has its own north and south pole. The third equation tells us how a changing magnetic field induces an electric field. The fourth describes the converse, how a changing electric field or an electrical current induces a magnetic field. The four equations are essentially distillations of generations of laboratory experiments, mainly by French and British scientists. What I've described here vaguely and qualitatively, the equations describe exactly and quantitatively. Maxwell then asked himself a strange question. What would these equations look like in empty space, in a vacuum, in a place where there were no electrical charges and no electrical currents? We might very well anticipate no electric and no magnetic fields in a vacuum. Instead, he suggested that the right form of the Maxwell equations for the behavior of electricity and magnetism in empty space is this. He set RO equal to zero, indicating that there are no electrical charges. He also set J equal to zero, indicating that there are no electrical currents. But he didn't discard the last term in the fourth equation, which is the time derivative of the electric displacement field, D, multiplied by the product of the magnetic constant, mu zero, and electric constant, epsilon zero, represented as vector E. This term represents the feeble displacement current in insulators. Why not? As you can see from the equations, Maxwell's intuition preserved the symmetry between the magnetic and electric fields. Even in a vacuum, in the total absence of electricity or even matter, a changing magnetic field, he proposed, elicits an electric field and vice versa. The equations were to represent nature, and nature is, Maxwell believed, beautiful and elegant. There was also another more technical reason for preserving the displacement current in a vacuum, which we pass over here. This essentially aesthetic judgment by a nerdish physicist, entirely unknown except to a few other academic scientists, has done more to shape our civilization than any ten recent presidents and prime ministers. Briefly, the four Maxwell equations for a vacuum say, 1. There are no electrical charges in a vacuum. 2. There are no magnetic monopoles in a vacuum. 3. A changing magnetic field generates an electrical field, and 4. Vice versa. When the equations were written down like this, Maxwell was readily able to show that E and B propagated through empty space as if they were waves. 
What's more, he could calculate the speed of the wave. It was just one divided by the square root of epsilon zero times mu zero. But epsilon zero and mu zero had been measured in the laboratory. When you plugged in the numbers, you found that the electric and magnetic fields in a vacuum ought to propagate, astonishingly, at the same speed as had already been measured for light. The agreement was too close to be accidental. Suddenly, disconcertingly, electricity and magnetism were deeply implicated in the nature of light. Since light now appeared to behave as waves and to derive from electric and magnetic fields, Maxwell called it electromagnetic. Those obscure experiments with batteries and wires had something to do with the brightness of the sun, with how we see, with what light is. Ruminating on Maxwell's discovery many years later, Albert Einstein wrote, To few men in the world has such an experience been vouchsafed. Maxwell himself was baffled by the results. The vacuum seemed to act like a dielectric. He said that it can be electrically polarized. Living in a mechanical age, Maxwell felt obliged to offer some kind of mechanical model for the propagation of an electromagnetic wave through a perfect vacuum. So he imagined space filled with a mysterious substance he called the ether, which supported and contained the time-varying electric and magnetic fields, something like a throbbing but invisible jello permeating the universe. The quivering of the ether was the reason that light traveled through it just as water waves propagate through water and sound waves through air. But it had to be very odd stuff, this ether, very thin, ghostly, almost incorporeal. The sun and the moon, the planets and the stars had to pass through it without being slowed down, without noticing. And yet it had to be stiff enough to support all these waves propagating at prodigious speed. The word ether is still in a desultory fashion in use, in English mainly in the adjective ethereal, residing in the ether. It has some of the same connotations as the more modern spacey or spaced out. When in the early days of radio they would say on the air, the ether is what they had in mind. The Russian phrase is quite literally on the ether, via fear. But of course, radio readily travels through a vacuum, one of Maxwell's main results. It doesn't need air to propagate. The presence of air is, if anything, an impediment. The whole idea of light and matter moving through the ether was to lead in another 40 years to Einstein's special theory of relativity, E equals sign Mitzi 2, and a great deal else. Relativity and experiments leading up to it showed conclusively that there is no ether supporting the propagation of electromagnetic waves, as Einstein writes in the extract from his famous paper that I reproduced in Chapter 2. The wave goes by itself. The changing electric field generates a magnetic field. The changing magnetic field generates an electric field. They hold each other up by their bootstraps. Many physicists were deeply troubled by the demise of the luminiferous ether. They had needed some mechanical model to make the whole notion of the propagation of light in a vacuum reasonable, plausible, understandable. But this is a crutch, a symptom of our difficulties in reconnoitering realms in which common sense no longer serves. The physicist Richard Feynman described it this way. Today we understand better that what counts are the equations themselves and not the model used to get them. We may only question whether the equations are true or false. This is answered by doing experiments, and untold numbers of experiments have confirmed Maxwell's equations. If we take away the scaffolding he used to build it, we find that Maxwell's beautiful edifice stands on its own. But what are these time-varying electric and magnetic fields permeating all of space? What do vector E and vector B mean? We feel so much more comfortable with the idea of things touching and jiggling, pushing and pulling, rather than fields magically moving objects at a distance, or mere mathematical abstractions. But, as Feynman pointed out, our sense that at least in everyday life we can rely on solid, sensible physical contact to explain, say, why the butter knife comes to you when you pick it up, is a misconception. What does it mean to have physical contact? What exactly is happening when you pick up a knife or push a swing or make a wave in a waterbed by pressing down on it periodically? When we investigate deeply, we find that there is no physical contact. Instead, the electrical charges on your hand are influencing the electrical charges on the knife or swing or waterbed, and vice versa. Despite everyday experience and common sense, even here there is only the interaction of electric fields, Nothing is touching anything. 
No physicist started out impatient with common-sense notions, eager to replace them with some mathematical abstraction that could be understood only by rarefied theoretical physics. Instead, they began, as we all do, with comfortable, standard, common-sense notions. The trouble is that nature does not comply. If we no longer insist on our notions of how nature ought to behave, but instead stand before nature with an open and receptive mind, we find that common sense often doesn't work. Why not? Because our notions, both hereditary and learned, of how nature works were forged in the millions of years our ancestors were hunters and gatherers. In this case, common sense is a faithless guide because no hunter-gatherer's life ever depended on understanding time-variable electric and magnetic fields. There were no evolutionary penalties for ignorance of Maxwell's equations. In our time, it's different. Maxwell's equations show that a rapidly varying electric field, making vector E large, ought to generate electromagnetic waves. In 1888, the German physicist Heinrich Hertz did the experiment and found that he had generated a new kind of radiation, radio waves. Seven years later, British scientists in Cambridge transmitted radio signals over a distance of a kilometer. By 1901, Guglielmo Marconi of Italy was using radio waves to communicate across the Atlantic Ocean. The linking up of the modern world economically, culturally, and politically by broadcast towers, microwave relays, and communication satellites traces directly back to Maxwell's judgment to include the displacement current in his vacuum equations. So does television, which imperfectly instructs and entertains us. Radar, which may have been the decisive element in the Battle of Britain, and in the Nazi defeat in World War II, which I like to think of as Dafty, the boy who didn't fit in, reaching into the future and saving the descendants of his tormentors. The control and navigation of airplanes, ships, and spacecraft, radio astronomy, and the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and significant aspects of the electrical power and microelectronics industries. What's more, Faraday's and Maxwell's notion of fields has been enormously influential in understanding the atomic nucleus, quantum mechanics, and the fine structure of matter. His unification of electricity, magnetism, and light into one coherent mathematical whole is the inspiration for subsequent attempts, some successful, some still in their rudimentary stages, to unify all aspects of the physical world, including gravity and nuclear forces, into one grand theory. Maxwell may fairly be said to have ushered in the age of modern physics. Our current view of the silent world of Maxwell's varying electric and magnetic vectors is described by Richard Feynman in these words. Try to imagine what the electric and magnetic fields look like at present in the space of this lecture room. First of all, there is a steady magnetic field. It comes from the currents in the interior of the Earth. That is, the Earth's steady magnetic field. Then there are some irregular, nearly static electric fields, produced perhaps by electric charges generated by friction, as various people move about in their chairs and rub their coat sleeves against the chair arms. Then there are other magnetic fields produced by oscillating currents in the electrical wiring, fields which vary at a frequency of 60 cycles per second, in synchronism with the generator at Boulder Dam. But more interesting are the electric and magnetic fields varying at much higher frequencies. For instance, as light travels from window to floor and wall to wall, there are little wiggles of the electric and magnetic fields moving along at 186,000 miles per second. Then there are also infrared waves traveling from the warm foreheads to the cold blackboard. And we have forgotten the ultraviolet light, the X-rays, and the radio waves traveling through the room. Flying across the room are electromagnetic waves which carry music of a jazz band. There are waves modulated by a series of impulses representing pictures of events going on in other parts of the world, or of imaginary aspirins dissolving in imaginary stomachs. To demonstrate the reality of these waves, it is only necessary to turn on electronic equipment that converts these waves into pictures and sounds. If we go into further detail to analyze even the smallest wiggles, there are tiny electromagnetic waves that have come into the room from enormous distances. There are now tiny oscillations of the electric field, whose crests are separated by a distance of one foot, that have come from millions of miles away, transmitted to the Earth from the Mariner 2 spacecraft which has just passed Venus. Its signals carry summaries of information it has picked up about the planets, information obtained from electromagnetic waves that traveled from the planet to the spacecraft. 
there are very tiny wiggles of the electric and magnetic fields that are waves which originated billions of light years away from galaxies in the remotest corners of the universe. That this is true has been found by filling the room with wires, by building antennas as large as this room. Such radio waves have been detected from places in space beyond the range of the greatest optical telescopes. Even they, the optical telescopes, are simply gatherers of electromagnetic waves. What we call the stars are only inferences, inferences drawn from the only physical reality we have yet gotten from them. From a careful study of the unendingly complex undulations of the electric and magnetic fields reaching us on Earth, there is, of course, more. The fields produced by lightning miles away, the fields of the charged cosmic ray particles as they zip through the room, and more, and more. What a complicated thing is the electric field in the space around you. If Queen Victoria had ever called an urgent meeting of her counselors and ordered them to invent the equivalent of radio and television, it is unlikely that any of them would have imagined the path to lead through the experiments of Ampere, Biot, Ersted, and Faraday, four equations of vector calculus, and the judgment to preserve the displacement current in a vacuum. They would, I think, have gotten nowhere. Meanwhile, on his own, driven only by curiosity, costing the government almost nothing, himself unaware that he was laying the ground for the Westminster project, Dafty was scribbling away. It's doubtful whether the self-effacing, unsociable Mr. Maxwell would even have been thought of to perform such a study. If he had, probably the government would have been telling him what to think about and what not, impeding rather than inducing his great discovery. Late in life, Maxwell did have one interview with Queen Victoria. He worried about it beforehand, essentially about his ability to communicate science to a non-expert. But the Queen was distracted, and the interview was short. Like the four other greatest British scientists of recent history, Michael Faraday, Charles Darwin, Pam Dirac, and Francis Crick, Maxwell was never knighted, although Lyle, Kelvin, J.J. Thompson, Rutherford, Eddington, and Hoyle in the next tier were. In Maxwell's case, there was not even the excuse that he might hold opinions at variance with the Church of England. He was an absolutely conventional Christian for his time, more devout than most. Maybe it was his nerdishness. The communications media, the instruments of education and entertainment that James Clerk Maxwell made possible, have never, so far as I know, offered even a mini-series on the life and thought of their benefactor and founder. By contrast, think of how difficult it is to grow up in America without television teaching you about, say, the life and times of Davy Crockett or Billy the Kid or Al Capone. Maxwell married young, but the bond seems to have been passionless as well as childless. His excitement was reserved for science. This founder of the modern age died in 1879 at the age of 47. While he is almost forgotten in popular culture, radar astronomers who map other worlds have remembered. The greatest mountain range on Venus, discovered by sending radio waves from Earth, bouncing them off Venus, and detecting the faint echoes, is named after him. Less than a century after Maxwell's prediction of radio waves, the first quest was initiated for signals from possible civilizations on planets of other stars. Since then, there have been a number of searches, some of which I referred to earlier, for the time-varying electric and magnetic fields crossing the vast interstellar distances from possible other intelligences, biologically very different from us, who had also benefited some time in their histories from the insights of local counterparts of James Clerk Maxwell. In October 1992, in the Mojave Desert, and in a Puerto Rican karst valley, we initiated by far the most promising, powerful, and comprehensive search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI. For the first time, NASA would organize and operate the program. The entire sky would be examined over a ten-year period with unprecedented sensitivity and frequency range. If, on a planet of any of the 400 billion other stars that make up the Milky Way galaxy, anyone had been sending us a radio message, we might have had a pretty fair chance of hearing them. U.S. one year later, Congress pulled the plug. SETI was not of pressing importance. Its interest was limited. It was too expensive. But every civilization in human history has devoted some of its resources to investigating deep questions about the universe. And it's hard to think of a deeper one than whether we are alone. Even if we never decrypted the message contents, the receipt of such a signal 
would transform our view of the universe and ourselves. And if we could understand the message from an advanced technical civilization, the practical benefits might be unprecedented. Far from being narrowly based, the SETI program, strongly supported by the scientific community, is also embedded in popular culture. The fascination with this enterprise is broad and enduring, and for very good reason. And far from being too expensive, the program would have cost about one attack helicopter per year. I wonder why those members of Congress concerned about price tags don't devote greater attention to the Department of Defense, which, with the Soviet Union gone and the Cold War over, still spends, when all costs are tallied, well over $300 billion a year. And elsewhere in government there are many programs that amount to welfare for the well-to-do. Perhaps our descendants will look back on our time and marvel at us, possessed of the technology to detect other beings, but closing our ears because we insisted on spending the national wealth to protect us from an enemy that no longer exists. David Goodstein, a physicist at Caltech, notes that science has been growing nearly exponentially for centuries and that it cannot continue such growth because then everybody on the planet would have to be a scientist and then the growth would have to stop. He speculates that for this reason, and not because of any fundamental disaffection from science, the growth in funding of science has slowed measurably in the last few decades. Nevertheless, I'm worried about how research funds are distributed. I'm worried that canceling government funds for SETI is part of a trend. The government has been pressuring the National Science Foundation to move away from basic scientific research and to support technology, engineering applications. Congress is suggesting doing away with the U.S. Geological Survey and slashing support for study of the Earth's fragile environment. NASA's support for research and analysis of data already obtained is increasingly constrained. Many young scientists are not only unable to find grants to support their research, they are unable to find jobs. Industrial research and development funded by American companies has slowed across the board in recent years. Government funding for research and development has declined in the same period. Only military research and development increased in the decade of the 1980s. In annual expenditures, Japan is now the world's leading investor in civilian research and development. In such fields as computers, telecommunications equipment, aerospace, machine tools, robotics, and scientific precision equipment, the U.S. share of global exports has been declining, while the Japanese share has been increasing. In that same period, the United States lost its lead to Japan in most semiconductor technologies. It experiences severe declines in market share in color TVs, VCRs, phonographs, telephone sets, and machine tools. Basic research is where scientists are free to pursue their curiosity and interrogate nature, not with any short-term practical end in view, but to seek knowledge for its own sake. Scientists, of course, have a vested interest in basic research. It's what they like to do, in many cases, why they became scientists in the first place. But it is in society's interest to support such research. This is how the major discoveries that benefit humanity are largely made. Whether a few grand and ambitious scientific projects are a better investment than a larger number of small programs is a worthwhile question. We are rarely smart enough to set about on purpose making the discoveries that will drive our economy and safeguard our lives. Often we lack the fundamental research. Instead, we pursue a broad range of investigations of nature and applications we never dreamed of emerge. Not always, of course, but often enough. Giving money to someone like Maxwell might have seemed the most absurd encouragement of mere curiosity-driven science and an imprudent judgment for practical legislators. Why grant money now so nerdish scientists talking incomprehensible gibberish can indulge their hobbies when there are urgent unmet national needs? From this point of view, it's easy to understand the contention that science is just another lobby, another pressure group anxious to keep the grant money rolling in so the scientists don't ever have to do a hard day's work or meet a payroll. Maxwell wasn't thinking of radio, radar, and television when he first scratched out the fundamental equations of electromagnetism. Newton wasn't dreaming of spaceflight or communications satellites when he first understood the motion of the moon. Röntgen wasn't contemplating medical diagnosis when he investigated a penetrating radiation so mysterious he called it X-rays. Curie wasn't thinking of cancer therapy when she painstakingly extracted minute amounts of radium from tons of pitchblende. 
Fleming wasn't planning on saving the lives of millions with antibiotics when he noticed a circle free of bacteria around a growth of mold. Watson and Crick weren't imagining the cure of genetic diseases when they puzzled over the X-ray diffractometry of DNA. Roland and Molina weren't planning to implicate CFCs in ozone depletion when they began studying the role of halogens in stratospheric photochemistry. Members of Congress and other political leaders have from time to time found it irresistible to poke fun at seemingly obscure scientific research proposals that the government is asked to fund. Even as bright a senator as William Proxmire, a Harvard graduate, was given to making episodic Golden Fleece Awards, many commemorating ostensibly useless scientific projects, including SETI. I imagine the same spirit in previous governments. A Mr. Fleming wishes to study bugs in smelly cheese. A Polish woman wishes to sift through tons of Central African ore to find minute quantities of a substance she says will glow in the dark. A Mr. Kepler wants to hear the songs the planets sing. These discoveries and a multitude of others that grace and characterize our time, to some of which our very lives are beholden, were made ultimately by scientists, given the opportunity to explore what in their opinion, under the scrutiny of their peers, were basic questions in nature. Industrial applications, in which Japan in the last two decades has done so well, are excellent. But applications of what? Fundamental research, research into the heart of nature is the means by which we acquire the new knowledge that gets applied. Scientists have an obligation, especially when asking for big money, to explain with great clarity and honesty what they're after. The Superconducting Super Collider, SSC, would have been the preeminent instrument on the planet for probing the fine structure of matter and the nature of the early universe. Its price tag was $10 to $15 billion. It was cancelled by Congress in 1993 after about $2 billion had been spent, a worst-of-both-worlds outcome. But this debate was not, I think, mainly about declining interest in the support of science. Few in Congress understood what modern high-energy accelerators are for. They are not for weapons. They have no practical applications. They are for something that is, worrisomely from the point of view of many, called the theory of everything. Explanations that involve entities called quarks, charm, flavor, color, etc. Sound as if physicists are being cute. The whole thing has an aura, in the view of at least some Congress people I've talked to, of nerds gone wild, which I suppose is an uncharitable way of describing curiosity based science. No one asked to pay for this had the foggiest idea of what a Higgs boson is. I've read some of the material intended to justify the SSC. At the very end, some of it wasn't too bad, but there was nothing that really addressed what the project was about on a level accessible to bright but skeptical non-physicists. If physicists are asking for $10 or $15 billion to build a machine that has no practical value, at the very least they should make an extremely serious effort with dazzling graphics, metaphors, and capable use of the English language to justify their proposal. More than financial mismanagement, budgetary constraints and political incompetence, I think this is the key to the failure of the SSC. There is a growing free market view of human knowledge, according to which basic research should compete without government support with all the other institutions and claimants in society. If they couldn't have relied on government support and had to compete in the free market economy of their day, it's unlikely that any of the scientists on my list would have been able to do their groundbreaking research. And the cost of basic research is substantially greater than it was in Maxwell's day, both theoretical and especially experimental. But that aside, would free market forces be adequate to support basic research? Only about 10% of meritorious research proposals in medicine are funded today. More money is spent on quack medicine than on all of medical research. What would it be like if government opted out of medical research? A necessary aspect of basic research is that its applications lie in the future, sometimes decades or even centuries ahead. What's more, no one knows which aspects of basic research will have practical value and which will not. If scientists cannot make such predictions, is it likely that politicians or industrialists can? If free market forces are focused only towards short-term profit, as they certainly mainly are in an America with steep declines in corporate research, is not this solution tantamount to abandoning basic research? Cutting off fundamental, curiosity-driven science is like eating the seed corn. 
We may have a little more to eat next winter, but what will we plant so we and our children will have enough to get through the winters to come? Of course, there are many pressing problems facing our nation and our species, but reducing basic scientific research is not the way to solve them. Scientists do not constitute a voting bloc. They have no effective lobby. However, much of their work is in everybody's interest. Backing off from fundamental research constitutes a failure of nerve, of imagination, and of that vision thing that we still don't seem to have a handle on. It might strike one of those hypothetical extraterrestrials that we were planning not to have a future. Of course, we need literacy, education, jobs, adequate medical care and defense, protection of the environment, security in our old age, a balanced budget, and a host of other matters. But we are a rich society. Can't we also nurture the Maxwells of our time? To take one symbolic example, is it really true that we can't afford one attack helicopter's worth of seed corn to listen to the stars? Chapter 24. Science and Witchcraft. UBI dubium ebi libertas. Where there is doubt, there is freedom. Latin proverb. Asterisk. Written with Andruyan. The following two chapters include more political content than elsewhere in this book. I do not wish to suggest that advocacy of science and skepticism necessarily leads to all the political or social conclusions I draw. Although skeptical thinking is invaluable in politics, politics is not a science. The 1939 New York World's Fair, that so transfixed me as a small visitor from darkest Brooklyn, was about the world of tomorrow. Merely by adopting such a motif, it promised that there would be a world of tomorrow, and the most casual glance affirmed that it would be better than the world of 1939. Although the nuance wholly passed me by, many people longed for such a reassurance on the eve of the most brutal and calamitous war in human history. I knew at least that I would be growing up in the future. The sleek and clean tomorrow portrayed by the fair was appealing and hopeful, and something called science was plainly the means by which that future would be realized. But if things had gone a little differently, the fair could have given me enormously more. A fierce struggle had gone on behind the scenes. The vision that prevailed was that of the fair's president and chief spokesman, Grover Whalen a former corporate executive, New York City police chief, in a time of unprecedented police brutality and public relations innovator. It was he who had envisioned the exhibit buildings as chiefly commercial, industrial, oriented to consumer products, and he who had convinced Stalin and Mussolini to build lavish national pavilions. He later complained about how often he had been obliged to give the fascist salute. The level of the exhibits, as one designer described it, was pitched to the mentality of a twelve-year-old. However, as recounted by the historian Peter Kuznick of American University, a group of prominent scientists, including Harold Urey and Albert Einstein, advocated presenting science for its own sake, not just as the route to gadgets for sale, concentrating on the way of thinking, and not just the products of science. They were convinced that broad popular understanding of science was the antidote to superstition and bigotry, that, as science popularizer Watson Davis put it, the scientific way is the democratic way. One scientist even suggested that widespread public appreciation of the methods of science might work a final conquest of stupidity, a worthy but probably unrealizable goal. As events transpired, almost no real science was tacked on to the fair's exhibits, despite the scientists' protests and their appeals to high principles, and yet some of the little that was added trickled down to me and helped to transform my childhood. The corporate and consumer focus remained central, though, and essentially nothing appeared about science as a way of thinking, much less as a bulwark of a free society. Exactly half a century later, in the closing years of the Soviet Union, Andruyan and I found ourselves at a dinner in Paradel Kino a village outside Moscow where Communist Party officials, retired generals, and a few favored intellectuals had their summer homes. The air was electric with the prospect of new freedoms, especially the right to speak your mind even if the government doesn't like what you're saying. The fabled revolution of rising expectations was in full flower, but despite Glasnost, there were widespread doubts. Would those in power really allow their own critics to be heard? Would freedom of speech, of assembly, of the press, of religion really be permitted? Would people inexperienced with freedom be able to bear its burdens? 
Some of the Soviet citizens present at the dinner had fought for decades and against long odds for the freedoms that most Americans take for granted. Indeed, they had been inspired by the American experiment, a real-world demonstration that nations, even multicultural and multi-ethnic nations, could survive and prosper with these freedoms reasonably intact. They went so far as to raise the possibility that prosperity was due to freedom, that, in an age of high technology and swift change, the two rise or fall together, that the openness of science and democracy, their willingness to be judged by experiment, were closely allied ways of thinking. There were many toasts, as there always are at dinners in that part of the world. The most memorable was given by a world-famous Soviet novelist. He stood up, raised his glass, looked us in the eye, and said, To the Americans, they have a little freedom. He paused a beat and then added, And they know how to keep it. Do we? The ink was barely dry on the Bill of Rights before politicians found a way to subvert it, by cashing in on fear and patriotic hysteria. In 1798, the ruling Federalist Party knew that the button to push was ethnic and cultural prejudice. Exploiting tensions between France and the U.S., and a widespread fear that French and Irish immigrants were somehow intrinsically unfit to be Americans, the Federalists passed a set of laws that have come to be known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. One law upped the residency requirement for citizenship from 5 to 14 years. Citizens of French and Irish origin usually voted for the opposition, Thomas Jefferson's Democratic-Republican Party. The Alien Act gave President John Adams the power to deport any foreigner who aroused his suspicions. Making the president nervous, said a member of Congress, is the new crime. Jefferson believed the Alien Act had been framed particularly to expel C.F. Volney, the French historian and philosopher, Pierre Samuel Dupont de Nemours, patriarch of the famous chemical family, and the British scientist Joseph Priestley, the discoverer of oxygen and an intellectual antecedent of James Clerk Maxwell. In Jefferson's view, these were just the sort of people America needed. The Sedition Act made it unlawful to publish false or malicious criticism of the government or to inspire opposition to any of its acts. Some two dozen arrests were made, ten people were convicted, and many more were censored or intimidated into silence. The act attempted, Jefferson said, to crush all political opposition by making criticism of Federalist officials or policies a crime. As soon as Jefferson was elected, indeed in the first week of his presidency in 1801, he began pardoning every victim of the Sedition Act because, he said, it was as contrary to the spirit of American freedoms as if Congress had ordered us all to fall down and worship a golden calf. By 1802, none of the Alien and Sedition Acts remained on the books. From across two centuries, it's hard to recapture the frenzied mood that made the French and the wild Irish seem so grave a threat that we were willing to surrender our most precious freedoms. Giving credit for French and Irish cultural triumphs, advocating equal rights for them, was in effect decried in conservative circles as sentimental, unrealistic political correctness. But that's how it always works. It always seems an aberration later. But by then we're in the grip of the next hysteria. Those who seek power at any price detect a societal weakness, a fear that they can ride into office. It could be ethnic differences, as it was then, perhaps different amounts of melanin in the skin, different philosophies or religions, or maybe it's drug use, violent crime, economic crisis, school prayer, or desecrating, literally making unholy the flag. Whatever the problem, the quick fix is to shave a little freedom off the Bill of Rights. Yes, in 1942, Japanese Americans were protected by the Bill of Rights, but we locked them up anyway. After all, there was a war on. Yes, there are constitutional prohibitions against unreasonable search and seizure, but we have a war on drugs and violent crime is racing out of control. Yes, there's freedom of speech, but we don't want foreign authors here spouting alien ideologies, do we? The pretexts change from year to year, but the result remains the same, concentrating more power in fewer hands and suppressing diversity of opinion, even though experience plainly shows the danger of such a course of action. If we do not know what we're capable of, we cannot appreciate measures taken to protect us from ourselves. I discussed the European witch mania in the alien abduction context. I hope the reader will forgive me for returning to it in its political context. It is an aperture to human self-knowledge. 
if we focus on what was considered acceptable evidence and a fair trial by the religious and secular authorities in the 15th to 17th century witch hunts, many of the novel and peculiar features of the 18th century U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights become clear, including trial by jury, prohibitions against self-incrimination and against cruel and unusual punishment, freedom of speech and the press, due process, the balance of powers and the separation of church and state. Friedrich von Spee, pronounced Spei, was a Jesuit priest who had the misfortune to hear the confessions of those accused of witchcraft in the German city of Würzburg. See Chapter 7. In 1631, he published Cautio Criminalis, Precautions for Prosecutors, which exposed the essence of this church-state terrorism against the innocent. Before he was punished, he died of the plague, as a parish priest serving the afflicted. Here is an excerpt from his whistleblowing book. 1. Incredibly among us Germans, and especially, I am ashamed to say, among Catholics, are popular superstitions, envy, calumnies, backbiting, insinuations, and the like, which being neither punished nor refuted, stir up suspicion of witchcraft. No longer God or nature, but witches are responsible for everything. 2. Hence everybody sets up a clamor that the magistrates investigate the witches, whom only popular gossip has made so numerous. 3. Princes, therefore, bid their judges and counselors bring proceedings against the witches. 4. The judges hardly know where to start, since they have no evidence, indicia, or proof. 5. Meanwhile, the people call this delay suspicious, and the princes are persuaded by some informer or another to this effect. 6. In Germany, to offend these princes is a serious offense. Even clergymen approve whatever pleases them, not caring by whom these princes, however well-intentioned, have been instigated. 7. At last, therefore, the judges yield to their wishes and contrive to begin the trials. 8. Other judges who still delay, afraid to get involved in this ticklish matter, are sent a special investigator. In this field of investigation, whatever inexperience or arrogance he brings to the job is held zeal for justice. His zeal for justice is also whetted by hopes of profit, especially with a poor and greedy agent with a large family, when he receives a stipend so many dollars per head for each witch burned, besides the incidental fees and perquisites which investigating agents are allowed to extort at will from those they summon. 9. If a madman's ravings or some malicious and idle rumor, for no proof of the scandal is ever needed, points to some helpless old woman, she is the first to suffer. 10. Yet to avoid the appearance that she is indicted solely on the basis of rumor, without other proofs, a certain presumption of guilt is obtained by posing the following dilemma. Either she has led an evil and improper life, or she has led a good and proper one. If an evil one, then she should be guilty. On the other hand, if she has led a good life, this is just as damning, for witches dissemble and try to appear especially virtuous. 11. Therefore the old woman is put in prison. A new proof is found through a second dilemma. She is afraid or not afraid. If she is, hearing of the horrible tortures used against witches, this is sure proof, for her conscience accuses her. If she does not show fear, trusting in her innocence, this too is a proof, for witches characteristically pretend innocence and wear a bold front. 12. Lest these should be the only proofs, the investigator has his snoopers, often depraved and infamous, ferret out all her past life. This, of course, cannot be done without turning up some saying or doing of hers which men so disposed can easily twist or distort into evidence of witchcraft. 13. Any who have borne her ill now have ample opportunity to bring against her whatever accusations they please, and everyone says that the evidence is strong against her. 14. And so she is hurried to the torture, unless, as often happens, she was tortured on the very day of her arrest. 15. In these trials nobody is allowed a lawyer or any means of fair defense, for witchcraft is reckoned an exceptional crime of such enormity that all rules of legal procedure may be suspended, and whoever ventures to defend the prisoner falls himself under suspicion of witchcraft, as well as those who dare to utter a protest in these cases and to urge the judges to exercise prudence, for they are forthwith labeled supporters of witchcraft. Thus everybody keeps quiet for fear. 16. So that it may seem that the woman has an opportunity to defend herself, she is brought into court and the indications of her guilt are read and examined, if it can be called an examination. 17. 
Even though she denies these charges and satisfactorily answers every accusation, no attention is paid, and her replies are not even recorded. All the indictments retain their force and validity, however perfect her answers to them. She is ordered back into prison, there to consider more carefully whether she will persist in obstinacy, for since she has already denied her guilt, she is obstinate. 18. Next day she is brought out again, and hears a decree of torture, just as if she had never refuted the charges. 19. Before torture, however, she is searched for amulets. Her entire body is shaved, and even those privy parts indicating the female sex are wantonly examined. 20. What is so shocking about this? Priests are treated the same way. 21. When the woman has been shaved and searched, she is tortured to make her confess the truth, that is, to declare what they want, for naturally anything else will not and cannot be the truth. 22. They start with the first degree, that is, the less severe torture. Although exceedingly severe, it is light compared to those tortures which follow. Wherefore, if she confesses, they say the woman has confessed without torture. 22. They start with the first degree, that is, the less severe torture. Although exceedingly severe, it is light compared to those tortures which follow. Wherefore, if she confesses, they say the woman has confessed without torture. 24. She is therefore put to death without scruple. But she would have been executed even if she had not confessed. For when once the torture has begun, the die is already cast. She cannot escape. She has perforce to die. 25. The result is the same whether she confesses or not. If she confesses, her guilt is clear. She is executed. All recantation is in vain. If she does not confess, the torture is repeated. Twice, thrice, four times. In exceptional crimes, the torture is not limited in duration, severity, or frequency. 26. If during the torture the old woman contorts her features with pain, they say she is laughing. If she loses consciousness, she is sleeping or has bewitched herself into taciturnity. And if she is taciturn, she deserves to be burned alive, as lately has been done to some who, though several times tortured, would not say what the investigators wanted. 27. And even confessors and clergymen agree that she died obstinate and impenitent, that she would not be converted or desert her incubus, but kept faith with him. 28. If, however, she dies under so much torture, they say the devil broke her neck. 29. Wherefore the corpse is buried underneath the gallows. 30. On the other hand, if she does not die under torture, and if some exceptionally scrupulous judge hesitates to torture her further without fresh proofs or to burn her without her confession, she is kept in prison and more harshly chained, there to rot until she yields, even if it take a whole year. 31. She can never clear herself. The investigating committee would feel disgraced if it acquitted a woman. Once arrested and in chains, she has to be guilty, by fair means or foul. 32. Meanwhile, ignorant and headstrong priests harass the wretched creature so that, whether truly or not, she will confess herself guilty. Unless she does so, they say, she cannot be saved or partake of the sacraments. 33. More understanding or learned priests cannot visit her in prison lest they counsel her or inform the princes what goes on. Nothing is more dreaded than that something be brought to light to prove the innocence of the accused. Persons who try to do so are labeled troublemakers. 34. While she is kept in prison and tortured, the judges invent clever devices to build up new proofs of guilt to convict her to her face, so that when reviewing the trial, some university faculty can confirm her burning alive. 35. Some judges, to appear ultra-scrupulous, have the woman exorcised, transferred elsewhere and tortured all over again, to break her taciturnity. If she maintains silence, then at last they can burn her. Now, in heaven's name, I would like to know, since she who confesses and she who does not both perish alike, how can anybody, no matter how innocent, escape? O oh, unhappy woman, why have you rashly hoped? Why did you not, on first entering prison, admit whatever they wanted? Why, foolish and crazy woman, did you wish to die so many times when you might have died but once? Follow my counsel, and before undergoing all these pains, say you are guilty and die. You will not escape for this were a catastrophic disgrace to the zeal of Germany. 36. When, under stress of pain, the witch has confessed, her plight is indescribable. Not only cannot she escape herself, but she is also compelled to accuse others whom she does not know, whose names are frequently put into her mouth by the investigators or suggested by the executioner, or of whom she has heard as suspected or accused. 
These in turn are forced to accuse others, and these still others, so it goes on. Who can help seeing that it must go on and on? 37. The judges must either suspend these trials and so impute their validity, or else burn their own folk, themselves, and everybody else. For all sooner or later are falsely accused, and if tortured, all are proved guilty. 38. Thus eventually those who at first clamored most loudly to feed the flames are themselves involved, for they rashly failed to see that their turn too would come. Thus heaven justly punishes those who with their pestilent tongues created so many witches and sent so many innocent to the stake. Von Spee is not explicit about the sickening methods of torture employed. Here is an excerpt from an invaluable compilation, The Encyclopedia of Witchcraft and Demonology, by Russell Hope Robbins, 1959. One might glance at some of the special tortures at Bamberg, for example, such as the forcible feeding of the accused on herrings cooked in salt, followed by denial of water, a sophisticated method which went side by side with immersion of the accused in baths of scalding water to which lime had been added. Other ways with witches included the wooden horse, various kinds of racks, the heated iron chair, leg vices, Spanish boots, and large boots of leather or metal into which, with the feet in them, of course, was poured boiling water or molten lead. In the water torture, the question de l'eau, water was poured down the throat of the accused, along with a soft cloth to cause choking. The cloth was pulled out quickly so that the entrails would be torn. The thumbscrews, gressions, were a vice designed to compress the thumbs or the big toes to the root of the nails, so that the crushing of the digit would cause excruciating pain. In addition, and more routinely applied, were the strapado and squassation, and still more ghastly tortures that I will avoid describing. After torture, and with the instruments of torture in plain view, the victim was asked to sign a statement. This was then described as a free confession, voluntarily admitted to. At great personal risk, von Spee protested the witch mania. So did a few others, mainly Catholic and Protestant clergy who had witnessed these crimes at first hand, including Gianfrancesco Ponzinibbio in Italy, Cornelius Luz in Germany, and Reginald Scott in Britain in the 16th century, as well as Johann Mayforth. Listen, you money-hungry judges and bloodthirsty prosecutors, the apparitions of the devil are all lies. In Germany, and Alonso Salazar de Frias in Spain in the 17th century. Along with von Spee and the Quakers generally, they are heroes of our species. Why are they not better known? In A Candle in the Dark, 1656, Thomas Addy addressed a key question. Some again will object and say, If witches cannot kill, and do many strange things by witchcraft, why have many confessed that they have done such murders, and other strange mat terrors, whereof they have been accused. To this I answer, if Adam and Eve in their innocency were so easily overcome and tempted to sin, how much more may poor creatures now, after the fall, by persuasions, promises, and threatenings, by keeping from sleep and continual torture, be brought to confess that which is false and impossible, and contrary to the faith of a Christian to believe? It was not until the 18th century that the possibility of hallucination as a component in the persecution of witches was seriously entertained. Bishop Francis Hutchinson, in his historical essay concerning witchcraft, 1718, wrote, Many a man hath verily believed he hath seen a spirit externally before him, when it hath been only an internal image dancing in his own brain. Because of the courage of these opponents of the witch-mania, its extension to the privileged classes, the danger it posed to the growing institution of capitalism, and especially the spread of the ideas of the European Enlightenment, witch burnings eventually disappeared. The last execution for witchcraft in Holland, cradle of the Enlightenment, was in 1610, in England, 1684, America, 1692, France, 1745, Germany, 1775, and Poland, 1793. In Italy, the Inquisition was condemning people to death until the end of the 18th century, and inquisitorial torture was not abolished in the Catholic Church until 1816. The last bastion of support for the reality of witchcraft and the necessity of punishment has been the Christian churches. The witch mania is shameful. How could we do it? How could we be so ignorant about ourselves and our weaknesses? 
How could it have happened in the most advanced, the most civilized nations then on earth? Why was it resolutely supported by conservatives, monarchists, and religious fundamentalists? Why opposed by liberals, Quakers, and followers of the Enlightenment? If we're absolutely sure that our beliefs are right, and those of others wrong, that we are motivated by good, and others by evil, that the king of the universe speaks to us, and not to adherents of very different faiths, that it is wicked to challenge conventional doctrines, or to ask searching questions, that our main job is to believe and obey, then the witch mania will recur in its infinite variations down to the time of the last man. Note Friedrich von Spee's very first point, and the implication that improved public understanding of superstition and skepticism might have helped to short-circuit the whole train of causality. If we fail to understand how it worked in the last round, we will not recognize it as it emerges in the next. It is the absolute right of the state to supervise the formation of public opinion, said Josef Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda minister. In George Orwell's novel 1984, the Big Brother state employs an army of bureaucrats whose only job is to alter the records of the past so they conform to the interests of those currently in power. 1984 was not just an engaging political fantasy. It was based on the Stalinist Soviet Union, where the rewriting of history was institutionalized. Soon after Stalin took power, pictures of his rival Leon Trotsky, a monumental figure in the 1905 and 1917 revolutions, began to disappear. Heroic and wholly anhistoric paintings of Stalin and Lenin together directing the Bolshevik Revolution took their place, with Trotsky, the founder of the Red Army, nowhere in evidence. These images became icons of the state. You could see them in every office building, on outdoor advertising signs sometimes ten stories high, in museums, on postage stamps. New generations grew up believing that was their history. Older generations began to feel that they remembered something of the sort a kind of political false memory syndrome. Those who made the accommodation between their real memories and what the leadership wished them to believe exercised what Orwell described as doublethink. Those who did not, those old Bolsheviks who could recall the peripheral role of Stalin in the revolution and the central role of Trotsky, were denounced as traitors or unreconstructed bourgeoisie or Trotskyites or Trotsky fascists, and were imprisoned, tortured, made to confess their treason in public, and then executed. It is possible, given absolute control over the media and the police, to rewrite the memories of hundreds of millions of people, if you have a generation to accomplish it in. Almost always, this is done to improve the hold that the powerful have on power, or to serve the narcissism or megalomania or paranoia of national leaders. It throws a monkey wrench into the arrow-correcting machinery. It works to erase public memory of profound political mistakes, and thus to guarantee their eventual repetition. In our time, with total fabrication of realistic stills, motion pictures, and videotapes technologically within reach, with television in every home, and with critical thinking in decline, restructuring societal memories even without much attention from the secret police seems possible. What I'm imagining here is not that each of us has a budget of memories implanted in special therapeutic sessions by state-appointed psychiatrists, but rather that small numbers of people will have so much control over new stories, history books, and deeply affecting images as to work major changes in collective attitudes. We saw a pale echo of what is now possible in 1990-91 to when Saddam Hussein, the autocrat of Iraq, made a sudden transition in the American consciousness from an obscure near-ally, granted commodities, high technology, weaponry, and even satellite intelligence data, to a slavering monster menacing the world. I'm not myself an admirer of Mr. Hussein, but it was striking how quickly he could be brought from someone almost no American had heard of into the incarnation of evil. These days, the apparatus for generating indignation is busy elsewhere. How confident are we that the power to drive and determine public opinion will always reside in responsible hands. Another contemporary example is the war on drugs, where the government and munificently funded civic groups systematically distort and even invent scientific evidence of adverse effects, especially of marijuana, and in which no public official is permitted even to raise the topic for open discussion. But it's hard to keep potent historical truths bottled up forever. New data repositories are uncovered. New, less ideological generations of historians grow up. In the late 1980s and before, 
Andruyan and I would routinely smuggle copies of Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution into the USSR, so our colleagues could know a little about their own political beginnings. By the 50th anniversary of the murder of Trotsky, Stalin's assassin had cracked Trotsky's head open with a hammer. Izvestia could extol Trotsky as a great and irreproachable asterisk revolutionary, and a German communist publication went so far as to describe him as fighting for all of us who love human civilization, for whom this civilization is our nationality. His murderer tried, in killing him, to kill this civilization. This was a man who had in his head the most valuable and best organized brain that was ever crushed by a hammer. Trends working at least marginally towards the implantation of a very narrow range of attitudes, memories and opinions include control of major television networks and newspapers by a small number of similarly motivated powerful corporations and individuals, the disappearance of competitive daily newspapers in many cities, the replacement of substantive debate by sleaze in political campaigns, and episodic erosion of the principle of the separation of powers. It is estimated by the American media expert Ben Bagditrian, that fewer than two dozen corporations control more than half of the global business in daily newspapers, magazines, television, books, and movies. The proliferation of cable television channels, cheap long-distance telephone calls, fax machines, computer bulletin boards and networks, inexpensive computer self-publishing and surviving instances of the traditional liberal arts university curriculum are trends that might work in the opposite direction. It's hard to tell how it's going to turn out. The business of skepticism is to be dangerous. Skepticism challenges established institutions. If we teach everybody, including, say, high school students, habits of skeptical thought, they will probably not restrict their skepticism to UFOs, aspirin commercials, and 35,000-year-old channelese. Maybe they'll start asking awkward questions about economic or social or political or religious institutions. Perhaps they'll challenge the opinions of those in power. Then where would we be? Ethnocentrism, xenophobia, and nationalism are these days rife in many parts of the world. Government repression of unpopular views is still widespread. False or misleading memories are inculcated. For the defenders of such attitudes, science is disturbing. It claims access to truths that are largely independent of ethnic or cultural biases. By its very nature, science transcends national boundaries. Put scientists working in the same field of study together in a room, and even if they share no common spoken language, they will find a way to communicate. Science itself is a transnational language. Scientists are naturally cosmopolitan in attitude and are more likely to see through efforts to divide the human family into many small and warring factions. There is no national science, said the Russian playwright Anton Chekhov, just as there is no national multiplication table. Likewise, for many, there is no such thing as a national religion, although the religion of nationalism has millions of adherents. In disproportionate numbers, scientists are found in the ranks of social critics, or, less charitably, dissidents, challenging the policies and myths of their own nations. The heroic names of the physicists Andrei Sakharov Asterisk in the former USSR, Albert Einstein and Leo Szilard in the United States, and Fang Liju in China spring readily enough to mind, the first and last risking their lives. Especially in the aftermath of the invention of nuclear weapons, scientists have been portrayed as ethical cretins. This is an injustice, considering all those who sometimes, at considerable personal peril, have spoken out against their own country's misapplications of science and technology. For example, the chemist Linus Pauling, 1901-94, was, more than any other person, responsible for the Limited Test Ban Treaty of 1963, which halted above-ground explosions of nuclear weapons by the United States, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom. He mounted a blistering campaign of moral outrage and scientific data, made more credible by the fact that he was a Nobel laureate. In the American press, he was generally vilified for his troubles, and in the 1950s the State Department cancelled his passport, because he had been insufficiently anti-communist. His Nobel Prize was awarded for the application of quantum mechanical insights, resonances, and what is called hybridization of orbitals, to explain the nature of the chemical bond that joins atoms together into molecules. These ideas are now the bread and butter of modern chemistry. But in the Soviet Union, 
Pauling's work on structural chemistry was denounced as incompatible with dialectical materialism and declared off-limits to Soviet chemists, undaunted by this criticism East and West, indeed, not even slowed down. He went on to do monumental work on how anesthetics work, identified the cause of sickle cell anemia, a single nucleotide substitution in DNA, and showed how the evolutionary history of life might be read by comparing the DNAs of various organisms. He was hot on the trail of the structure of DNA. Watson and Crick were consciously rushing to get there before Pauling. The verdict on his assessment of vitamin C is apparently still out. That man is a real genius, was Albert Einstein's assessment. In all this time, he continued to work for peace and amity. When Anne and I once asked Pauling about the roots of his dedication to social issues, he gave a memorable reply. I did it to be worthy of the respect of my wife, Helen Ava Pauling. He won a second Nobel Prize, this one in peace, for his work on the nuclear test ban, becoming the only person in history to win two unshared Nobel Prizes. There were some who saw Pauling as a troublemaker. Those unhappy about social change may be tempted to view science itself with suspicion. Technology is safe, they tend to think, readily guided and controlled by industry and government. But pure science, science for its own sake, science is curiosity, science that might lead anywhere and challenge anything, that's another story. Certain areas of pure science are the unique pathway to future technologies, true enough, but the attitudes of science, if applied broadly, can be perceived as dangerous. Through salaries, social pressures, and the distribution of prestige and awards, societies try to herd scientists into some reasonably safe middle ground between too little long-term technological progress and too much short-term social criticism. Unlike Pauling, many scientists consider their job to be science, narrowly defined, and believe that engaging in politics or social criticism is not just a distraction from, but antithetical to the scientific life. As mentioned earlier, during the Manhattan Project, the successful World War II U.S. effort to build nuclear weapons before the Nazis did, certain participating scientists began to have reservations, the more so when it became clear how immensely powerful these weapons were. Some, such as Leo Szilard, James Frank, Harold Urey, and Robert R. Wilson, tried to call the attention of political leaders and the public, especially after the Nazis were defeated, to the dangers of the forthcoming arms race which they foresaw very well with the Soviet Union. Others argued that policy matters were outside their jurisdiction. I was put on earth to make certain discoveries, said Enrico Fermi, and what the political leaders do with them is not my business. But even so, Fermi was so appalled by the dangers of the thermonuclear weapon Edward Teller was advocating that he co-authored a famous document urging the United States not to build it, calling it evil. Jeremy Stone, the president of the Federation of American Scientists, has described Teller, whose efforts to justify thermonuclear weapons I described in a previous chapter, in these words, Edward Teller, insisted at first for personal intellectual reasons and later for geopolitical reasons, that a hydrogen bomb be built. Using tactics of exaggeration and even smear, he successfully manipulated the policymaking process for five decades denouncing all manner of arms control measures and promoting arms race escalating programs of many kinds. The Soviet Union, hearing of his H-bomb project, built its own H-bomb. As a direct consequence of the unusual personality of this particular individual and of the power of the H-bomb, the world may have risked a level of annihilation that might not otherwise have transpired or might have come later and under better political controls. If so, no scientist has ever had more influence on the risks that humanity has run than Edward Teller, and Teller's general behavior throughout the arms race was reprehensible. Edward Teller's fixation on the H-bomb may have led him to do more to imperil life on this planet than any other individual in our species. Compared to Teller, the leaders of Western atomic science were frequently babes in the political woods, their leadership having been determined by their professional skills rather than by, in this case, their political skills. My purpose here is not to castigate a scientist for succumbing to very human passions, but to reiterate that new imperative. The unprecedented powers that science now makes available must be accompanied by unprecedented levels of ethical focus and concern by the scientific community, as well as the most broadly based public education into the importance of science and democracy. Chapter 25. 
Real Patriots Ask Questions, written with Andruyan. It is not the function of our government to keep the citizen from falling into error. It is the function of the citizen to keep the government from falling into error. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson, 1950. It is a fact of life on our beleaguered little planet that widespread torture, famine, and governmental criminal irresponsibility are much more likely to be found in tyrannical than in democratic governments. Why? Because the rulers of the former are much less likely to be thrown out of office for their misdeeds than the rulers of the latter. This is error-correcting machinery in politics. The methods of science, with all its imperfections, can be used to improve social, political, and economic systems. And this is, I think, true no matter what criterion of improvement is adopted. How is this possible if science is based on experiment? Humans are not electrons or laboratory rats. But every act of Congress, every Supreme Court decision, every presidential national security directive, every change in the prime rate is an experiment. Every shift in economic policy, every increase or decrease in funding for Head Start, every toughening of criminal sentences is an experiment. Exchanging needles, making condoms freely, available or decriminalizing marijuana are all experiments. Doing nothing to help Abyssinia against Italy or to prevent Nazi Germany from invading the Rhineland was an experiment. Communism in Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, and China was an experiment. Privatizing mental health care or prisons is an experiment. Japan and West Germany investing a great deal in science and technology and next to nothing on defense and finding that their economies boomed was an experiment. Handguns are available for self-protection in Seattle, but not in nearby Vancouver, Canada. Handgun killings are five times more common in Seattle, and the handgun suicide rate is ten times greater in Seattle. Guns make impulsive killing easy. This is also an experiment. In almost all of these cases, adequate control experiments are not performed, or variables are insufficiently separated. Nevertheless, to a certain and often useful degree, such ideas can be tested. The great waste would be to ignore the results of social experiments, because they seem to be ideologically unpalatable. There is no nation on earth today optimized for the middle of the 21st century. We face an abundance of subtle and complex problems. We need, therefore, subtle and complex solutions. Since there is no deductive theory of social organization, our only recourse is scientific experiment, trying out sometimes on small scales community, city, and state level, say, a wide range of alternatives. One of the perquisites of power on becoming prime minister in China in the 5th century BC was that you got to construct a model state in your home district or province. It was Confucius's chief life failing, he lamented, that he never got to try. Even a casual scrutiny of history reveals that we humans have a sad tendency to make the same mistakes again and again. We're afraid of strangers or anybody who's a little different from us. When we get scared, we start pushing people around. We have readily accessible buttons that release powerful emotions when pressed. We can be manipulated into utter senselessness by clever politicians. Give us the right kind of leader, and like the most suggestible subjects of the hypnotherapists, we'll gladly do just about anything he wants, even things we know to be wrong. The framers of the Constitution were students of history. In recognition of the human condition, they sought to invent a means that would keep us free in spite of ourselves. Some of the opponents of the U.S. Constitution insisted that it would never work, that a Republican form of government spanning a land with such dissimilar climates, economies, morals, politics, and peoples, as Governor George Clinton of New York said, was impossible, that such a government and such a Constitution, as Patrick Henry of Virginia declared, contradicts all the experience of the world. The experiment was tried anyway. Scientific findings and attitudes were common in those who invented the United States. The supreme authority, outranking any personal opinion, any book, any revelation, was, as the Declaration of Independence puts it, the laws of nature and of nature's G.O.D. Dr. Benjamin Franklin was revered in Europe and America as the founder of the new field of electrical physics. At the Constitutional Convention of 1789, John Adams repeatedly appealed to the analogy of mechanical balance in machines, others to William Harvey's discovery of the circulation of the blood. Late in life, Adams wrote, All mankind are chemists from their cradles to their graves. The material universe is a chemical experiment. 
James Madison used chemical and biological metaphors in the Federalist Papers. The American revolutionaries were creatures of the European Enlightenment, which provides an essential background for understanding the origins and purpose of the United States. Science and its philosophical corollaries, wrote the American historian Clinton Rossiter, were perhaps the most important intellectual force shaping the destiny of 18th century America. Franklin was only one of a number of forward-looking colonists who recognized the kinship of scientific method and democratic procedure. Free inquiry, free exchange of information, optimism, self-criticism, pragmatism, objectivity, all these ingredients of the coming republic were already active in the republic of science that flourished in the 18th century. Thomas Jefferson was a scientist. That's how he described himself. When you visit his home at Monticello, Virginia, the moment you enter its portals, you find ample evidence of his scientific interests, not just in his immense and varied library, but in copying machines, automatic doors, telescopes, and other instruments, some at the cutting edge of early 19th century technology. Some he invented, some he copied, some he purchased. He compared the plants and animals in America with Europe's uncovered fossils, used the calculus in the design of a new plow. He mastered Newtonian physics. Nature destined him, he said, to be a scientist, but there were no opportunities for scientists in pre-revolutionary Virginia. Other, more urgent needs took precedence. He threw himself into the historic events that were transpiring around him. Once independence was won, he said, later generations could devote themselves to science and scholarship. Jefferson was an early hero of mine, not because of his scientific interests, although they very much helped to mold his political philosophy, but because he, almost more than anyone else, was responsible for the spread of democracy throughout the world. The idea, breathtaking, radical, and revolutionary at the time, in many places in the world it still is, is that not kings, not priests, not big city bosses, not dictators, not a military cabal, not a de facto conspiracy of the wealthy, but ordinary people working together, are to rule the nations. Not only was Jefferson a leading theoretician of this cause, he was also involved in the most practical way, helping to bring about the great American political experiment that has, all over the world, been admired and emulated since. He died at Monticello on the 4th of July, 1826, fifty years to the day after the colonies issued that stirring document, written by Jefferson, called the Declaration of Independence. It was denounced by conservatives worldwide, monarchy, aristocracy, and state-supported religion. That's what conservatives were defending then. In a letter composed a few days before his death, he wrote that it was the light of science that had demonstrated that the mass of mankind has not been born with saddles on their backs, nor were a favored few born booted and spurred. He had written in the Declaration of Independence that we all must have the same opportunities, the same unalienable rights. And if the definition of all was disgracefully incomplete in 1776, the spirit of the Declaration was generous enough that today all is far more inclusive. Jefferson was a student of history, not just the compliant and safe history that praises our own time or country or ethnic group, but the real history of real humans, our weaknesses as well as our strengths. History taught him that the rich and powerful will steal and oppress if given half a chance. He described the governments of Europe, which he saw at first hand as the American ambassador to France. Under the pretense of government, he said, they had divided their nations into two classes, wolves and sheep. Jefferson taught that every government degenerates when it is left to the rulers alone, because rulers, by the very act of ruling, misuse the public trust. The people themselves, he said, are the only prudent repository of power. But he worried that the people, and the argument goes back to Thucydides and Aristotle, are easily misled. So he advocated safeguards, insurance policies. One was the constitutional separation of powers. Accordingly, various groups, some pursuing their own selfish interests, balance one another, preventing any one of them from running away with the country, the executive, legislative, and judicial branches, the House and the Senate, the states and the federal government. He also stressed passionately and repeatedly that it was essential for the people to understand the risks and benefits of government, to educate themselves, and to involve themselves in the political process. 
Without that, he said, the wolves will take over. Here's how he put it in notes on Virginia, stressing how the powerful and unscrupulous find zones of vulnerability they can exploit, and every government on earth is some trace of human weakness, some germ of corruption and degeneracy, which cunning will discover and wickedness insensibly open, cultivate, and improve. Every government degenerates when trusted to the rulers of the people alone. The people themselves, therefore, are its only safe depositories. And to render even them safe, their minds must be improved. Jefferson had little to do with the actual writing of the U.S. Constitution. As it was being formulated, he was serving as American minister to France. When he read its provisions, he was pleased, but with two reservations. One deficiency. No limit was provided on the number of terms the president could serve. This, Jefferson feared, was a way for a president to become a king, in fact, if not in law. The other major deficiency was the absence of a Bill of Rights. The citizen, the average person, was insufficiently protected, Jefferson thought, from the inevitable abuses of those in power he advocated freedom of speech, in part so that even wildly unpopular views could be expressed, so that deviations from the conventional wisdom could be offered for consideration. Personally, he was an extremely amiable man, reluctant to criticize even his sworn enemies. He displayed a bust of his arch-adversary Alexander Hamilton in the vestibule at Monticello. Nevertheless, he believed that the habit of skepticism is an essential prerequisite for responsible citizenship. He argued that the cost of education is trivial compared to the cost of ignorance, of leaving the government to the wolves, he taught that the country is safe only when the people rule. Part of the duty of citizenship is not to be intimidated into conformity. I wish that the oath of citizenship taken by recent immigrants and the pledge that students routinely recite included something like, I promise to question everything my leaders tell me. That would be really to Thomas Jefferson's point. I promise to use my critical faculties. I promise to develop my independence of thought. I promise to educate myself so I can make my own judgments. I also wish that the Pledge of Allegiance were directed at the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, as it is when the President takes his oath of office, rather than to the flag and the nation. When we consider the founders of our nation, Jefferson, Washington, Samuel and John Adams, Madison and Monroe, Benjamin Franklin, Tom Paine and many others, we have before us a list of at least ten and maybe even dozens of great political leaders. They were well-educated, products of the European Enlightenment. They were students of history. They knew human fallibility and weakness and corruptibility. They were fluent in the English language. They wrote their own speeches. They were realistic and practical, and at the same time motivated by high principles. They were not checking the pollsters on what to think this week. They knew what to think. They were comfortable with long-term thinking, planning even further ahead than the next election. They were self-sufficient not requiring careers as politicians or lobbyists to make a living, they were able to bring out the best in us. They were interested in, and at least two of them, fluent in science. They attempted to set a course for the United States into the far future, not so much by establishing laws as by setting limits on what kinds of laws could be passed. The Constitution and its Bill of Rights have done remarkably well, constituting, despite human weaknesses, a machine able, more often than not, to correct its own trajectory. At that time, there were only about two and a half million citizens of the United States. Today, there are about a hundred times more. So if there were ten people of the caliber of Thomas Jefferson then, there ought to be ten X 100 equal sign 1,000 Thomas Jeffersons today. Where are they? One reason the Constitution is a daring and courageous document is that it allows for continuing change, even of the form of government itself, if the people so wish. Because no one is wise enough to foresee which ideas may answer urgent societal needs, even if they're counterintuitive and have been troubling in the past, this document tries to guarantee the fullest and freest expression of views. There is, of course, a price. Most of us are for freedom of expression when there's a danger that our own views will be suppressed. We're not all that upset, though, when views we despise encounter a little censorship here and there. But within certain narrowly circumscribed limits, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes's famous example was causing panic by falsely crying fire in a crowded theater. Great liberties are permitted in America. Gun collectors are free to use portraits of the Chief Justice, the Speaker of the House, 
or the director of the FBI for target practice. Outraged civic-minded citizens are free to burn in effigy the President of the United States. Even if they mock Judeo-Christian Islamic values, even if they ridicule everything most of us hold dear, devil worshippers, if there are any, are entitled to practice their religion, so long as they break no constitutionally valid law. A purported scientific article or popular book asserting the superiority of one race over another may not be censored by the government, no matter how pernicious it is. The cure for a fallacious argument is a better argument, not the suppression of ideas. Individuals may, if they wish, praise the lives and politics of such undisputed mass murderers as Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, and Mao Zedong. Even detestable opinions have a right to be heard. Individuals or groups are free to argue that a Jewish or Masonic conspiracy is taking over the world, or that the federal government is in league with the devil. The system founded by Jefferson, Madison, and their colleagues offers means of expression to those who do not understand its origins and wish to replace it by something very different. For example, Tom Clark, Attorney General and therefore Chief Law Enforcement Officer of the United States, in 1948 offered this suggestion. Those who do not believe in the ideology of the United States shall not be allowed to stay in the United States. But if there is one key and characteristic U.S. ideology, it is that there are no mandatory and no forbidden ideologies. Some more recent 1990s cases, John Brockhoft, in jail for bombing an abortion clinic in Cincinnati, wrote in a pro-life newsletter, I'm a very narrow-minded, intolerant, reactionary, Bible-thumping fundamentalist, a zealot and fanatic. The reason the United States was once a great nation, besides being blessed by God, is because she was founded on truth, justice, and narrow-mindedness. Randall Terry, founder of Operation Rescue, an organization that blockades abortion clinics, told a congregation in August 1993, Let a wave of intolerance wash over you. Yes, hate is good. Our goal is a Christian nation. We are called by God to conquer this country. We don't want pluralism. The expression of such views is protected, and properly so, under the Bill of Rights, even if those protected would abolish the Bill of Rights if they got the chance. The protection for the rest of us is to use that same Bill of Rights to get across to every citizen the indispensability of the Bill of Rights. What means to protect themselves against human fallibility? What error protection machinery do these alternative doctrines and institutions offer? An infallible leader, race, nationalism, wholesale disengagement from civilization, except for explosives and automatic weapons. How can they be sure, especially in the darkness of the 20th century? Don't they need candles? In his celebrated little book on liberty, the English philosopher John Stuart Mill argued that silencing an opinion is a peculiar evil. If the opinion is right, we are robbed of the opportunity of exchanging error for truth, and if it's wrong, we are deprived of a deeper understanding of the truth in its collision with error. If we know only our own side of the argument, we hardly know even that. It becomes stale, soon learned only by rote, untested, a pallid and lifeless truth. Mill also wrote, If society lets any considerable number of its members grow up as mere children, incapable of being acted on by rational consideration of distant motives, society has itself to blame. Jefferson made the same point even more strongly. If a nation expects to be both ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. In a letter to Madison, he continued the thought, A society that will trade a little liberty for a little order will lose both, and deserve neither. When permitted to listen to alternative opinions and engage in substantive debate, people have been known to change their minds. It can happen. For example, Hugo Black, in his youth, was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. He later became a Supreme Court justice and was one of the leaders in the historic Supreme Court decisions, partly based on the 14th Amendment to the Constitution that affirmed the civil rights of all Americans. It was said that when he was a young man, he dressed up in white robes and scared black folks. When he got older, he dressed up in black robes and scared white folks. In matters of criminal justice, the Bill of Rights recognizes the temptation that may be felt by police, prosecutors, and the judiciary to intimidate witnesses and expedite punishment. The criminal justice system is fallible, 
Innocent people might be punished for crimes they did not commit. Governments are perfectly capable of framing those who, for reasons unconnected with the purported crime, they do not like. So the Bill of Rights protects defendants. A kind of cost-benefit analysis is made. The guilty may on occasion be set free so that the innocent will not be punished. This is not only a moral virtue. It also inhibits the misuse of the criminal justice system to suppress unpopular opinions or despised minorities. It is part of the error correction machinery. New ideas, invention, and creativity in general always spearhead a kind of freedom, a breaking out from hobbling constraints. Freedom is a prerequisite for continuing the delicate experiment of science, which is one reason the Soviet Union could not remain a totalitarian state and be technologically competitive. At the same time, science, or rather its delicate mix of openness and skepticism, and its encouragement of diversity and debate, is a prerequisite for continuing the delicate experiment of freedom in an industrial and highly technological society. Once you questioned the religious insistence on the prevailing view that the earth was at the center of the universe, why should you accept the repeated and confident assertions by religious leaders that God sent kings to rule over us? In the 17th century, it was easy to whip English and colonial juries into a frenzy over this impiety or that heresy. They were willing to torture people to death for their beliefs. By the late 18th century, they weren't so sure. Rossiter again, from Seed Time of the Republic, 1953. Under the pressure of the American environment, Christianity grew more humanistic and temperate, more tolerant with the struggle of the sects, more liberal with the growth of optimism and rationalism, more experimental with the rise of science, more individualistic with the advent of democracy. Equally important, increasing numbers of colonists, as a legion of preachers loudly lamented, were turning secular in curiosity and skeptical in attitude. The Bill of Rights uncoupled religion from the state, in part because so many religions were steeped in an absolutist frame of mind, each convinced that it alone had a monopoly on the truth, and therefore eager for the state to impose this truth on others. Often the leaders and practitioners of absolutist religions were unable to perceive any middle ground or recognize that the truth might draw upon and embrace apparently contradictory doctrines. The framers of the Bill of Rights had before them the example of England, where the ecclesiastical crime of heresy and the secular crime of treason had become nearly indistinguishable. Many of the early colonists had come to America fleeing religious persecution, although some of them were perfectly happy to persecute other people for their beliefs. The founders of our nation recognized that a close relation between the government and any of the quarrelsome religions would be fatal to freedom and injurious to religion. Justice Black, in the Supreme Court decision Engel v. Vitale, 1962, described the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment this way. Its first and most immediate purpose rested on the belief that a union of government and religion tends to destroy government and degrade religion. Moreover, here too the separation of powers works. Each sect and cult, as Walter Savage Landor once noted, is a moral check on the others. Competition is as wholesome in religion as in commerce. But the price is high. This competition is an impediment to religious bodies acting in concert to address the common good. Rossiter concludes, the twin doctrines of separation of church and state and liberty of individual conscience are the marrow of our democracy, if not indeed America's most magnificent contribution to the freeing of Western man. Now it's no good to have such rights if they're not used. A right of free speech when no one contradicts the government. Freedom of the press when no one is willing to ask the tough questions. A right of assembly when there are no protests. Universal suffrage when less than half the electorate votes. Separation of church and state when the wall of separation is not regularly repaired. Through disuse they can become no more than votive objects, patriotic lip service, rights and freedoms, use them or lose them, due to the foresight of the framers of the Bill of Rights, and even more so to all those who, at considerable personal risk, insisted on exercising those rights. It's hard now to bottle up free speech. School library committees, the immigration service, the police, the FBI, or the ambitious politician looking to score cheap votes may attempt it from time to time, but sooner or later the cork pops. The Constitution is, after all, the law of the land. Public officials are sworn to uphold it, and activists and the courts episodically hold their feet to the fire. 
However, through lowered educational standards, declining intellectual competence, diminished zest for substantive debate, and social sanctions against skepticism, our liberties can be slowly eroded and our rights subverted. The founders understood this well. The time for fixing every essential right on a legal basis is while our rulers are honest and ourselves united, said Thomas Jefferson. From the conclusion of this revolutionary war, we shall be going downhill. It will not then be necessary to resort every moment to the people for support. They will be forgotten, therefore, and their rights disregarded. They will forget themselves but in the sole faculty of making money, and will never think of uniting to effect a due respect for their rights. The shackles, therefore, which shall not be knocked off at the conclusion of this war, will remain on us long, will be made heavier and heavier, till our rights shall revive or expire in a convulsion. Education on the value of free speech and the other freedoms reserved by the Bill of Rights, about what happens when you don't have them, and about how to exercise and protect them, should be an essential prerequisite for being an American citizen or the citizen of any nation, the more so to the degree that such rights remain unprotected. If we can't think for ourselves, if we're unwilling to question authority, then we're just putty in the hands of those in power. But if the citizens are educated and form their own opinions, then those in power work for us. In every country, we should be teaching our children the scientific method and the reasons for a Bill of Rights. With it comes a certain decency, humility, and community spirit. In the demon-haunted world that we inhabit by virtue of being human, this may be all that stands between us and the enveloping darkness. Acknowledgements It has been my great pleasure over many years to teach a senior seminar on critical thinking at Cornell University. I've been able to select students from all over the university on the basis both of ability and of cultural and disciplinary diversity. We stress written assignments and oral argumentation. Towards the end of the course, students select a range of wildly controversial social issues in which they have major emotional investments. Paired two by two, they prepare for a succession of end-of-semester oral debates. A few weeks before the debates, however, they are informed that it is the task of each to present the point of view of the opponent in a way that's satisfactory to the opponent. So the opponent will say, yes, that's a fair presentation of my views. In the joint written debate, they explore their differences, but also how the debate process has helped them better to understand the opposing point of view. Some of the topics in this book were first presented to these students. I have learned much from their reception and criticism of my ideas and want to thank them here. I'm also grateful to Cornell's Department of Astronomy and its chair, Yervon Terzian, for permitting me to teach the course, which, although labeled Astronomy 490, presents only a little astronomy. Some of this book has also been presented in Parade Magazine, a supplement to Sunday newspapers all over North America, with some 83 million readers each week. The vigorous feedback I've received from Parade readers has greatly enhanced my understanding of the issues described in this book and the variety of public attitudes. I have in several places excerpted some of my mail from Parade readers, which it seems to me has provided a kind of finger on the pulse of the citizenry of the United States, the editor-in-chief of Parade, Walter Anderson, and the senior editor, David Courier, as well as the editorial and research staff of this remarkable magazine, have in many cases greatly improved my presentation. They also have permitted opinions to be expressed that might not have made it into print in mass-market publications less dedicated to the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Some portions of the text first appeared in the Washington Post and the New York Times. The last chapter is based in part on an address I had the pleasure of delivering on the 4th of July, 1992, from the East Portico at Monticello, the back of the nickel, on the occasion of the induction to U.S. citizenship of people from 31 other nations. My opinions on democracy, the method of science and public education have been influenced by enormous numbers of people over the years, many of whom I mention in the body of the text. But I would like to single out here the inspiration I have received from Martin Gardner, Isaac Asimov, Philip Morrison, and Henry Steele Commager. There is not room to thank the many others who have helped provide understanding and lucid examples, or who have corrected errors of omission or commission, but I want them all to know how deeply grateful I am to them. 
I must, however, explicitly thank the following friends and colleagues for critically reviewing earlier drafts of this book. Bill Aldridge, Susan Blackmore, William Cromer, Fred Frankel, Kendrick Fraser, Martin Gardner, Ira Glasser, Fred Golden, Kurt Gottfried, Lester Grinspoon, Philip Klass, Paul Kurtz, Elizabeth Loftus, David Morrison, Richard Offshe, Jay Aurier, Albert Pennybacker, Frank Press, Theodore Rozak, Dorian Sagan, David Saperstein, Robert Siepel, Stephen Soter, Jeremy Stone, Peter Sturrock, and Yervon Terzian. I also am very grateful to my literary agent, Morton Janklow, and members of his staff for wise counsel. Roger Houghton, my editor at Headline Book Publishing, William Barnett for ushering the manuscript through its final phases, Andrea Barnett, Laurel Parker, Karen Gobrecht, Cindy Vita Vogel, Ginny Ryan, and Christopher Ruser for their assistance, and the Cornell Library System, including the rare books collection on mysticism and superstition originally compiled by the university's first president, Andrew Dixon White. Parts of four of the chapters in this book were written with my wife and longtime collaborator, Anne Druyan, who is also the elected secretary of the Federation of American Scientists, an organization founded in 1945 by the original Manhattan Project scientists to monitor the ethical use of science and high technology. She has also provided enormously helpful guidance, suggestions, and criticism on content and style throughout the book, and at every stage of writing it over the course of nearly a decade. I have learned from her more than I can say. I know how lucky I am to find in the same person someone whose advice and judgment, sense of humor and courageous vision I so much admire, who is also the love of my life.